Preface for Fifty Years Ago. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Clayton. Fifty Years Ago by Walter Besant. Preface. It has been my desire in the following pages to present a picture of society in this country as it was when the Queen ascended the throne. The book is an enlargement of a paper originally contributed to The Graphic. I have written several additional chapters, and have revised all the rest. The chapter on Law and Justice has been written for this volume by my friend Mr. W. Morris Calls of the Inner Temple. I beg to record my best thanks to that gentleman for his important contribution. I have not seen in any of the literature called forth by the happy event of last year any books or papers which cover the exact ground of this compilation. There are histories of progress and advancement. There are contrasts, but there has not been offered anywhere, to my knowledge, a picture of life, manners, and society as they were fifty years ago. When the editor of the graphic proposed that I should write a paper on this subject, I readily consented, thinking it would be a light and easy task, and one which could be accomplished in two or three weeks. Light and easy it certainly was in a sense, because it was very pleasant work, and the books to be consulted are easily accessible. The investigation of a single point sometimes carried one through half a dozen volumes. The two or three weeks became two or three months. At the very outset of the work I was startled to find how great a revolution has taken place in our opinions and ways of thinking, how much greater than is at first understood. For instance, America was, fifty years ago, practically unknown to the bulk of our people. American ideas had little or no influence upon us. Our people had no touch with the United States. If they spoke of a republic, they still meant the first French Republic, the only republic they knew, with death to kings and tyrants, while the recollection of the guillotine still preserved cautious and orderly people from republican ideas. Who now, however, connects a republic with a reign of terror and the guillotine? The American Republic, in fact, has taken the place of the French. Again, though the Reform Bill had been, in 1837, passed already five years, its effects were as yet only beginning to be felt. We were still, politically, in the 18th century. So in the Church, in the law, in the services, in society, we were governed by the ideas of the 18th century. The 19th century actually began with steam communication by sea with steam machinery, with railways, with telegraphs, with the development of the colonies, with the admission of the people to the government of the country, with the opening of the universities, with the spread of science, with the revival of the democratic spirit. It did not really begin, in fact, till about fifty years ago. When and how will it end? By what order, by what ideas, will it be followed? In compiling even such a modest work as the present, one is constantly attended by a haunting dread of having forgotten something necessary to complete the picture. I have been adding little things ever since I began to put these scenes together. At this, the very last moment, the spirit of memory whispers in my ear, did you remember to speak of the high fireplaces, the open chimneys up which half the heat mounted, the broad hobs and the high fenders with the fronts pierced, in front of which people's feet were always cold? Did you remember to note that the pin of the period had its head composed of a separate piece of wire rolled round, that steel pens were either as yet unknown or were precious and costly things? that the quill was always wanting a fresh nib, that the wax match did not exist, that in the country they still used the old-fashioned brimstone match, that the night light of the period was a rush candle stuck in a round tin cylinder full of holes, and that all the ladies' dress had hooks and eyes behind. 
I do not think that I have mentioned any of these points. And yet, how much food for reflection is afforded by every one? Reader, you may perhaps find my pictures imperfect, but you can fill in any one sketch from your own superior knowledge. Meantime, remember this. As nearly as possible, fifty years ago, the eighteenth century passed away. It died slowly. Its end was hardly marked. King William the Fourth is dead. Alas! How many things were dying with that good old king? The steam whistle was already heard across the fields. Already in mid-ocean the great steamers were crossing against wind and tide. Already the nations were slowly beginning to know each other. Privilege, patronage, and the power of rank were beginning already to tremble, and were afraid. Already the working man was heard demanding his vote. The nineteenth century had begun. We who have lived in it, we who are full of its ideas, we who are all swept along upon the full stream of it, we know not, we cannot see, whither it is carrying us. W.B. End of Preface Chapter One of Fifty Years Ago by Walter Besant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Clayton. Great Britain, Ireland, and the Colonies. I propose to set before my readers a picture of the country as it was when Queen Victoria, God save the Queen, ascended the throne, now fifty years ago and more. It will be a picture of a time so utterly passed away and vanished that a young man can hardly understand it. I, who am no longer, unhappily, quite so young as some, and whose babyhood heard the canon of the coronation, can partly understand this time, because in many respects, and especially in the manners of the middle class, customs and habits which went out of fashion in London lingered in the country towns, and formed part of my own early experiences. In the year 1837, I shall repeat this remark several times, because I wish to impress the fact upon everybody, we were still, to all intents and purposes, in the 18th century. As yet the country was untouched by that American influence which is now filling all peoples with new ideas. Rank was still held in the ancient reverence. Religion was still that of the 18th century church. The rights of labor were not yet recognized. There were no trades unions. There were no railways to speak of. Nobody traveled except the rich. Their own country was unknown to the people. The majority of country people could not read or write. The good old discipline of Father Stick and his children, Cat of Nine Tails, Rope's End, Strap, Birch, Farrell, and Cane, was wholesomely maintained. Landlords, manufacturers, and employers of all kinds did what they pleased with their own. And the blue ribbon was unheard of. There were still some fiery spirits in whose breast lingered the ideas of the French Revolution, and the Chartists were already beginning to run their course. Beneath the surface there was discontent, which sometimes bubbled up. But freedom of speech was limited, and if the sovereign people had then ventured to hold a meeting in Trafalgar Square, that meeting would have been dispersed in a very swift and surprising manner. The Reform Act had been passed, it is true, but as yet had produced little effect. Elections were carried by open bribery. The civil service was full of great men's nominees. The church was devoured by pluralists. There were no competitive examinations. The perpetual pensions were many and fat. And for the younger sons and their progeny, the state was provided with any number of sinecures. How men contrive to live and to be cheerful in this state of things one knows not. But really? I think it made very little apparent difference to their happiness that this country was crammed full of abuses, and that the ship of state, to outsiders, 
seemed as if she were about to capsize and founder. This is to be a short chapter of figures. Figures mean very little unless they can be used for purposes of comparison. When, for instance, one reads that in the census of 1831, the population of Great Britain was 16,539,318, the fact has little significance except when compared with the census of 1881, which shows that the population of the country had increased in 50 years from 16 millions to 24 millions. And again, one knows not whether to rejoice or to weep over this fact until it has been ascertained how the condition of these millions has changed for better or for worse, and whether the outlook for the future, if in the next 50 years, 24 become 36, is hopeful or no. Next, when one reads that the population of Ireland was then 7 millions and three quarters, and is now less than 5 millions, and further that one Irishman in three was always next door to starving, and that the relative importance of Ireland to Great Britain was then as one to two, and is now as one to five, one naturally congratulates Ireland on getting more elbow room and Great Britain on the relative decrease in Irish power to do the larger island an injury. The Army and Navy together in 1831 contained no more than 277,017 men, or half their present number. But then the proportion of the English military strength to the French was much nearer one of equality. The relief of the poor in 1831 absorbed 6,875,552 pounds, but this sum in 1844 had dropped to 4,976,090 pounds, the savings of 2 millions being due to the new poor law. The stream of emigration had hardly yet begun to flow. Witness the following figures. The number of emigrants in 1820 was 18,984. The number of emigrants in 1825 was 8,860. The number of emigrants in 1832 was 103,311. The number of emigrants in 1837 was 72,034. It was not until 1841 that the great flow of emigrants began in the direction of New Zealand and Australia. The emigrants of 1832 chiefly went to Canada and as yet the United States were practically unaffected by the rush from the old countries. The population of the great towns has for the most part doubled itself in the last fifty years. London had then a million and a half. Liverpool, 200,000. Manchester, 250,000. Glasgow, 250,000. Birmingham, 150,000. Leeds, 140,000, and Bristol, 120,000. Penal settlements were still flourishing. Between 1825 and 1840, when they were suppressed, 48,712 convicts were sent out to Sydney. As regards traveling, the fastest rate along the high roads was 10 miles an hour. There were 54 four-horse mail coaches in England, and 49 two-horse mails. In Ireland, there were 30 four-horse coaches, and 10 in Scotland. There were 3,026 stage coaches in the country, of which 1,507 started from London. There were already 668 British steamers afloat, though the penny steamboat did not as yet ply upon the river. Heavy goods traveled by the canals and navigable rivers, of which there were 4,000 in Great Britain. The hackney coach, with its pair of horses, lumbered slowly along the street. The cabriolet was the light vehicle for rapid conveyance, but it was not popular. The omnibus had only recently been introduced by Mr. Schillibeer and there were no handsome cabs. 
There was a two-penny post in London, but no penny post as yet. There was no book post, no parcel post, no London Parcels Delivery Company. If you wanted to send a parcel to anywhere in the country, you confided it to the guard of the coach. If to a town address, there were street messengers and the cads about these stagecoach stations. There were no telegraphs, no telephones, no commissionaires. Fifty years ago, the great railways were all begun, but not one of them was completed. A map published in the Athenaeum of January 23, 1836, shows the state of the railways at that date. The line between Liverpool and Manchester was opened in September 1830. In 1836, it was carrying 450,000 passengers in the year and paying a dividend of 9%. The line between Carlisle and Newcastle was very nearly completed. That between Leeds and Selby was opened in 1834. There were many short lines in the coal and mining districts, and little bits of the great lines were already completed. The London and Greenwich line was begun in 1834 and opened in 1837. There were in progress the London and Birmingham, the Birmingham, Stratford and Warrington, the Great Western as far as Bath and Bristol, and the London and Southampton passing through Basingstoke. It is amazing to think that Portsmouth, the chief naval port and place of embarkation for troops, was left out altogether. There were also a great many lines projected, which afterwards settled down into the present great trunk lines. As they were projected in 1836, instead of Great Northern, Northwestern, and Great Eastern, we should have had one line passing through Saffron Walden, Cambridge, Peterborough, Lincoln, York, Appleby, and Carlisle, with another from London to Colchester, Ipswich, Northwich, and Yarmouth. There was also a projected continuation of the GWR line from Bristol to Exeter, and three or four projected lines to Brighton and Dover. The writer of the article on the subject in the Athenaeum of that date, January 23, 1836, considers that when these lines are completed, letters and passengers will be conveyed from London to Liverpool in ten hours. Quote, little attention, unquote, he says, quote, has yet been given to calculate the effects which must result from the establishment throughout the kingdom of great lines of intercourse traversed at a speed of twenty miles an hour. End quote. Unfortunately, he had no confidence in himself as a prophet, or we might have had some curious and interesting forecasts. As regards the extent of the British Empire, there has been very little contraction and an enormous extension. We have given up the Ionian Islands to gratify the sentiment of Mr. Gladstone, and we have acquired Cyprus, which may perhaps prove of use. We have taken possession of Aden at the mouth of the Red Sea. In Hindustan, which in 1837 was still partially ruled by a number of native princes, the flag of Great Britain now reigns supreme. The whole of Burma is now British Burma. The little island of Hong Kong, which hardly appears in Aerosmith's Atlas of 1840, is now a stronghold of the British Empire. Borneo, then wholly unknown, now belongs partially to us. New Guinea is partly ours. Fiji is ours. For the greatest change of all, however, we must look at the maps of Australia and New Zealand. In the former, even the coast had not been completely surveyed. Melbourne was as yet but a little unimportant township. Between Melbourne and Botany Bay, there was not a single village, settlement, or plantation. It was not until the year 1851, only 36 years ago, that Port Phillip was separated from New South Wales and created an independent colony under the name of Victoria, and for a few years it was a very rowdy and noisy colony indeed. In New South Wales, 
the population of which was about 150,000, convicts were still sent out. In the year 1840, when the transportation ceased, 21,000 convicts were assigned to private service. There were in Sydney many men, ex-convicts, who had raised themselves to wealth. Society was divided by a hard line, not to be crossed in that generation by those on the one side whose antecedents were honorable, and those on the other who had served their time. Tasmania was also still a penal colony, and apparently a place where the convicts did not do so well as in New South Wales. Queensland as a separate colony was not yet in existence, though Brisbane had been begun. Tropical Australia was wholly unsettled. Western Australia was, what it still is, a poor and thinly settled country. The map of New Zealand, it was not important enough to have a map all to itself, shows the coastline imperfectly surveyed, and not a single town or English settlement upon it. Fifty years ago, that great colony was not yet even founded. The first serious settlement was made in 1839, when a patch of land at Port Nicholson in Cook Strait was bought from the natives for the first party of settlers sent out by the recently established New Zealand Company. In North America, the whole of the Northwest Territory, including Manitoba, Muskoka, British Columbia, and Vancouver's Island, was left to Indians, trappers, buffaloes, bears, and rattlesnakes. South Africa shows the Cape Colony and nothing else. Natal, Orange Free State, the Transvaal, Bequanaland, Griqualand, Zululand are all part of the great undiscovered continent. Considering that all these lands have now been opened up and settled, so that where was formerly a hundred square miles of forest and prairie, there is now the same area covered with plantations, towns, and farms. It will be understood that the British Empire has been increased not only in area, but in wealth, strength, and resources to an extent which would have been considered incredible fifty years ago. It is, in fact, just the difference between owning a barren heath and owning a cultivated farm. The British Empire in 1837 contained millions of square miles of barren heath and wild forest, which are now settled land and smiling plantations. It boasted of vast countries, with hardly a single European in them, which are now filled with English towns. In 1837, prophets foretold the speedy downfall of an empire which could no longer defend her vast territories. These territories can now defend themselves. It may be that we shall have to fight for empire, but the longer the day of battle is put off, the better it will be for England, and the greater will be her might. To carry on that war, there are now, scattered over the whole of the British Empire, fifty millions of people speaking the Anglo-Saxon tongue. In fifty years' time, there will be two hundred millions in Great Britain, Ireland, Australia, Africa, Asia, New Zealand, and the Isles, with another two hundred millions in the States. If the English-speaking races should decide to unite in a vast confederacy, all the other powers on the earth combined will not be able to do them an injury. Perhaps after this life we shall be allowed to see what goes on in the world. If so, there is joy in store for the Briton. If not, we have been born too soon. Next to the extension and development of the empire comes the opening up of new countries. We have rescued since the year 1837 the third part of Africa from darkness. We have found the sources of the Nile. We have traced the great river Congo from its source to its mouth. We have explored the whole of southern Africa. We have rediscovered the great African lakes which were known to the Jesuits in the 17th century. In Australia we have crossed and recrossed the continent. The whole of North America has been torn from the Red Indians, and is now settled in almost every part. 
If the progress of Great Britain has been great, that of the United States has been amazing. Along the Pacific shore, where were fifty years ago sand and rock and snow, where formerly the sluggish Mexican kept his ranch and the red Indian hunted the buffalo, great towns in American states now flourish. Arkansas and Missouri were frontier western states. Michigan was almost without settlers. Chicago was a little place otherwise called Fort Dearborn. The population of the states was still, except for the Negroes and a few descendants of Germans, Dutch, and Swedes, chiefly of pure British descent. As yet, there were in America few Irish, Germans, except in Pennsylvania, Norwegians, or Italians. Yet the people, much more than now our cousins, held little friendly feeling towards the mother country, and lacked the kindly sentiment which has grown up of late years. They were quite out of touch with us, strangers to us, and yet speaking our tongue, reading our literature, and governed by our laws. As soon as the Battle of Waterloo was fairly fought, and Napoleon put away at St. Helena, the continental professors, historians, political students, and journalists all began with one accord to prophesy the approaching downfall of Great Britain, which some affected to deplore, and others regarded with complacency. Everything conspired, it was evident, not only to bring about this decline, but also to accelerate it. The parallel of Carthage, England has always been set up as the second Carthage, was freely exhibited, especially in those countries which felt themselves called upon and qualified to play the part of Rome. It was pointed out that there was the dreadful dead weight of Ireland with its incurable poverty and discontent, the approaching decay of trade, which could be only, in the opinion of these keen-sighted philosophers, a matter of a few years, the enormous weight of the national debt, the ruined manufacturers, the wasteful expenditure of the government in every branch, the corrupting influence of the poor laws, the stain of slavery, the restrictions of commerce, the intolerance of the church, the narrowness and prejudice of the universities, the ignorance of the people, their drinking habits, the vastness of the empire. These causes, together with discontent, chartism, republicanism, atheism, in fact all the disagreeableisms, left no doubt whatever that England was doomed. Foreigners, in fact, not yet recovered from the extraordinary spectacle of Great Britain's long duel with France and a successful termination, prophesied what they partially hoped out of envy and jealousy, and partly feared from self-interest. Therefore the politicians and professors were always looking at this country, writing about it, watching it, visiting it. Now, there could be no doubt, none of these changes and dangers could be denied. The factories were choked with excessive production. Poverty stalked through the country. The towns were filled with ruined women. The streets were cumbered with drunken men. The children were growing up in ignorance and neglect inconceivable. What could come of all this but ruin? Even, and this was the most wonderful and incredible thing to those who do not understand how long a Briton will go on enduring wrongs and suffering anomalies, the very House of Commons in this boasted land of freedom did not represent half the people. Seats were openly bought and sold. Others were filled with nominees of the great men who owned them. What could possibly follow but ruin, swift and hopeless ruin? What, indeed? Prophets of disaster always omit one or two important elements in their calculations and it is through these gaps that the people basely wriggle instead of fulfilling prophecy as they ought to do. For instance, there is the recuperative power of man, and there is his individuality. He may be full of moral disease, yet such is his excellent constitution that he presently recovers. He shakes off his evil habits as he shakes the snow off his shoulders, and goes on an altered creature. Again, the mass of men may be in heavy case, but the individual man is patient, 
He has strength to suffer and endure until he can pull through the worst. He has patience to wait for better times. Difficulties only call forth his ingenuity and his resource. Disaster stiffens his back. Danger finds him brave. Always, to the prophet who knows not man, the case is hopeless. Always, to one who considers that by gazing into the looking-glass, especially immediately before or after his morning bath, he may perceive his brother as well as himself. Things are hopeful. My brother, have things at your worst ever been, morally, so bad with you that you have despaired of recovery, seeing that you had only to resolve and you were cured? Have you ever reflected that while, to the outside world, to your maiden aunts and to your female cousins, you were most certainly drifting to a moral wreck and material ruin, you have gone about the world with a hopeful heart, feeling that the future was in your own grasp. Even now the outlook of the whole world is truly dark, and the clouds are lowering. Yet surely the outlook was darker, the clouds were blacker, fifty years ago. Read Carlyle's Past and Present, and compare. There may be other dangers before us of which we then suspected nothing. But if we still preserve the qualities which enabled us to stand up, almost alone, against the colossal force of Napoleon, with Europe at his back, and which carried us through the terrible troubles which followed the war, we surely need not despair. End of chapter 1「Chapter Two of Fifty Years Ago by Walter Bassant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Clayton. The year 1837. The year 1837, except for the death of the old king and the accession of the young queen, was a tolerably insignificant year. It was on June 20th that the king died. He was buried on the evening of July 9th at St. George's Chapel, Windsor. On the 10th, the Queen dissolved Parliament. On the 13th, she went to Buckingham Palace. And on November 9, she visited the city, where they gave her a magnificent banquet, served in Guildhall at half past five, the Lord Mayor and city magnates humbly taking their modest meal at a lower table. Both the hour appointed for the banquet and the humility of the Lord Mayor and Aldermen point to a remote period. The year began with the influenza. Everybody had it. The offices of the various departments of the civil service were deserted because all the clerks had influenza. Business of all kinds was stopped because merchants, clerks, bankers, and brokers all had influenza. At Woolwich, fifty men of the Royal Artillery and Engineers were taken into hospital daily with influenza. The epidemic seems to have broken out suddenly, and suddenly to have departed. Another important event of the year was the establishment of steam communication with India by way of the Red Sea. The Atalanta left Bombay on October 2, and arrived at Suez on October 16. The mails were brought into Alexandria on the 20th, and dispatched, such was the celerity of the authorities, on November 7 by HMS Volcano. They reached Malta on the 11th, Gibraltar on the 16th, and England on December 4, taking 60 days in all, of which, however, 18 days were wasted in Alexandria so that the possible time of transit from Bombay to England was proved to be 42 days. This was the year of the Greenacre murder. The wretched man was under promise to marry an elderly woman, thinking she had money. One night, while they were drinking together, she confessed that she had none and had deceived him, whereupon, seized with wrath, he took up whatever weapon lay to his hand, and smote her on the head so that she fell backwards dead. Now mark, if this man had gone straight to the nearest police office and confessed the crime of homicide, he would certainly have escaped hanging. 
but he was so horribly frightened at what had happened that he tried to hide the thing by cutting up the body and bestowing the fragments in various places, all of them the most likely to be discovered. There was another woman in the case, proved to have been in his confidence, and tried with him when all the pieces had been recovered and the murder was brought home to him. He was found guilty and hanged, and never was there a hanging more numerously or more fashionably attended. The principal performer, however, is said to have disappointed his audience by a pusillanimous shrinking from the gallows when he was brought out. The woman was sent to Australia, where, perhaps, she still survives. There was also this year an extremely scandalous action in the High Court of Justice. It was a libel case brought by Lord de Ross, and arose out of a gambling quarrel in which his lordship was accused of cheating at cards. It was said that, under pretense of a bad cough and asthma, he kept diving under the table and fishing up kings and aces, a thing which seems of elementary simplicity and capable of clear denial. His lordship, in fact, did deny it, stoutly and on oath, yet the witnesses as stoutly swore that he did do this thing, and the jury found that he did whereupon his lordship retired to the continent and shortly afterwards died s p without offspring to lament his errors there was a terrible earthquake this year in the holy land the town of soft was laid in ruins and more than four thousand of the people were killed there was a project against the life of louis philippe by one champion who was arrested he was base enough to hang himself in prison so that no one ever knew if he had any accomplices. The news arrived also of a dreadful massacre in New Zealand. There was only one English settlement in the country. It was at a place called Makuta, in the North Island, where a Mr. Jones of Sydney had a flax establishment, consisting of 120 people, men, women, and children. They were attacked by a party of 800 natives and were all barbarously murdered. A fatal duel was fought on Hampstead Heath near the Spaniards' Tavern. The combatants were a Colonel Herring of the Polish army and another Polish officer who was shot. The seconds carried him to the Middlesex Hospital where he died and nothing more was said about it. The dangers of emigration were illustrated by the voyage of the good ship Diamond of Liverpool. She had on board a party of passengers emigrating to New York. In the good old sailing days, the passengers were expected to lay in their own provisions, the ship carrying water for them. Now the Diamond met with contrary winds, and was ninety days out, three times as long as was expected. The ship had no more than enough provisions for the crew, and when the passengers had exhausted their store, their sufferings were terrible. An embassy from the king of Madagascar arrived this year and was duly presented at court. I know not what business they transacted, but the fact has a certain interest for me because it was my privilege, about four and twenty years ago, to converse with one of the nobles who had formed part of that embassy and who, after a quarter of a century, was going again on another mission to the court of St. James. He was, when I saw him, an elderly man, dark of skin, but being a hova, most intelligent and well informed. Also, being a hova, anxious to say the thing which would please his hearers. He recalled many incidents connected with the long journey round the Cape in a sailing vessel, the crowds and noise of London, the venerable appearance of King William, and his general kindness to the ambassadors. When he had told us all he could recollect, he asked us if we should like to hear him sing the song which had beguiled many weary hours of his voyage. We begged him to sing it, expecting to hear something national and fresh, something redolent of the Madagascar soil, a song sung in the streets of its capital, Antananarivo, perhaps with a breakdown or a walk-around. Alas! He neither danced a breakdown nor did he walk around, 
nor did he sing us a national song at all. He only piped, in a thin, sweet tenor, and very correctly, that familiar hymn, Rock of Ages, to the familiar tune. I have never been able to believe that this nobleman, His Excellency, the Right Honorable the Lord Rainiferinga Larino, Knight of the Fifteen Honor, entitled to wear a lamba as highly striped as they are made, commonly reported to be a pagan, with several wives, really comforted his soul while at sea with this hymn. But he was with Christians, and this was a missionary's hymn which he had often heard, and it would doubtless please us to hear it sung. Thereupon he sang it, and a dead silence fell upon us. Behold, however, the reason why the record of this simple event, the arrival of the embassy from Madagascar, strikes a chord in the mind of one at least who reads it. There is little else to chronicle in the year. The University of Durham was founded. A truly brilliant success have they made of this learned foundation. And Sir Robert Peel was rector of Glasgow University. For the rest, boilers burst, coaches were upset, and many books of immense genius were produced, which now repose in the museum. Yet a year which marked the close of one period and the commencement of another. The steamship Atalanta carrying the bags to Suez. What does this mean? The massacre in New Zealand of the only white men on the island. What does this portend? The fatal duel at Hampstead. The noble lord convicted of cheating at cards. The emigrant ship ninety days out with no food for the passengers. What are these things but illustrations of a time that has now passed away? The passage from the 18th to the 19th century. For there are no longer any duels. Noble lords no longer gamble unless they are very young and foolish. Ships no longer take passengers without food for them. We have lessened the distance to India by three-fourths, measured by time. And the Maoris will rise no more, for their land is filled with the white man. In that year also, there were certain ceremonies observed which have now partly fallen into disuse. For instance, on Twelfth Day it was the custom for confectioners to make in their windows a brave show of twelfth cakes. It was also the custom of the public to flatten their noses against the windows and to gaze upon the treasures displayed to view. It was, further, the custom, one of the good old annual customs, like beating the bounds, for the boys to pin together those who were thus engaged, by their coattails, shawls, skirts, sleeves, the ends of comforters, wrappers, and boas, and other outlying portions of raiment. When they discovered the trick, of course they only made pretense at being unconscious, by the rending, tearing, and destruction of their garments, they never failed to fall into ecstasies of pretended wrath to the joy of the children, who next year repeated the trick with the same success. I think there are no longer any twelfth cakes, and I am sure that the boys have forgotten that trick. On Twelfth Day, the Bishop of London made an offering in the Chapel Royal of St. James in commemoration of the wise men from the East. Is that offering made still? And if so, what does his lordship offer? And with what prayers, or hopes, or expectations is that offering made? At the commencement of Hillary term, the judges took breakfast with the Lord Chancellor, and afterwards drove in state to Westminster. On January 30, King Charles' day, the lords went in procession to Westminster Abbey and the commons to St. Margaret's, both houses to hear the service of commemoration. Where is that service now? On Easter Sunday, the royal family attended divine service at St. James and received the sacrament. On Easter Monday, the Lord Mayor, sheriffs, and aldermen went in state to Christ Church, formerly the Church of the Grey Friars, and heard service. In the evening there was a great banquet with a ball. A fatiguing day for my Lord Mayor. Easter Monday was also the day of the Epping Hunt. 
Greenwich Fair was held on that and the following two days, and in Easter week the theaters played pieces for children. On the first Sunday in Easter, the Lord Mayor and Sheriffs went in state to St. Paul's and had a banquet afterwards. On May Day, the chimney sweeps had their annual holiday. On Ascension Day, they made a procession of parish functionaries and parochial schools and beat the bounds, and, to mark them well in the memory of all, they beat the charity children who attended the beetle, and they beat all the boys they caught on the way and they banged against the boundaries all the strangers who passed within their reach. When it came to banging the strangers, they had a high old time. On the Queen's birthday, there was a splendid procession of stagecoaches from Piccadilly to the post office. Lastly, on September 3, Bartholomew Fair was opened by the Lord Mayor, and then followed what our modern papers are wont to call a carnival, but what the papers in 1837 called, without any regard to picturesque writing, a scene of unbridled profligacy, licentiousness, and drunkenness, with fighting both of fists and cudgels, pumping on pickpockets, robbery and cheating, noise and shouting, the braying of trumpets and the banging of drums. If you want to know what this ancient fair was like, go visit the agricultural hall at Christmas. They have the foolish din and noise of it, and if the people were drunk, and there were no police, and everybody was ready and most anxious to fight, and the pickpockets, thieves, bullies, and blackguards were doing what they pleased, you would have Bartholomew Fair complete. End of chapter 2「Chapter Three of Fifty Years Ago by Walter Besant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Clayton. London in 1837. The extent of London in 1837, that is to say, of close and continuous London, may be easily understood by drawing on the map a red line a little above the south side of Regent's Park. This line must be prolonged west until it strikes the Edgware Road, and eastward until it strikes the Regent's Canal, after which it follows the canal until it falls into the Regent's Canal Docks. This is, roughly speaking, the boundary of the great city on the north and east. Its western boundary is the lower edge of the Edgware Road, Park Lane, and a line drawn from Hyde Park Corner to Westminster Bridge. The river is its southern boundary, but if you wish to include the borough, there will be a narrow fringe on the south side. This was the whole of London proper, that is to say, not the city of London or London with her suburbs, but continuous London. If you look at Mr. Lofty's excellent map of London, showing the extent built upon at different periods, you will find a greater area than this ascribed to London at this period. That is because Mr. Lofty has chosen to include many parts which at this time were suburbs of one street, straggling houses with fields, nurseries, and market gardens. Thus Kennington, Brixton, and Camberwell are included. But these suburban places were not in any sense part of continuous London. Open fields and gardens were lying behind the roads, at the north end of Kennington Common, then a dreary expanse uncared for and downtrodden, lay open ponds and fields. There were fields between Vauxhall Gardens and the Oval. If we look at the north of London, there were no houses round Primrose Hill, fields stretched north and east. To the west, one or two roads were already pushing out, such as the Abbey Road and Avenue Road, through the pleasant fields of Kilburn, where still stood the picturesque fragments of Kilbourne Priory, the Bayswater Rivulet ran pleasantly. It was joined by two other brooks, one rising in St. John's Wood, and flowing through what are now called Craven Gardens into the Serpentine. On Haverstock Hill were a few villas. Chalk Hill still had its farm buildings, Belsize House, with its park and lake, was the nearest house to Primrose Hill. 
a few houses showed the site of kentish town while camden town was then a village clustered about its high street in the hampstead road even the york and albany tavern looked out back and front on fields mornington crescent gazed across its garden upon open fields and farms the great burial ground of st james church had fields at the back behind st pancras churchyard stretched mr agger's farm islington was little more than a single street with houses on either side bagnig wells it stood at the northeast of st andrew's burying ground in gray's end road was still in full swing hoxton had some of its old houses still standing with the haberdashers almhouses the rest was laid out in nurseries and gardens king's cross was battle bridge and pentonville was only in its infancy looking at this comparatively narrow area consider the enormous growth of fifty years what was bow a little village what was strafford now a town of seventy thousand people there was no stratford bromley was a waste dalston clapham hackney tottenham cannonbury barnsbury these were mere villages now they are great and populous towns but perhaps the change is more remarkable still when one considers the west end all that great cantlet lying between marylebone road and oxford street was then much in the same state as now though with some difference in detail thus one is surprised to find that the south of blandford square was occupied by a great nursery but west of edgware road there was next to nothing connaught square was already built and the ground between the grand junction road and the bayswater road was just laid out for building but the great burying ground of st george's now hidden from view and built round was in fields the whole length of the Bayswater Road ran along market gardens. A few houses stood in St. Petersburg Place. Westbourne Green had hardly a cottage on it. Westbourne Park was a green enclosure. There were no houses on Notting Hill. Campton Hill had only one or two great houses, and a field path led pleasantly from Westbourne Green to the Kensington Gravel Pits on the west and southwest the neat houses with their gardens occupied the ground west of vauxhall bridge earl's court with its great gardens and mound stood in the center of the now crowded and dreary suburb south of the park stood many great houses such as rutland house now destroyed and replaced by terraces and squares but though london was then so small compared with its present extent it was already a most creditable city. Those who want more figures will be pleased to read that at the census of 1831, London contained 14,000 acres, or nearly 22 square miles. This area was divided into 153 parishes, containing 10,000 streets and courts, and 250,000 houses. Its population was 1,646,288. Fifty years before it was half that number. Fifty years later it was double that number. We may take the population of the year 1837 as two millions. More figures. There were 90,000 passengers across London Bridge every day. There were 1,200 cabriolets, 600 hackney coaches, and 400 omnibuses. There were 30,000 deaths annually. The visitors every year were estimated at 12,000. Among the residents were 130,000 Scotmen, 200,000 Irish, and 30,000 French. These figures convey to my own mind very little meaning, but they look big, and so I have put them down. Speaking roughly, London fifty years ago was twice as big as Paris is now, or the present New York. As for the buildings of London proper, fifty years have witnessed many changes and have brought many losses, more losses perhaps than gains. The Royal Exchange, built by Edward German in place of Sir Thomas Gresham's of 1570, was burnt to the ground on January 10, 
1838. The present building, designed by Sir William Tite, was opened by the Queen in person on October 28, 1844. German's Exchange was a quadrangular building with a clock tower of timber on the Cornhill side. It had an inner cloister and a pond or gallery above for the sale of fancy goods. It was decorated by a series of statues of the kings, from Edward I to George IV. Sion College, which until the other day stood in the street called London Wall, was not yet wantonly and wickedly destroyed by those who should have been its natural and official protectors, the London clergy. Things happen so quickly that one easily forgets. Yet let me pay a farewell tribute and drop a tear to the memory of the most delightful spot in the whole of London. The building was not of extreme age, but it stood upon the ancient site of Elsing Spittal, which itself stood upon the site of the old Cripplegate nunnery. It was founded in 1623 by the will of one Dr. Thomas White, vicar of St. Dunstan's in the West. The place was damaged by the Great Fire, and little of the building was older, I believe, than 1690 or thereabouts. But one stepped out of the noise and hurry of the very heart of London into a courtyard where the air was instantly hushed. On the right hand were the houses of the almsmen and women, though I believe they had of late ceased to occupy them. Above the almshouses was the long, narrow library crammed with books, the sight and fragrance of which filled the grateful soul with joy. On the left side of the court was the hall used for meetings, and open all day to the London clergy for reading the magazines, reviews, and papers. A quiet, holy place. Fuller wrote his church history in this college. The illustrious Salmanazar wrote here his universal history. It was after he repented of his colossal lies and had begun to live cleanly. Two hundred and fifty years have witnessed a long succession of London clergymen, learned and devout, most of them, reading in this library and meeting in this hall. Now it is pulled down, and a huge warehouse occupies its place. The London clergy themselves, for the sake of gain, have sold it. And as for the garish thing they have stuck up on the embankment, they may call it what it like, but it is not Sion College. Another piece of wanton wickedness was the destruction of Northumberland House. It is, of course, absurd to say that its removal was required. The removal of a great historic house can never be required. It was the last of the great houses, with the exception of Somerset House, and that is nearly all modern, having been erected in 1776 to 1786 on the site of the old palace. The Strand, indeed, is very much altered since the year 1837. At the West End, the removal of Northumberland House has been followed by the building of the Grand Hotel and the opening of the Northumberland Avenue. The Charing Cross Station and Hotel have been erected, two or three new theaters have been added, Temple Bar has been taken down, in any other country the old gate would have been simply left standing because it was an ancient historical monument. They would have spared it and made a roadway on either side. The rookeries which formerly stood on the north side close to the bar have been swept away, and the law courts stand in their place. Where the rooks are gone it is impossible to say. I myself dimly remember a labyrinth of lanes, streets, and courts on this site. They were inhabited, I believe, by low-class solicitors, money-lenders, racing and betting men, and by all kinds of adventurers. Did not Mr. Altamont have chambers here when he visited Captain Costigan in Lyons Inn? Lyons Inn itself is pulled down, and on its site is the Globe Theatre. As for churches, there has been such an enormous increase of churches in the last fifty years that it seems churlish to lament the loss of half a dozen. But this half dozen belongs to the city. They were churches built, for the most part, by Wren, on the site of ancient churches destroyed in the fire. They were all hallowed by old and sacred associations. 
Many of them were interesting and curious for their architecture. In a word, they ought not to have been pulled down in order to raise hideous warehouses over their site. Greed of gain prevailed and they are gone. People found out that their number of worshippers was small and argued that there was no longer any use for them. So they are gone and can never be replaced. As for their names, they were the churches of All Hollows, Broad Street, St. Bennett's, Grace Church Street, St. Dionys Back Church, St. Michael's, Queen With, St. Antholin's, Budge Row, St. Bennett Fink, St. Mary Summit, St. Mary Magdalene, and St. Matthew, Friday Street. The Church of St. Michael, Crooked Lane, in which was the grave of Sir William Walworth, disappeared in the year 1831. Those of St. Bartholomew by Eastcheap, and of St. Christopher Lestock, which stood on either side of the bank, were taken down in the years 1802 and 1781, respectively. The site of these old churches is generally marked by a small enclosure grown over with thin grass containing one, or at most two, tombs. It is about the size of a dining room table, and you may read of it that the burying ground of St. So-and-so is still preserved. Indeed, were the city churchyards of such dimensions? The preservation of the burial grounds is like the respect which used to be paid to the first day of the week in the early lustra of the Victorian age by the tobaccoist. He kept one shutter up, so the desecrators of the city churchyards, God's acre, the holy ground filled with the bones of dead citizens, measured off a square yard or two, kept one tomb, and built their warehouses over all the rest. All round London, the roads were blocked everywhere by turnpikes. It is difficult to understand the annoyance of being stopped continually to show a pass or to pay the pike. Thus, there were two or three turnpikes in what is now called the Euston Road, and was then the New Road. One of them was close to Great Portland Street, another at Gower Street. At Battle Bridge, which is now King's Cross, there were two, one on the east and one on the west. There was a pike in St. John Street, Clerkenwell. There were two in the City Road, and one in the New North Road, Hoxton one at Shoreditch, one in Bethnal Green Road, one in Commercial Road, no fewer than three in East India Dock Road, three in the Old Kent Road, one in Bridge Street, Vauxhall, one in Great Surrey Street, near the Obelisk, one at Kennington Church. What man turned of forty cannot remember the scene at the turnpike on Derby Day? when hundreds of carriages would be stopped while the pikeman was fighting for his fee. There was a turnpike named after Tyburn, close to Marble Arch, another at the beginning of Kensington Gardens, one at St. James Church, Hampstead Road. Ingenious persons knew how to avoid the pike by making a long detour. The turnpike has gone, and the pikeman with his apron has gone. Nearly everyone's apron has gone, too and the gates have been removed. That is a clear gain. But there are also losses. What, for instance, has become of all the baths? Surely we have not, as a nation, ceased to desire cleanliness. Yet in reading the list of the London baths fifty years ago, one cannot choose but ask the question. St. Annis Le Clare used to be a medicinal spring, considered efficacious in rheumatic cases. Who stopped that spring and built upon its site? The peerless pool close beside it was the best swimming bath in all London. When was that filled up and built over? Where are St. Chad's wells now? Formerly they were in Gray's Inn Road, near Battle Bridge, which is now King's Cross, and their waters saved many an apothecary's bill. There were swimming baths in Shepherdess Walk, near the almshouses. When were they destroyed? There was another in cold bath fields. The spring, a remarkably cold one, still runs into a bath of marble slabs, represented to have been laid for Mistress Nell Gwynne in the days of the Merry Monarch.
Curiously, the list from which I am quoting does not mention the most delightful bath of all, the old Roman bath in the Strand. I remember making the acquaintance of this bath long ago, in the fifties, being then a student at King's. The water is icy cold, but fresh and bright, and always running. The place is never crowded. Hardly anybody seems to know that here, in the heart of London, is a monument of Roman times, to visit which, if it were at Arles or Avignon, people would go all the way from London. Some day, no doubt, we shall hear that it has been sold and destroyed, like Sion College, and the spring built over. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of Fifty Years Ago by Walter Besant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In the Street. Let us, friend 87, take a walk down the Strand on this fine April afternoon of 37. First, however, you must alter your dress a little, put on this swallow tail coat with the high velvet collar it is more becoming than the sporting coat in green bulging out over the hips change your light tie and mash your collar for this beautiful satin stock and this double breast pin put on a velvet waistcoat and an under waistcoat of cloth thin cossack trousers with straps will complete your costume turn your shirt cuffs back outside the coat sleeve carry your gloves in your hand and take your cane you are now dear eighty seven transformed into the dandy of fifty years ago and will not excite any attention as we walk along the street we will start from charing cross and will walk towards the city you cannot remember eighty seven the king's muse that stood here on the side of trafalgar square when it is completed with the national gallery on the north side the monument and statue of nelson the fountains and statues that they talk about there will be a very fine square and we have certainly got rid of a group of mean and squalid streets to make room for the square it is lucky that they have left northumberland house the last of the great palaces that once lined the strand the strand looks very much as it will in your time though the shop fronts are not by any means so fine there is no charing cross station or northumberland avenue most of the shops have bow windows and there is no plate glass but instead small panes such as you will only see here and there in your time the people however have a surprisingly different appearance the ladies because the east wind is cold still keep to their fur tippets their thick shawls and have their necks wrapped round with boas the ends of which hang down to their skirts a fashion revived by yourself their bonnets are remarkable structures like an ornamental coal scuttle of the thirty seven not the eighty seven period and some of them are of surprising dimensions and decorated with an amazing profusion of ribbons and artificial flowers their sleeves are shaped like a leg of mutton their shawls are like a dining-room carpet of the time not like your dining-room carpet eighty seven but a carpet of flaunting colour crimson and scarlet which would give you a headache but the curls of the younger ladies are not without their charms and their eyes are as bright as those of their grandchildren are they not let us stand still a while and watch the throng where the tide of life as johnson said is the fullest here comes with a roll intended for a military swagger the cheap dandy i know not what he is by trade he is too old for a medical student not shabby enough for an attorney's clerk and not respectable enough for a city clerk is it possible that he is a young gentleman a very small fortune which he is running through he wears a tall hat broader at the top than at the bottom he carries white thread gloves sports a cane has his trousers tightly strapped wears a tremendously high stock with a sham diamond pin a coat with a velvet collar and a double-breasted waistcoat his right hand is stuck it is an aggressive attitude in his coat-tail pocket the little old gentleman who follows him in black shorts and white silk stockings will be gone before your time so will 
yonder still more ancient gentleman in powdered hair and pigtail who walked slowly along pigtails in your time will be clean forgotten as well as black silk shorts do you see that thin spare gentleman in the cloak riding slowly along the street followed by a mounted servant the people all take off their hats respectfully to him and country folk gaze upon him curiously that is the duke there is only one duke to the ordinary briton it is the duke with the hooked nose the iron duke the duke of wellington the new fashioned cabriolet with a seat at the side for the driver and a high hood for the fare is light and swift but it is not beautiful nor is it popular the wheels are too high and the machine is too narrow it is always upsetting and bringing its passengers to grief here is one of the new police with blue swallow-tail coat tightly buttoned and white trousers they are reported to be mightily unpopular with the light-fingered gentry with whose pursuits they are always interfering in a manner unknown to the ancient charlie here comes a gentleman darkly and mysteriously clad in a fur-lined cloak fastened at his neck by a brass buckle and falling to his feet such a cloak as in your time will only be used to enwrap the villains in a burlesque but here no one takes any notice of it there goes a man who may have been an officer an actor a literary man a gambler anything whatever he was he is now broken down his face is pale his gait is shuffling his elbows are gone his boots are giving at the toes and see the stout red-faced man with the striped waistcoat and the bundle of seals hanging at his fob has tapped him on the shoulder that is a sheriff's officer and he will now be conducted after certain formalities to the king's bench or the fleet and in this happy retreat he will probably pass the remainder of his days here comes a middle-aged gentleman who looks almost like a coachman in his coat with many capes and his purple cheeks that is the famous coaching baronet than whom no better whip has ever been seen upon the road here comes a pair of young bloods who scorn cloaks and great coats how bravely do they tread in their tight trousers bright-coloured waistcoats and high satin stocks with what a jaunty air do they tilt their low-crowned hats over their long and waving locks you can smell the bear's grease across the road with what a flourish do they bear their canes here comes swaggering along the pavement a military gentleman in a coat much befrogged he has the appearance of one who knows chalk farm which is situated among meadows where the morning air has been known to prove suddenly fatal to many gallant gentlemen how he swings his shoulders and squares his elbows and how the peaceful passengers make room for him to pass he is no doubt an old peninsular there are still many like unto him he is the ruffling captain known to queen elizabeth's time in the last century he took the wall and shoved everybody into the gutter presently he will turn into the cigar divan he learned to smoke cigars in spain in the rooms of what was once the repository of art we breathe more freely when he is gone here comes a great hulking sailor his face beams with honesty he rolls in his gait he hitches up his wide trousers he wears his shiny hat at the back of his head his hair hangs in ringlets he chews a quid under his arm is a parcel tied in red bandana he looks as if he were in some perplexity sighting one who appears to be a gentleman recently from the country he bears down upon him noble captain he whispers hoarsely if you like here's a chance that doesn't come every day for why i've got to go to sea again and though they're smuggled i smuggled them myself your honour and worth their weight in gold you shall have the box for thirty shillin say the word my captain and come round the corner with me honest tar shall we meet him to-morrow with another parcel tied in the same bandana his face screwed up with the same perplexity and anxiety to get rid of his valuable burden you yourself eighty-seven will have your confidence trick your ring dropper your thimble and pea your fat partridge seller even though the bold smuggler be no more in the matter of street music we of thirty seven are perhaps in advance of you of eighty seven we have not it is true the pianoforte organ but we have already the other two varieties the rumbling droner and the light tinkler we have not yet the street nigger or the banjo or the band of itinerant blacks or christie's minstrels 
the negro minstrel does not exist in any form but the ingenious mr rice is at this very moment studying the plantation songs of south carolina and we can already witness his humorous personation of jump jim crow in his pathetic ballad of lucy neal he made his first appearance at the adelphi as jim crow in eighteen thirty six we have like you the christian family in reduced circumstances creeping slowly hand in hand along the streets singing a hymn the while for the consolation it affords they have not yet invented moody and sankey and therefore they cannot sing hold the fort or dare to be a daniel but there are hymns in every collection which suit the griddler we have also the ballad singer who warbles at the door of the gin palace his favourite song just now is all round my hat we have the lady or gentleman who takes her or his place upon the curb with a guitar adorned with red ribbon and sings a sentimental song such as speed on my mules for leela waits for me or gaily the troubadour there is the street seller of ballads at a penny each a taste of which he gives the delighted listener there are the horns of stage-coach and of omnibus blown with zeal there is the bell of the crier exercised as religiously as that of the railway porter the pandean pipes and the drum walk not only with punch but also with the dancing bear the performing dogs the street acrobats and the fantocini the noble highlander not only stands outside the tobacconists taking a pinch of snuff but he also parades the street blowing a most patriotic tune upon his bagpipe the butcher serenades his young mistress with the cleaver and the bones the italian boy delights all the ears of those who hear with his hurdy-gurdy here comes the paddington omnibus the first omnibus of all started seven years ago by mr shillabeer the father of all those which have driven the short stages off the road and now ply in every street you will not fail to observe that the knife-board has not yet been invented there are twelve passengers inside and none out the conductor is already remarkable for his truthfulness his honesty and his readiness to take up any lady and to deposit her within ten yards of wherever she wishes to be the fare is sixpence and you must wait for ten years before you get a tuppenny bus now let us resume our walk the strand is very little altered you think already exeter change is gone exeter hall is already built the shops are less splendid and plate glass is as yet unknown in holywell street i can show you one or two of the old signs still on the house walls butcher row behind st clement danes he is pulled down and the street widened on the north side there is standing a nest of rookeries and mean streets where you will have your law courts here is temple bar which you will miss close to temple bar is the little fish shop which once belonged to mr crockford the proprietor of the famous club the street messengers standing about in their white aprons will be gone in your time for that matter so will the aprons at present every other man in the street wears an apron it is a badge of his rank and station the apron marks the mechanic or the serving man some wear white aprons and some wear leather aprons i am afraid you will miss the apron fleet street is much more picturesque than the strand is it not even in your day eighty seven when so many old houses will have perished fleet street will still be the most picturesque street in all london the true time to visit it is at four o'clock on a summer morning when the sun has just risen on the sleeping city look at the gables of it the projecting stories of it the old timber work of it the glory and the beauty of it as you see fleet street so dr johnson saw it there is a good deal more crowd and animation in fleet street than in the strand that is because we are nearer the city of course the traffic is greater the noise is much greater as for this ring before us let us avoid it a coachman fighting a ticket porter is a daily spectacle in this thoroughfare those who crowd round often get bloody noses for their pains and still more often come away without their purses look the pickpockets are at their work almost openly they have caught one well my friend our long silk purses yours will be square leather things are very easily stolen i do not think it will repay you for the loss of yours to see a poor devil of a pickpocket pumped upon you are looking again at the plain windows with the small square panes the shops make no displays yet you see first it would not be safe to put valuable articles in windows protected by nothing but a little thin pane of glass which reminds me that in the matter of street safety you will be a good deal ahead of us next an honest english tradesman loves to keep his best out of sight the streets are horribly noisy that is quite true you have heard of the roar of the mighty city your london eighty seven will not know how to roar but you can now understand what its roaring used to be an intolerable stir and uproar is it not 
but then your ears are not like ours used to it first the road is not macadamized or asphalted or paved with wood next the traffic of wagons carts and wheelbarrows and hand carts is vastly greater than you had ever previously imagined then there is a great deal more of porter work done in the street and the men are perpetually jostling quarrelling and fighting the coaches those of the short stages with two horses and the long stages with four are always blowing their horns and cracking their whips look at yonder great wagon it has come all the way from scotland it is piled thirty feet high with packages of all kinds baskets hang behind filled with all kinds of things in front there sit a couple of scotch lasses who have braved a three weeks journey from edinburgh in order to save the expense of the coach brave girls but such a wagon with such a load does not go along the street in silence it is not in silence either that the women who carry baskets full of fish on their heads go along the street nor is the man silent who goes with a pack donkey loaded on either side with small coal and the wooden sledge on which is the cask of beer dragged along by a single horse makes by itself as much noise as all your carriages together eighty seven and there is nothing you observe for the protection and convenience of passengers who wish to cross the road nothing at all no policeman stands in the middle of the road to regulate the traffic the drivers pay no heed to the foot passengers at the corner of chancery lane where the press is the thickest the boys and the clerks slip in and out among the horses and the wheels without hurt but how will those ladies be able to get across they never would but for the crossing sweeper the most remunerative part of the work in fact is to convoy the ladies across the road if he magnifies the danger of this service and expects silver for saving the lives of his trembling clients who shall blame him there is still left some of the old posts which divided the footway from the roadway though the whole is now paved in what eighty seven you have stepped into a dandy trap and splashed your feet well perhaps in your day they will have learned to pave more evenly but just at present our paving is a little rough and the stones sometimes small so that here and there after rain these things will happen here we are at blackfriars this is the gate of bridewell where they used to flog women and still flog the prentices yonder is the fleet prison of which we have just read in account in the pickwick papers they have cleared away the old fleet market which used to stand in the middle of the street and they have planted it behind the houses opposite the prison come and look at it let us tread softly over the stones of farringdon market for somewhere beneath our feet lie the bones of poor young chatterton no monument has been erected here to his memory nor is the spot known where he lies but it is somewhere in this place which is a tragic and mournful spot being crammed beneath its pavement with the bones of the poor the outcast the broken down the wrecks and failures of life and littered above the pavement with the wreckage and refuse of the market this place was formerly the burial ground of the shoe lane workhouse we can walk down to the bridge and look at the river no embankment yet eighty seven no penny streamers either yet the watermen grumble at the omnibuses which have cut into their trade here comes the lamplighter with his short letter and his lantern gas of course has been introduced for ever so long they have blindly followed the old plan of lighting and have stuck up a gas lamp wherever there used to be an oil lantern the theatres and places of amusement are brilliant with gas and it is gas which makes the splendour of the gin palace the shops took to it slowly but they are now beginning to understand how to brighten their appearance after dark go into any little thoroughfare however and you will see the shops lit with two or three candles still in the small houses and the country towns the candles linger still and such candles for the most part they are tallow they need constant snuffing they drop their detestable grease everywhere on the tablecloth on your clothes on the butter and on the bread you eighty seven will be saying hard things of gas but you do not know from what darkness and misery of darkness it saved your ancestors as for the churches they are not yet generally provided with gas there is some strange prejudice against it in the minds of the clergy yet it is not papistical or even free-thinking in most of them where they have evening service the pews are provided with two candles apiece stuck in tin candlesticks with four candles for the pulpit and four for the reading desk the effect is not unpleasing but the candles continually require us nothing and the operation is constantly attended with accidents so that the church is always filled with the fragrance of smouldering tallow wicks the repugnance of gas is so great indeed in some quarters that one clergyman the rector of holy trinity marylebone is going to commit all his vestrymen to the ecclesiastical courts because they have attempted to light the church with gas here is a city funeral in one of the burial grounds close to the crowded street 
the clergyman reads the service and the mourners in their long black cloaks stand round the open grave and the coffin is lowered into it and outside there is no cessation at all to the bustle and the noise the wagoner cracks his whip the drover swears at his cattle the busy men run to and fro as if the last rites were not being performed for one who has heard the call of the messenger and perforce obeyed it and look the mould in which the grave is dug is nothing but bits of bones and splinters of coffins the churchyard is no longer a field of clay it is a field of dead citizens you friend eighty seven will manage these things better here goes one of the long stages saw you ever a finer coach more splendidly appointed with better cattle ten miles an hour that coachman reckons upon as soon as he is clear of london they say that in a year or two when all the railways are opened the stage coaches will be ruined the horses all sold and the english breed of horses ruined we shall travel twenty miles an hour without stopping to change horses the accidents will be frightful but those who meet with none will get from london to edinburgh in less than twenty-four hours next year they promise to open the london and birmingham railway here comes a soldier you find his dress absurd to be sure his tight black stock makes his red cheeks seem swollen his queer tall hat with a neat red ball at the top might be more artistic the red shoulder roll not the least like an epaulette would hardly ward off a sword cut the coat with his swallow tail is no protection to the body or the legs the whitened belt must cost an infinite amount of trouble to keep it fit for inspection and a working man's breeches and stockings would be more serviceable than those long trousers there are always brave fellows however ready to enlist the soldier's life is attractive though the discipline is hard and the floggings are truly awful my friend it is half-past five and you are tired let us get back to temple bar and dine at the mitre where we can take our cut off the joint for eighteen pence about this time most men are thinking of dinner by an evening paper of the boy so this is cosy a newly sanded floor a bright fire and a goodly company james a clean tablecloth a couple of candles and the snuffers and the last joint up what have you got in the paper madagascar embassy massacre in new zealand where the devil is new zealand suicide of champion who made the infernal machine great distress in the highlands murder of a process server in ireland crossing of the channel in a balloon i hope that some day an army may not cross it letter from syria concerning the recent great earthquake conduct of the british legion in spain seven men in prison for unlawfully ringing the bells death of the oldest woman in the world aged one hundred and sixty-two years said to have been the nurse of george washington a good deal of news all for one evening paper hush we are in luck here is douglas gerald now we shall hear something good here is lee hunt and here is forster and here ah this is unexpected here comes none other than bas himself of course you know his name it is charles dickens saw one ever a brighter eye or a more self-reliant bearing such self-reliance belongs to those who are about to succeed they say his fortune has already made though but yesterday he was a reporter in the house taking down the speeches in shorthand who is that tall young man with the ugly nose only a journalist they say he wrote that funny paper called the fatal boots in tilt's annual his name is thackeray i believe but i know nothing more about him here comes dinner with a tankard of foaming stout is there any other drink quite so good as stout after you have taken your dinner friend eighty seven i shall prescribe for you what you will never get poor wretch a bottle of the best port in the cellars of the mitre my friend there is one thing in which we of the thirties do greatly excel you of the eighties we can eat like ploughboys and we can drink like draymen as for your nonsense about apollinaris water we do not know what it means and as for your not being able to take a simple glass of port we do not in the least understand it not take a pint of port man alive we can take two bottles and never turn a hair End of chapter four chapter five of fifty years ago by walter besant this librivox recording is in the public domain with the people when the real history of the people comes to be written which will be the history not of the higher but of the lower forms of civilization it will be found that as regards the people of these islands they sank to their lowest point of degradation and corruption in the middle of the eighteenth century a period when they had no religion no morality no education and no knowledge and when they were devoured by 
two dreadful diseases and were prematurely killed by their excessive drinking of gin no virtue at all seems to have survived among all the many virtues attributed to our race except a bulldog courage and tenacity there are glimpses here and there when some essayist or novelist lifts the veil which show conditions of existence so shocking then one asks in amazement how there could have been any cheerfulness in the civilized part of the community for thinking of the terrible creatures in the ranks below they did not think of them they did not know of them to us it seems as if the roaring of that volcano must have been always in their ears and the smoke of it always choking their throats but our people saw and heard nothing across the channel where men's eyes were quicker to see the danger was clearly discerned and the eruption foretold here no one saw anything or feared anything how this country got through without a revolution how it escaped the dangers of that mob are questions more difficult to answer than the one which continually occupies historians how great britain single-handed fought against the conqueror of the world both victories were mainly achieved i believe by the might and majesty of father stick he is dead now and will rule no more in this country but all through the last century and well into this he was more than a king he was a despot relentless terrible he stripped women to the waist and whipped them at bridewell he caught the apprentices and flogged them soundly he lashed the criminal at the cart tail he lashed the slaves in the plantations the soldiers in the army the sailors on board the ships and the boys at school he kept everybody in order and truly if the old violence were to return we might have to call in father stick again he was good up to a certain point beyond which he could not go he could threaten if you do this and this you shall be trounced thus the way of transgressors was made visibly hard for them but he could not educate he taught nothing except obedience to the law he had neither religion nor morals therefore though he kept the people in order he did not advance them on the other hand under his rule they were left entirely to themselves and so they grew worse and worse more thirsty of gin more brutal more ignorant so that in the long run i suppose there was not under the light of the sun a more depraved and degraded race than that which peopled the lowest levels of our great towns there is always in every great town a big lump of lawlessness idleness and hostility to order the danger a hundred years ago was that this lump was getting every day bigger and threatening to include the whole of the working class remember that as yet the government of this realm was wholly in the hands of the wealthier sort only those who had what was humorously called a stake in the country were allowed to share in ruling it those who brought to the service of their native land only their hands and their lives their courage their patience skill endurance and obedience were supposed to have no stake in the country the workers who contribute the whole that makes the prosperity of the country were then excluded from any share in managing it it seems to me that the first improvement of the people dates from their perception of the fact that all have a right to help in managing their own affairs i think one might prove that the ideas of the french revolution when they were once grasped arrested the downward course of the people the first step to dignity and self-respect was to understand that they might become free men and not remain like unto slaves who are ordered and have to obey then they began to struggle for their rights and in their struggle learned a thousand lessons which have stood them in good stead they learned to combine to act together to form committees and councils they learned the art of oratory and the arts of persuasion by speech and pen they learned the power of knowledge in a word the long struggle whose first great victory was the reform act of eighteen thirty two taught the people the art of self-government fifty years ago though that act had been passed the great mass of the people were still outside the government they were governed by a class who desired on the whole to be just and wished well to the people provided their own interests were not disturbed as when the most philanthropic manufacturers loudly cried out as soon as it was proposed to restrict the hours of labour it is not wonderful therefore that the working classes should at that time regard all governments with hostility and religion and laws as chiefly intended to repress the workers 
and to safeguard the interests of landlords and capitalists this fact is abundantly clear from the literature which the working men of eighteen thirty seven delighted to read as regards their religion there was already an immense advance in the spread of the nonconformist sects and the multiplication of chapels as for the churches i am very certain that the working man does not go much to church even yet but fifty years ago he attended service still less often a contemporary who pretends to know asserts that nine out of ten among the working men were professed infidels whose favourite reading was Paine, carlyle and robert taylor the author of the devil's chaplain further he declares that not one working man in a hundred ever opened a bible i refrain from dwelling upon this state of things as compared with that of the present but it appears from a census taken by a recent weekly newspaper which however omitted the mission churches and services and schoolrooms and other places that about one person in nine now attends church or chapel on a sunday as regards drink a question almost as delicate as that of religion it is reported that in london alone three millions of pounds were spent every year in gin which seems a good deal of money to throw away with nothing to show for it but figures are always misleading thus if everybody drank his fair share of this three millions there would be only a single glass of gin every other day for every person and if half the people did not drink at all there would be only one glass of gin a day for those who did still we must admit that three millions is a sum which shows a widespread love of gin as for rum brandy and hollands the various forms of malt liquor fancy drinks and compounds let us reserve ourselves for the chapter on taverns suffice it here to call attention to the fact that there was no blue ribbon worn teetotalers there were it is true but in very small numbers they were not yet a power in the land there was none of the everlasting dinning about the plague spot the national vice and the curse of the age to which we are now accustomed honest men indulged in a bout without subsequent remorse and so long as the drink was unadulterated they did themselves little harm without doubt if the men had become teetotalers there would have been very much more to spend in the homes and the employers would also without doubt have made every effort to reduce the wages accordingly so as to keep up the old poverty that is what the former school of philosophers called a law of political economy the wages of a skilled mechanic fifty years ago seem to have never risen above thirty shillings a week while food clothes and necessaries were certainly much dearer than at present he had savings banks and he sometimes put something by but not nearly so much as he can do now if he is thrifty and in regular work it is quite clear that he was less thrifty in those days than now that he drank more and that he was even more reckless if that is possible about marriage and multiplication of children as for the material condition of the people there cannot be a doubt that it has been amazingly improved within the last fifty years it is not true as stated in a very well-known work that the poor have become poorer though the rich have certainly become richer the skilled working man is better paid now than then his work is more steady his hours are shorter he is better clad with always a suit of clothes apart from his working dress he is better taught he is better mannered he has holidays he has clubs he is no longer forbidden to combine he can cooperate he holds meetings he has much better newspapers to read his food is better and cheaper he has model lodging houses not only is he actually better he is relatively better compared with the richer classes while for the last ten years these have been growing poorer every day although still much richer than they were fifty years ago moreover it is becoming more difficult in every line owing to the upward pressure of labour to become rich his amusements no longer have the same brutality which used to characterise them the ring was his chief delight and a well-fought battle between two accomplished bruisers caused his heart to leap with joy unhappily the ring fell not because the national sentiment concerning pugilism changed but by its own vices and because nearly every fight was a fight on the cross so that betting on your man was no longer possible and every victory was arranged beforehand there are now signs of its revival and if it can be in any way regulated it will be a very good thing for the country then there was dog-fighting which is still carried on in certain parts of the country only a few years ago i saw a dozen dog-fights each with its ring of eager lookers-on one sunday morning upon the sands between red car and saltburn all round london again there were ponds quantities of ponds all marked in the maps of the period and now all filled up and built over 
some for instance were in the fields on the east side of tottenham court road hither on sundays came the london working man with ducks cats and dogs and proceeded to enjoy himself with cat hunts and duck hunts in these ponds there were also bull and bear baitings and badger drawings as for the fairs bartholomew and greenwich one is sorry that they had to be abolished but i suppose that london had long been too big for a fair which may be crowded but must not be mobbed a real old fair with rows of stalls crammed with all kinds of things which looked ever so much prettier under the flaring lamps than in the shops with richardson's theatre the wild beast show the wrestlers and the cudgel players the boxers with or without the gloves the dwarfs giants fat women bearded women and monsters was a truly delightful thing to the rustics in the country but in london it was in congress and even in arcadia a modern fair is apt to lose its picturesque aspect towards nightfall on the whole it is just as well for london that it has lost its ancient fairs it is not in connection with working men but with the whole people that one speaks of prisons i do not think that our prison system at the present day is everything that it might be there have been one or two books published of late years which make one uncomfortable in thinking of the poor wretches immured in these abodes of solitary suffering still if one has to choose between a lonely cell and the society of the prison birds by day and night one would prefer the former some attempts had been made in newgate and elsewhere to prevent the prisoners from corrupting each other but with small success those who were tried and sentenced were separated from those who were waiting their trial the boys were separated from the men the girls from the women yet the results of being committed to prison for however short a period were destructive of all morals and the last shred of principle not a single girl or woman who went into prison modest and virtuous but became straightway ashamed of her modesty and virtue and came out of the prison already an abandoned woman not a man or boy who associated with the prisoners for a week but became a past master in all kinds of wickedness in the night rooms they used to lock up fifteen or twenty prisoners together and leave them there all night to interchange their experiences and what experiences only those who were under sentence of death had separate cells these poor wretches were put into narrow and dark rooms receiving light only from the court in which the criminals are permitted to walk during the day they slept on a mat and in former days had but twenty-four hours between sentence and execution with bread and water for all their food transportation still went on with the horrors of the convict ship the convict hulks and the convict establishments of new south wales and tasmania the horrors of the system have always seemed to me as forming an essential part of the system with better management on modern ideas transportation should be far better than the present system of hopeless punishment by long periods of imprisonment we can never return to transportation as far as any colony is concerned but i venture to prophesy that the next change of the penal laws will be the re-establishment of transportation with the prospect of release a gift of land and a better chance for an honest life meantime the following lines belong to fifty years ago they are the farewell of convicts about to sail for botany bay the derby day come bet my pet and sow my pal a bus and then farewell and ned the primus ruffling cove that ever nailed a swell to share the swag of chaff the gap we'll never meet again the hulks is now my brows and crib the whole my dossing ken don't nab the bib my bet this chance must happen soon or later for certain sure it is that transportation comes by nature his lordship self upon the bench so downy his white wig in might sail with me if friends had he to bring him up to priggin and is it not unkim and fly in them as rules the nation to make us in with botany our public education but sal so kind be sure your mind that beaks don't catch you tripping you'll find it hard to be for shopping sent on board the shipping so tip your mons afore we parts don't blear your eyes and nose another grip my jolly hearts here's luck and off we goes debtors prisons were in full swing there were white cross street prison built in eighteen thirteen for the exclusive reception of debtors who were before this crowded together with criminals at newgate queen's bench prison the fleet and the marshal sea the king's bench prison was the largest and so to speak the most fashionable of these prisons both at the king's bench and the fleet debtors were allowed to purchase what were called the rules which enabled them to live within a certain area outside the prison and practically left them free they paid a certain percentage on their debts this practice enabled the debtor to refuse paying his debts and to save his money for himself or his heirs 
lodgings however within the rules were bad and expensive there was no national compulsory system of education yet the children of respectable working men were sent to school the children of the very poor those who lived from hand to mouth by day jobs by chance and luck were not taught anything if you talk to a working man of sixty or thereabouts you will most likely discover that he can read though he has very often forgotten how to write he was taught when he was a child at the schools of the national society or at those of the british and foreign society or at the parish schools of which there were a great many there were also many thousands of children who went to the sunday school yet partly through the neglect of parents and partly through the demand for children's labor in the factories nearly a half of the children in the country grew up without any schooling in eighteen thirty seven there were forty per cent of the men and sixty five per cent of the women who could not sign their own names and there were already effected or just about to be effected three immense reforms the like of which the nation had never seen before which are together working for a revolution of peace not of war greater than contemplated by the most sincere and most disinterested of the french revolutionaries the first was the reform of the penal laws in the beginning of the century the law recognized two hundred and twenty-three capital offences a man might be hanged for almost anything if he appeared in disguise on a public road if he cut down young trees if he shot rabbits if he poached at night if he stole anything worth five shillings from a person or a shop if he came back from transportation before his time a gypsy if he remained in the same place a year in fact the chief desire of the government was to get rid of the criminal classes by hanging them it was sir samuel romilly as everybody knows who first began to attack this bloodthirsty code he was assisted by the growth of public opinion and by the juries who practically repealed the laws by refusing to convict it was not again until the year eighteen thirty six that counsel for a prisoner under trial for felony was permitted to address the jury in the year eighteen thirty four there were four hundred and eighty death sentences in eighteen thirty eight only one hundred and sixteen in eighteen thirty four eight hundred and ninety four persons were sentenced to transportation for life and in eighteen thirty eight only two hundred and sixty six remember that this wicked severity only served to enlist the sympathies of the people against the government the second great step was the repeal of the acts which forbade combination until the year eighteen twenty the people had been forbidden to combine their only power against employers who worked them as many hours a day as they dared and paid them wages as small as they could who took their children and locked them up in unwholesome factories was in combination and they were forbidden to combine when the law an old mediaeval law was repealed it was found that any attempt to hold public meetings might be put down by force so that though they could not combine the chief means of promoting combination was taken from them the third great step was the extension of the suffrage so that now there is no britain or irishman but can if he please have his vote in the government of the nation it is not a great share which is conferred by one vote but it enables every man to feel that he is himself a part of the nation that the government is not imposed upon him but elected and approved by himself considering all these things have we any reason to be surprised when we learn that on the queen's accession there was among the people no loyalty whatever attachment to the sovereign personal devotion to the young queen rallying round the throne all these things were not even phrases to the working class for they never heard them used there was no loyalty at all either to the queen or to the institution of a limited monarchy or to the constitution or to the church for a hundred and fifty years there had been no loyalty among the people loyalty left the country with james the second not one of the sovereigns who followed him commanded the personal enthusiasm of the people not even farmer george for whom there had been some kind of affection with something of contempt from sixteen eighty seven until eighteen thirty seven which is exactly one hundred and fifty years not one sovereign who sat upon the throne of england could boast that he had the love of the people not one wished to have the love of the people he represented a principle he governed with the assistance of a few families and by the votes of a small class as king he was a stranger when he drove through the streets the people hurrahed but they did not know him and they cared nothing for him therefore the sentiment of loyalty had to be reborn it could only be awakened by a woman young virtuous naturally amiable and resolved on ruling by constitutional methods yet in some of the journals written for and read by the working men the things said concerning the queen the prince consort in the court were simply horrible and disgusting such things are no longer said 
there are still papers which speak of the aristocracy as a collection of titled profligates and of the clergy as a crowd of pampered hypocrites but of the queen it is rare indeed to find mention other than is respectful her life and example for fifty years have silenced the slanders it has been found once more possible for a sovereign to possess the love of her people the papers read by the working men were not only scurrilous but they were republican and revolutionary the republic whose example they set before themselves was not the american which is conservative for of this they knew nothing let us clearly understand this fifty years ago america was far more widely separated from england than is china now the ideal republic was then the earlier form of the first french republic these people cared little for the massacres which accompany the application of republican principles i do not say that they wished to set the heads of the queen's ladies-in-waiting on pikes but they thought the massacres of innocent women by the french an accident rather than a consequence they loved the cry of liberty equality and fraternity and still believed in it they dreamed of a country which they thought could be established by law in which every man was to be the equal of his neighbour as clever as skilful as capable as rich and as happy the dream continues and will always continue to exist it is a generous dream there never has been a nobler dream so that it is a thousand pities that human greed selfishness ambition and masterfulness will not suffer the dream to be realized those who advocated an attempt to realize it flung hard names at the crown the court the aristocracy the church the educated and the wealthy presently they began to formulate the way by which they thought to place themselves within reach of their object the way was chartism they wanted to carry six measures universal suffrage annual parliaments vote by ballot abolition of property qualification payment of members and equal electoral districts very well we have got practically four out of the six points and there are many who think that we are as far off the millennium as ever yet there are however still among us people who believe that we can be made happy just merciful and disinterested by changing the machinery changing the machinery the old party of radicals still work themselves into a white heat by crying for change in the machinery and now a thing which was never contemplated even by the chartists themselves the really important thing has been acquired by the people they are no longer the governed but the governors the government is no longer a thing apart from themselves and outside them it is their own it is the government of the people of england if there is anything in it which they do not like they can alter it if there is anything they agree to abolish they can abolish it whether it be church crown lords wealth education science art anything they may destroy what they please they may reduce the english to an illiterate peasantry if they please they will not please i for one have the greatest confidence in the justice the common sense and the conservatism of the english and the scotch the people do not as yet half understand their own power while they are gradually growing to comprehend it they will be learning the history of their country the duties and responsibilities of citizenship the dangers of revolution and the advantages of those old institutions by whose aid the whole world has been covered with those who speak the anglo-saxon speech and are governed by the english law my friends we are changed indeed fifty years ago we were as i have said still in the eighteenth century the people had no power no knowledge no voice they were the slaves of their employers they were brutish and ill-conditioned ready to rebel against their rulers but not knowing how chafing under laws which they did not make and restraints which kept them from acting together or from meeting to ask if things must always continue so we are changed indeed we now stand upright our faces are full of hope though we are oppressed by doubt and questions because we know not which path of the many before us will be the wisest the future is all our own we are no longer the servants we are the masters the absolute rulers of the greatest empire that the world has ever seen god grant that we govern it with wisdom End of chapter five chapter six of fifty years ago by walter besant this librivox recording is in the public domain with the middle class the great middle class supposed before the advent of mr matthew arnold to possess all the virtues to be the backbone stay and prop of the country must have a chapter to itself in the first place the middle class was far more a class apart than it is at present in no sense did it belong to society men and professions of any kind except the two services 
could only belong to society by right of birth and family connections men in trade bankers were still accounted tradesmen could not possibly belong to society that is to say if they went to live in the country they were not called upon by the county families and in town they were not admitted by the men into their clubs or by ladies into their houses those circles of which there are now so many artistic aesthetic literary all of them considering themselves to belong to society were then out of society altogether nor did they overlap and intersect each other the middle class knew its own place respected itself made its own society for itself and cheerfully accorded to rank its reverence due the annals of the poor are meagre only here and there one gets a glimpse into their lives but the middle class is much better known because it has had prophets nearly all the poets novelists essayists journalists and artists have sprung from it those who adorned the thirties and the forties hood hook galt dickens albert smith thackeray all belonged to it george eliot whose country towns are those of the thirties and the forties was essentially a woman of the middle class middle class life especially in the country was dull far far duller than modern life even in the quietest country town the men had their business the women had the house incomes ran small a great deal was done at home that is now done out of it there was a weekly washing day when the house steamed with hot soap suds and the lines were out upon the poles they were painted green and were square and on the lines hung half the family linen all the jam was made at home the cakes the pies and the puddings by the wife and daughters the bread was homemade the beer was home brewed and better beer than good home brewed no man need desire all those garments which are not worn outside were made at home everybody dined in the middle of the day therefore in the society of the country town dinner parties did not exist on the other hand there were sociable evenings which began with a sit-down tea with muffins and tea-cakes very delightful and ended with a hot supper tobacco was not admitted in any shape except that of snuff into the better kind of middle-class house only working men smoked vulgar pipes the sabbath was respected there was no theatre nearer than the county town the girls had probably never seen a play every man who respected himself laid down port but there was little drinking of wine except on sunday afternoons no one not even the lady scorned the glass of something warm with a spoon in it after supper for the young there was a fair once a year now and then a travelling circus came along there was a lecture occasionally on an instructive subject such as chemistry or astronomy or sculpture there were picnics but these were rare if there were show places in that neighbourhood parties were made to them and tea was festively taken among the ruins of the abbey fashion descends slowly it is now the working man who takes his wife into the country for tea fifty years ago he took his wife nowhere and scorned tea open-air games and sports there were none no lawn tennis badminton or anything of that kind in those days even croquet which is now so far lost in the mists of antiquity that men of thirty are too young to remember the rage for it was actually not yet invented archery certainly existed and the comic writers are always drawing pictures of the young ladies sticking their arrows into the legs of people a hundred feet or so wide of the target but archery belonged to a class rather above that which we are now considering there was not much sketching and painting there was no amateur photography there was no catching of strange creatures in ponds for the aquarium a fashion also now happily extinct there was not in fact any single pursuit amusement or game which would bring young people together in the open air there was no travelling the summer holiday had not yet got down in the country in london to be sure everybody down to bevis marks and simry axe went out of town and to the seaside in july or august but in the country nobody thought of such a thing not the vicar's daughters not the solicitor's wife not the family of the general practitioner the very schoolmaster who got his four weeks in the summer and his three at christmas spent them at home in such joy as accompanies rest from labour with no outdoor amusements and with no summer holiday how much is life simplified but the simplicity of life means monotony 
vaci unt vitam balnea vena venus in the winter things were somewhat different in some towns there was the county ball at this function one had the pleasure of gazing upon ladies and gentlemen of the highest rank and fashion and of observing that they kept to themselves like a hindu caste danced with each other at the upper end of the room cast disparaging glances at the dresses of the ladies of the lower end and sniffed at their manner and appearance this was true joy there were also occasional dances at home but these were rare because people had not learned how to meet and dance without making a fuss over it taking up carpets putting candles in tin sconces keeping late hours and having a supper the preparation of which was mainly done by the ladies of the house and it nearly killed them and drove the servants the genteel middle-class family often got along with only one to give notice i think that the dances which had gone out in london still lingered in the country there were for instance the caledonians as well as the lancers there were country dances without end the very names of which are now lost the gentlemen performed the proper steps with grace and agility while the ladies were careful to preserve an attitude suppose the only one possible for a lady while dancing in which the figure was bent forward the face was turned up with the chin stuck out while the hands were occupied in holding up the dress to the regulation height the elders meanwhile played long whist at tables lit by candles which wanted snuffing between the deals the bashful youth of the party was always covering himself with shame by his clumsiness in snuffing out the candles or even if he succeeded in taking off the red-hot ball of burnt thread he too often neglected to close the instrument with which he effected the operation and thereby mightily offended the nostrils of the company when there was no dancing the younger members began with a little music their songs how faded and stale they seem now if one tries to sing them turned chiefly on the affections and the favourite poet was felicia hemans after the little music they sat down to a round game of which there were a great many such as commerce speculation vingt et un limited loo or pope joan the last was played with a board i remember the board it was a round thing lacquered and like a punch bowl but i think with divisions as for the game itself and what was done with the board i quite forget but both game and bowl lasted quite into the fifties are there any country circles now where they still play pope joan with mother o pearl counters and after the game have a grand settlement and exchange the counters for silver and copper some with chuckles and others with outward smiles but inward rage people were extremely punctilious on the subject of calls one remembers the call in the mill on the floss the call was due at regular intervals so that even the day should almost be known on which it was paid or returned it was a ceremonial which necessitated a great deal of ritual and make-believe no one for instance was to be surprised in doing any kind of work there was a fiction in genteel families that the ladies of the house never did anything serious or serviceable after dinner the afternoon was supposed to be devoted either to walking or to making calls or to elegant trifling at home therefore if the girls were at the moment engaged upon any useful work many of them poor things never did anything but useful work they crammed it under the sofa and pretended to be reading a book or painting or knitting or to be engaged in easy and fashionable conversation why they went through this elaborate pretence i have not the least idea because everybody knew that every girl in the place was always making mending cutting out basting gusseting trimming turning and contriving how do you suppose that the solicitor's daughters made so brave a show on sundays if they were not clever enough to make up things for themselves everybody of course knew it and why the girls would not own up at once one cannot now understand perhaps it was a sort of suspicion or faint hope or a wild dream that a reputation for ladylike uselessness might enable them to cross the line at the county ball and mingle with the county people are there still any circles of society in which if a lady with her daughters calls upon another lady with her daughters the decanters biscuits and glasses are placed upon the table and the visitors are asked whether they will take port or sherry this fifty years ago was always done in country towns and the visitors always took a glass of port or sherry in some houses it was not port and sherry that were placed upon the table but red and white i do not know whether the red was currant or raspberry but i think that the white was generally cowslip when the visitors were gone the ladies got out their work again threaded their needles and spent an enjoyable hour or two in discussing the appearance the dress the manners and the resources of their visitors 
but the visit did them good because it compelled company manners which are always good for girls and it dragged them a little out of themselves they were too much en famille these girls they were never separated from each other the boys got out to school or to business all day but the poor girls were always together side by side they did their household duties side by side they sewed and dress maked side by side they walked side by side they prayed in the church side by side they slept small chance of happiness was theirs happiness is a separate distinct individual kind of thing in which one can consult one's own likes until in the fullness of time there came along the lover a humdrum commonplace kind of lover i dare say but his sweetheart was as commonplace as himself and she exchanged a house where she was a better kind of servant for one of exactly the same sort of which she was the mistress and when one says mistress it must be remembered that man was in those days much more of a master in the house than he is now allowed to be i speak not at random but from the evidence of those who remember and from study of the literature both that written by the men and that by the women i am certain that the husband unless he was henpecked a pleasing word now seldom used was always the master and generally the tyrant in the house let me with some diffidence approach the subject of the church in the country town i never truly understood the church of fifty years ago until in the autumn of eighteen eighty five i perambulated with one who is jealous for church architecture and church antiquities the northeast corner of norfolk where there are many churches and most of them are fine in our pilgrimage among these monuments we presently came upon one at the aspect of which we were fain to sit down and weep it was externally an old and venerable structure which might have been made beautiful within plaster covered the walls and hid the columns the interior of the church was crowded with high pews painted white and having along the top a sham mahogany kind of handrail the chancel was encumbered with these enclosures which hid the old brass work that which belonged to the squire was provided with red curtains on brass rods to keep the common people from gazing at the quality the reading-desk pulpit and altar were covered with a cloth which had been red but had long before faded away into an indescribably shabby brown the pulpit was not part of the old three-decker but was stuck into the wall the windows had lost their old tracery the painted glass was gone the roof was a flat whitewashed ceiling the church to eyes accustomed to better things presented a deplorable appearance my friend pointing solemnly to the general shabbiness remarked donec templa refecoris it was the motto of the journal started early in the forties by a small knot of cambridge men among whom was mr beresford hope now alas no more who desired to raise and beautify public worship in the anglican faith and also i believe to assert and insist upon certain points of doctrine and they clearly perceived that while the churches remained in their neglected condition and church architecture was at its then low ebb their doctrine was impossible how far they have succeeded not only the ritualists themselves proclaim but also every other party in the church and even the nonconformists who have shared in the increased beauty and fitness of public worship he who can remember the ordinary church services in the early fifties very well knows what they were in the thirties except that in the latter there were still some venerable divines who wore a wig the musical part of the service was to begin with taken slow incredibly slow no one now would who is not old enough to remember believe how slow it was the voluntary at the beginning was a slow rumble the psalms were very slowly read by the clergyman and the clerk alternately the gloria alone being sung also to a slow rumble the choir was generally stationed in the organ loft which has been known to be built over the altar at the east end as at st mary's cambridge but was generally at the west end it was not a choir of boys and men only but of women and men the te deum was always jackson from my youth up have i loathed jackson there was just one lively bit in it for which one looked and waited but it lasted a very few bars and then the thing dragged on more slowly than ever till it came to the welcome words let me never be confounded two hymns were sung very slowly they were always of the kind which expressed either the despair of the sinner or the doubtful joy of the believer i say doubtful because he was constantly being warned not to be too confident not to mistake a vague hope for the assurance of election and because with the rest of the congregation he was always being told how few in number were those elect and how extremely unlikely that there could be many of those few in that one flock 
read any of the theological literature of the period and mark the gulf that lies between us and our fathers there were many kinds of preachers just as at present the eloquent the high and dry the low and threatening the forcible feeble the florid the prosy the scholarly but they all seemed to preach the same doctrine of hopelessness the same gospel of despair the same father of all cruelty the same son who could at best help only a few and when any of that congregation dared to speak the truth which was seldom these blasphemous persons whispered that it was best to live and enjoy the present and to leave off trying to save their souls against such fearful odds and with the knowledge that if they were going to be saved it would be by election and by no merit or effort of their own while if the contrary was going to happen it was no use striving against fate wretched miserable creed to think that unto this was brought the divine message of the son of man and to think of the despairing death-beds of the careless the life-long terror of the most religious and the agony of the survivors over the death of one cut off in his sins what we now call the life of the church with its meetings committees fraternities guilds societies and organizations then simply did not exist the clergyman had an easy time he visited little he had an evening service once a week he did not pretend to keep saints days and minor festivals and fasts none of his congregation expected him to keep them as for his being a teetotaler for the sake of the weaker brethren that would have seemed to everybody pure foolishness as indeed it is only people now run to the opposite belief yet he was a good man for the most part who lived a quiet and exemplary life and a good scholar scholars are indeed sadly to seek among the modern clergy a sound theologian a judge of good port and a gentleman but processions banners surplice choirs robes and the like he would have regarded as unworthy the consideration of one who was a churchman a protestant and a scholar to complete this brief study of the church fifty years ago let us remark that out of eleven thousand five hundred livings which it possessed three thousand were under one hundred pounds and one thousand under sixty pounds a year that there were six thousand eighty pluralists and two thousand one hundred non-residents that the dissenters had only been allowed to marry in their own chapels and by their own clergy in the year eighteen thirty one that they were not admitted as dissenters to the universities and that the incomes of some of the bishops were enormous as for art in the house or out of it art in pictures sculpture architecture dress furniture fiction oratory acting the middle-class person the resident of the country town knew nothing of it his church was most likely a barn his own house was four square his furniture was mahogany his pictures were coloured engravings the ornaments of his rooms were hideous things in china painted red and white his hangings were of a warm and comfortable red his sofas were horsehair his drawing-room was furnished with a round table on which lay keepsakes and forget-me-nots but as the family never used the room which was generally kept locked it mattered little how it was furnished he dressed if he was an elderly gentleman in a spencer button tight a high black satin stock and boots up to his knees very likely he still carried his hair in a tail if he was young he had long and flowing hair waved and curled with the aid of pomade bears grease and oil he cultivated whiskers also curled and oiled all round his face he wore a magnificent stock with a liberal kind of knot in the front in this he stuck a great pin and he was magnificent in waistcoats as for the ladies dresses i cannot trust myself to describe them the accompanying illustration will be of service in bringing the fashion home to the reader but this is the effigy of a london and a fashionable lady her country cousin would be two or three years at least behind her well the girls had blooming cheeks bright eyes and simple manners they were much more retiring than the modern maiden they knew very little of young men and their manners and the young men knew very little of them the novels of the time are full of the shyness of the young man in presence of the maiden their ideas were limited they had strong views as to rank and social degrees and longed earnestly for a chance of rising but a single step their accomplishments were generally contemptible and of art they had no idea whatever how should they have any idea when year after year they saw no art and heard of none but they were good daughters who became good wives and good mothers our own my friends and we must not make even a show of holding them up to ridicule one point must not be forgotten in the midst of all this conventional dullness there was in the atmosphere of the thirties a certain love of romance which showed itself chiefly in a fireside enthusiasm for the cause of oppressed races poland had many friends the negro they even went so far in those days as to call him a brother was warmly befriended the case of the oppressed greek attracted the good wishes of everybody 
now sympathy with oppression that is unseen may sometimes be followed by sympathy with the oppression which is before the eyes so that one is not surprised to hear that the case of the women and the children in the mines and the factories was soon afterwards taken seriously in hand the verse which then formed so large a part of family reading had a great deal to do with the affections especially their tearful side while the tales they loved the best were those of knights and fair dames of adventure and romance a picture by du maurier and punch once represented a man singing a comic song at an at home nobody laughed some faces expressed wonder some pity some contempt a few indignation but not one face smiled consider the difference in the year eighteen thirty seven every face would have been broadened out in a grin do we therefore laugh no more we do not laugh so much certainly and we laugh differently our comic man of society still tells good stories but he no longer sings songs in his stories he prefers the rapier or the jewelled dagger to the bludgeon those who desire to make the acquaintance of the comic man as he was accepted in society and in the middle class should read the works of theodore hook and of albert smith to begin with he played practical jokes he continually played practical jokes and he was never killed as would now happen by his victims i am certain that we should kill a man who came to our houses and played the jokes which then were permitted to the comic man he poured melted butter into coat pockets at suppers he turned round signposts and made them point the wrong way in order to send people whither they did not wish to go it may be remarked that his tricks were rarely original he wrenched off door-knockers he turned off the gas at the meter he tied strings across the river to knock people backwards in their boats he tied two doors together and then rang both bells and waited with a grin from ear to ear he rang up people in the dead of the night on any pretext he filled keyholes with powdered slate pencil when the master of the house was coming home late he hoaxed innocent ladies and laughed when they were nearly driven mad with worry and terror he went to masquerades carrying a tray full of medicated sweets think of such a thing which he distributed and then retired and came back in another dress to gaze upon the havoc he had wrought again it was a time when candles were still carried about the house and as yet it was thought that gas in bedrooms was dangerous he dipped the candles waiting for the ladies when they went to bed into water so that they sputtered and went out and made alarming fireworks when they were lit and then to remove the horrible smell the candles being of tallow he offered to burn pastillas but these were confections of gunpowder and water and caused the liveliest emotions and sent the poor ladies upstairs in an agony of nervous terror there was no end to the tricks of this abominable person once he received an invitation to a great ball which a royal personage was to honour with his presence the royal personage was to be regaled in a special supper-room apart from the common herd the table had been laid in this room with the uh, with the most elaborate care and splendour down the middle of the table there meandered a beautiful canal filled with gold and silver fish a contrivance believed in those remote ages to set off and greatly increase the beauty of a supper-table our ingenious friend quickly discovered that the room was accessible from the garden where some workmen were still putting the finishing touches to their work the men who had constructed the marquee and had arranged the lamps and things he went therefore into the garden he invited these workmen to partake of a little refreshment led them into the royal supper-room and begged them to help themselves and to spare nothing in a twinkling the tables were cleared he then put certain chemicals into the canal which instantly killed every fish this done he returned to the ballroom and waited for the moment when the illustrious personage the hostess on his arm should enter that supper-room and gaze upon those empty dishes on another occasion he discovered that a respectable butler was in the habit of creeping upstairs in order to listen to the conversation leaving his slippers in position at the head of the kitchen stairs he therefore hid himself while the poor man after adjusting the slippers walked noiselessly upstairs he then hammered a tin tack into the heel of each slipper and waited again until a confederate gave the alarm and the fat butler hurrying down slipped one foot into each slipper and went headlong into the depths below and was nearly killed never laughed so much in all my life sir at oxford of course he enjoyed himself wonderfully for with a party of chosen friends he met no less a person than the vice-chancellor at ten or eleven at night going home alone and peacefully to raise that personage lift him on their shoulders crown him with a lamp cover and carry him triumphantly to the gates of his own college was not only a great stroke of fun but a thing not to be resisted and he blew up the group of cain and abel in the quadrangle of brace nose and what he did with proctor's bulldogs and the like passeth all understanding 
it was at oxford that the funny man made the acquaintance of the major now the major was in love but he was no longer so young as he had been and his hair was getting thin on the top a very serious thing in the days of long hair wavy curled singed and oiled flowing gracefully over the ears and the coat collar the major in an evil moment commissioned the practical joker whose character one would think must have been well known to procure for him a bottle of a certain patent hair restorer of course the joker brought him a bottle of depilatory mixture which being credulously accepted and well rubbed in deprived the poor major of every hair that was left it is needless to relate how when he was at richmond with a party of ladies the introduction of the maids of honour was a thing not to be resisted and one can quite understand how one of the young ladies was led on to ordering in addition to another maid of honour a small gentleman usher of the black rod if they had one quite cold the middle class of london before the development of omnibuses lived in and round the city of london bloomsbury being the principal suburb many thousands of well-to-do people merchants and shopkeepers lived in the city itself and were not ashamed of their houses and filled the city churches on the sunday some lived at clapham camberwell and stockwell on the south a great many at islington where a vigorous offshoot of the great city ran through the high street past saddler's wells as far as highbury a few even lived at highgate and hampstead there were the short stages from london to all these places but so far as can be gathered most of those who lived in these suburbs before the days of the omnibus had their own carriages and drove to town and home again every day on sunday they entertained their friends and the young gentlemen of the city delighted to hire horses and ride down the comic literature of the time is full of the cockney horsemen it will be remembered how mr horatio sparkins rode gallantly from town to dine with his hospitable friends on sunday the manners and customs of the islington colony which may i suppose be taken for the suburban and bloomsbury people generally except that russell and bedford squares were very very much grander may be read in albert smith's adventures of mr ledbury his natural history of the gent the poddleton legacy and other contemporary works very good reading they are if approached in the right spirit which is a humble and an inquiring spirit many remarkable things may be learned from these books for instance would you know how the middle class evening party was conducted here are a few details the gentleman of whose long and wavy hair i have already spoken wore for evening dress a high black stock the many folds of which covered the shirt and were enriched by a massive pin the white shirt cuffs were neatly turned over their wrists their dress coats were buttoned their trousers were tight and they wore straps and pumps the ladies either wore curls neatly arranged on each side you may still see some old ladies who have clung to the pretty fashion of their youth or they wore their hair dropped in a loop down the cheek and behind the ear and then fastened in some kind of band with ribbons at the back of the head the machinery of the frocks reminds one of the wedding morning in pickwick when all the girls were crying out to be done up for they had hooks and eyes and the girls were helpless by themselves pink was the favourite colour and a very pretty colour too and there was plenty of scope for the milliner's art in lace and artificial flowers the elder ladies were magnificent in turbans and the younger ones wore across the forehead a band of velvet or silk decorated with a gold buckle or something in pearls and diamonds this fashion lingered long i remember it must have been about the year eighteen fifty a certain elderly maiden lady who always wore every day and all day a black ribbon across her brows this alone gave her a severe and keep her distance kind of expression but in addition the ribbon contained in the middle if i remember aright a steel buckle though a lady one thinks would hardly wear a steel buckle on her forehead sometimes there was a wreath of flowers worn like a coronet and sometimes what i think hardly in islington a tiara of jewels in middle-class circles the fashion of evening dress was marred by a fashion common to both sexes of wearing cleaned gloves now kid gloves could only be cleaned by one process so that the result was an effect of terps which could not be subdued by any amount of patchouli or eau de cologne there were as yet no cards for the dances and when a waltz was played everybody was afraid to begin quadrilles of various kinds were danced and the country dance yet lingered at this end of the town the polka came later dancing was stopped whenever any young lady could be persuaded to sing and happy was the young man whose avocations prevented him to wear the delightful moustaches forbidden in the city and in all the professions young templars wore them until they were called when they had to be shaved for a city man to wear a moustache would have been ruin and bankruptcy 
other portions of albert smith's works if read with discernment will enable one to make discoveries of some interest one is that our modern airy is really a survival not as is sometimes believed a growth of modern days his ally and mistress Harriet, does not seem to have existed at all fifty years ago at least there is no mention of her but airy flourished he did really dreadful things he was even worse than the practical joker when he took titus ledbury abroad he went into the cathedrals on purpose to spill the holy water to blow out the candles and to make faces at the women kneeling at their prayers he got barrel organs into lofts and invited men to bring grisettes and dance all night with a supper brought from the charcuterie wherever there was jumping dancing singing and riot airy was to the fore on board the steamer he seized a bottle of stout and took up a prominent and commanding position where he drank it before all the world smoking cigars and laughing loudly at the poor people who were ill at home he wrenched off knockers played practical jokes drank more stout ate oysters chaffed bar maidens and called for brandy and water continually he was loud in his dress and in his voice he was insolent caddish and offensive in his manners generally one thinks he would end his career at white cross street or the fleet or the queen's bench doubtless however there are still among us old gentlemen who now sit at church on sunday with venerable white hair among their children and grandchildren and while the voice of the preacher rises and falls their memory wanders back to the days when they danced and sang with the grisettes when they wrenched the knockers when they went from the theatre to the coal cellar and from the coal cellar to the finish and came home with an unsteady step and light purse in the grey of the morning the debtors prison belonged chiefly to the great middle class before them stalked always a grisly spectre called by some insolvency and by others bankruptcy this villainous ghost seized its victims by the collar and hailed them within the walls of a debtors prison where it made them abandon hope and abide there till the day of death everybody is familiar with the inside of the fleet the queen's bench the marshalsea the white cross street they are all pulled down now and the only way to get in prison for debt is to incur contempt of court for which holloway is the reward but what a drop from the humours of the queen's bench with its drinking tobacco singing and noisy revelry to the solitary cell of holloway prison the debtors prison is gone and the world is the better for its departure nowadays the ruined betting man the rake the sharper the profligate the fraudulent bankrupt have no prison where they can carry on their old excesses again though in humbler way they go down below the surface out of sight and what they do and how they fare nobody knows and very few care End of chapter six chapter seven of fifty years ago by walter besant this librivox recording is in the public domain in society as to society in eighteen thirty seven contemporary commentators differ for according to some society was always gambling running away with each other's wives causing and committing scandals or whispering them the men were spendthrifts and profligates the women extravagant and heartless of course the same things would be said and are sometimes said of the present day and will be said in all following ages because to the ultra virtuous or to the satirist who trots out the old stale worn-out sham indignation or to the isn't it awful gaping gobe mouche every generation seems worse than all those which preceded it we know the tag and the burden and the weariness of the old song as for myself i am no indignant satirist and the news that certain young gentlemen have been sitting up all night playing baccarat drinking champagne and carrying on after the fashion of youth in all ages does not greatly agitate my soul or surprise me or lash me into virtuous indignation not at all at the same time if one must range oneself and take a side one may imitate the example of benjamin disraeli and declare for the side of the angels and once a declared follower of that army one may be allowed to rejoice that things are vastly improved in the space of two generations of this there can be no doubt making easy allowance for exaggeration 
and refusing to see depravity in a whole class because there are one or two cases that the world calls shocking and reads eagerly it is quite certain that there is less of everything that should not be than there used to be less in proportion and even less in actual extent the general tone in short the general manners of society have very much improved of this i say again there can be no doubt let any one for instance read lady blessington's victims of society though there is an unreal ring about this horrid book so that one cannot accept it for a moment as a faithful picture of the times such a book could not now be written at all it would be impossible let us sing of lighter themes take for instance the great subject of swagger there is still swagger even in these days cavalry officers in garrison towns are still supposed to swagger eton boys swagger in their own little village undergraduates swagger the putting on of side by the way is a peculiarly modern form of swagger it is the assumption of certain qualities and powers which are considered as deserving of respect swagger fifty years ago was a coarser kind of thing officers swaggered men of rank swaggered men of wealth swaggered gentlemen and military frogs there are no longer any military frogs swaggered in taverns clubs and in the streets the adoption of quiet manners the wearing of rank with unobtrusive dignity the possession of wealth without ostentation of wit without the desire to be always showing it these are points in which we are decidedly in advance of our fathers there was a great deal of cuff and collar stock and breastpin about the young fellows of the day they were oppressive in their gallantry in public places they asserted themselves they were loud in their talk in order to understand the young man of the day one may study the life and career of that gay and gallant gentleman the count d'orsay model and paragon for all young gentlemen of his time they were louder in their manners and in their conversation they were insulting especially the wits things were said by these gentlemen even in a duelling age which would be followed in these days by a violent personal assault in fact the necessity of fighting a duel if you kicked a man seems to have been the cause why men were constantly allowed to call each other by implication fool ass knave and so forth so very disagreeable a thing was it to turn out in the early morning in order to be shot at that men stood anything rather than subject themselves to it consider the things said by douglas gerald for instance they are always witty of course but they are often mere insults yet nobody seems ever to have fallen upon him and not only this kind of thing was permitted but things of the grossest taste passed unrebuked for instance only a few years before our period at holland house not at a club or a tavern or a tap-room but actually at holland house the most refined and cultured place in london the following conversation once passed they were asking who was the worst man in the whole of history a most unprofitable question and one man after the other was proposed among the company present was the prince regent himself i said sydney smith no other than sydney smith if you please have always considered the duke of orleans regent of france to have been the worst man in all history and he looking at the illustrious guest was a prince a dead silence followed broken by the prince himself for my own part he said i have always considered that he was excelled by his tutor the abbe dubois and he was a priest mr sidney considering the reputation of the prince and the kind of life he was generally supposed to be leading one can hardly believe that any man would have had the impudence and the bad taste to make such a speech we will constantly hear in the modern school for scandal remarks concerning the honour the virtue the cleverness the ability the beauty the accomplishments of our friends 
but it is behind their backs we no longer try to put the truth openly before them we stab them in the back but we no longer attack in front one ought not to stab at all but the back is a portion of the frame which feels nothing so far the change is a distinct gain society again fifty years ago was exclusive you belonged to society or you did not there was no overlapping there were no circles which intersected and if you were in society you went to almack's if you did not go to almack's you might be a very interesting praiseworthy well-bred creature but you could not claim to be in society nothing could be more simple therefore everybody ardently desired to be seen at almack's this however was not in everybody's power almack's for instance was far more exclusive than the court riff-raff might go to court but they could not get to almack's for at its gates there stood not one angel with a fiery sword but six in the shape of english ladies terrible in turbans splendid in diamonds magnificent in satin and awful in rank they were the ladies jersey londonbury cowper brownlow willoughby daresby and euston these ladies formed the dreaded committee they decided who should be admitted within the circle all applications had to be made direct to them no one was allowed to bring friends those who desired to go to the balls heavens what lady did not ardently desire were obliged to send in a personal request to be allowed the honour not only this but they were also obliged to send for the answer which took the form of a voucher that is a ticket or a simple refusal from which there was no appeal gentlemen were admitted in the same way and by the same mode of application as the ladies in their case it is pleasing to add some regard was paid to character as well as to birth and rank so that if a man openly and flagrantly insulted society he was supposed not to be admitted but one asked with some trembling how far such rigour would be extended towards a young and unmarried duke almack's was a sort of royal academy of society the academic diploma being represented by the admitted candidate's pedigree his family connections and his family shield the heart-burnings jealousies and maddening envies caused by this exclusive circle were i take it the cause of its decline and fall trade even of the grandest and most successful kind even in the persons of the grandchildren had no chance whatever no self-made man was admitted in fact it was not recognized that a man could make himself either he belonged to a good family or he did not genius was not considered at all admission to almax was like admission to the order of the garter because it pretended no nonsense about merit wives and daughters of simple country squires judges bishops generals admirals and so forth knew better than to apply the intrigues backstairs influence solicitation of friends were as endless at almack's as the intrigues at the admiralty to procure promotion admission could not however be bought so far the committee were beyond suspicion and beyond reproach it was whispered to be sure that there was favouritism awful word put yourself in the position if you have imagination enough of a young and beautiful debutante admission to almack's means for you that you can see your right and title clear to a coronet what will you not do what cringing supplication adulation hypocrisies to secure that card and oh the happiness the rapture of sending to willis's rooms and finding a card waiting for you and the misery and despair of receiving instead the terrible letter which told you without reason assigned that the ladies of the committee could not grant your request they were not expensive gatherings the tickets being only seven shillings sixpence each which did not include supper dancing began at eleven to the strains of wipert's and colonnay's band the balls were held in the great room at willis's and the space reserved for the dancers was roped round the two favourite dances were the valse and the gallop the sprightly gallopade as it was called quadrilles were also danced it may be interesting to those who have kept the old music to learn that in the year eighteen thirty six the favourite quadrilles were l'éclair and la tête de bronze and the favourite valse was la remède contre le sommeil they had also strauss's waltzes 
the decline and fall of almax was partly caused by the favouritism which not only kept the place exclusive but excluded more than was politic the only chance for the continued existence of such an institution is that it should be constantly enlarging its boundaries just as the only chance for the continued existence of such an aristocracy as ours is that it should be always admitting new members somehow the kind of small circle which shall include only the creme de la creme is always falling to pieces we hear of a club which is to contain only the very noblest but in a year or two it has ceased to exist or it is like all other clubs moreover a great social change has now passed over the country the stockbroker to speak an allegory has got into society respect for rank fifty years ago universal and profound is rapidly decaying there are still many left who believe in some kind of superiority by divine right and the sovereign's gift of rank even though that rank be but ten years old and the grandfather's shop is still remembered we do not pretend to believe any longer that rank by itself makes people cleverer more moral stronger more religious or more capable but some of us still believe that in some unknown way it makes them superior these thinkers are getting fewer and the decay of agriculture which promises to continue and increase assists the decay of respect for rank because such an aristocracy as that of these islands when it becomes poor becomes contemptible the position of women social and intellectual has wholly changed nothing was heard then of women's equality nothing of women's suffrage there were no women on boards there were none who lectured and spoke in public there were few who wrote seriously women regarded themselves and spoke of themselves as inferior to men in understanding as they were in bodily strength their case is not likely to be understated by one of themselves hear therefore what mrs john sandford nowadays she would have been mrs ethel sandford or mrs christian and maiden name sandford says upon her sisters it is in a book called woman in her social and domestic character there is something unfeminine in independence it is contrary to nature and therefore it offends a really sensible woman feels her dependence she does what she can but she is conscious of inferiority and therefore grateful for support the italics are mine in everything that women attempt they should show their consciousness of dependence they should remember that by them influence is to be obtained not by assumption but by a delicate appeal to affection or principle women in this respect are something like children the more they show their need of support the more engaging they are the appropriate expression of dependence is gentleness the whole work is executed in this spirit the keynote being the inferiority of woman heavens with what a storm would such a book be now received in the year eighteen thirty five herr raumer the german historian visited england and made a study of the english people which he afterwards published from this book one learns a great deal concerning the manners of the time for instance he went to a dinner party given by a certain noble lord at which the whole service was of silver a silver hot water dish being placed under every plate the dinner lasted until midnight and the german guest drank too much wine though he missed most of the healths it was then the custom at private dinner parties to go on drinking healths after dinner and to sit over the wine till midnight he goes to an at home at lady a s almost all the men he tells us were dressed in black coats black or coloured waistcoats and black or white cravats of what colour were the coloured waistcoats and of what colour the coats which were not black and how were the other men dressed perhaps one or two may have been bishops in evening dress now the evening dress of a bishop used to be blue i once saw a bishop dressed all in blue he was a very aged bishop and it was at a city company's dinner and i was told it had formerly been the evening dress of bishops or was now only worn by the most ancient among them herr rumor mentions the countless carriages in hyde park and observes that no one could afford to keep a carriage who had not three thousand pounds a year at least and at fashionable dances he observed that they danced nothing but waltzes 
the english ladies he finds beautiful and of the men he observes that the more they eat and drink the colder they become because they drank port no doubt under the influence of which though the heart glows more and more there comes a time when the brow clouds and the speech thickens and the tongue refuses to act the dinners were conducted on primitive principles except in great houses where the meat and game were carved by the butler everything was carved on the table the host sat behind the haunch of mutton and helped with zeal the guests took the ducks the turkey the hare and the fowls and did their part conscious of critical eyes a dinner was a terrible ordeal for a young man who perhaps found himself called upon to dissect a pair of ducks he took up the knife with burning cheeks and perspiring nose now at last an impostor one who knew not the ways of polite society would be discovered he began to feel for the joints while the cold eyes of his hostess gazed reproachfully upon him ladies in those days knew good carving and could carve for themselves perhaps he had with a ghastly grin to confess that he could not find those joints then the dish was removed and given to another guest a horribly self-reliant creature who laughed and talked while he dexterously sliced the breast and cut off the legs if in his agony the poor wretch would take refuge in the bottle he had to wait until some one invited him to take wine horrible tyranny the dinner-table was ornamented with a great epergne of silver or glass after dinner the cloth was removed showing the table deep in colour lustrous well waxed and the gentleman began real business with the bottle after the ladies had gone very little need be said about the court it was then in the hands of a few families it had no connection at all with the life of the country which went on as if there were no court at all it is strange that in these fifty years of change the court should have altered so little now as then the court neither attracts nor attempts to attract any of the leaders in art science or literature now as then the court is a thing apart from the life of the country for the best class of all those who are continually advancing the country in science or keeping alight the sacred lamp of letters who are scholars architects engineers artists poets authors journalists who are the merchant adventurers of modern times who are the preachers and teachers the court simply does not exist one states the fact without comment but it should be stated and it should be clearly understood the whole of those men who in this generation maintain the greatness of our country in the ways where alone greatness is desirable or memorable except in arms the only men of this generation whose memories will live and adorn the victorian era are strangers to the court it seems a great pity an ideal court should be the centre of everything art letters science all as for the rest of society how the people had drums and routs and balls how they angled for husbands how they were hollow and unnatural and so forth you may read about it in the pages of thackeray and i for one have never been able to understand how thackeray got his knowledge of these exclusive circles instead of dancing at almack's he was taking his chop and stout at the cock instead of gambling at crockford's he was writing copy for any paper which would take it when and where did he meet miss newcombe and lady q and lord steyne perhaps he wrote of them by intuition as disraeli wrote the young duke my son sir said the elder disraeli proudly has never i believe even seen a duke one touch more there is before me a beautiful solemn work one in which the writer feels his responsibilities almost too profoundly it is on no less important a subject than etiquette containing rules for the conduct of life on the most grave and serious occasions i permit myself one or two extracts familiarity is the greatest vice of society when an acquaintance says my dear fellow cut him immediately never enter your own house without bowing to every one you may meet there never ask a lady any questions about anything whatever if you have drunk wine with every one at the table and wish for more heavens more and after drinking with every one at the table wait till the cloth is removed never permit the sanctity of the drawing-room to be violated by a boot End of chapter 7chapter eight of fifty years ago by walter besant this librivox recording is in the public domain at the play and the show fifty years ago the theatre was far more than at present 
the favourite amusement of the londoners it was a passion with them they did not go only to laugh and be pleased as we go now they went as critics the pit preserves to this day a reputation long since lost for critical power a large number of the audience went to every new performance of a stock piece in order to criticise after the theatre they repaired to the albion or the cock for supper and to talk over the performance fifty years ago there were about eighteen theatres for a london of two millions these theatres were not open all the year round but it was reckoned that twenty thousand people went every night to the theatre there are now thirty theatres at least open nearly the whole year round i doubt if there are many more than twenty thousand at all of them together on an average in one night yet london has doubled and the visitors to london have been multiplied by ten it is by the visitors that the theatres are kept up the people of london have in great measure lost their taste for the theatres because they have gone to live in the suburbs who for instance that lives in hampstead and wishes to get up in good time in the morning can take his wife off into the theatre it takes an hour to drive into town the hour after dinner the play is over at a little after eleven if he takes a cab the driver is sulky at the thought of going up the hill and getting back again without another fare if he goes and returns in a broom it doubles the expense formerly when everybody lived in town they could walk again the price of seats has enormously gone up where there were two rows of stalls at the same price as the dress circle namely four shillings there are now a dozen at the price of half a guinea and it is very much more the fashion to take the best places so that the dress circle is no longer the same highly respectable part of the house while the upper boxes are now out of it altogether and as for the pit no man knoweth whether there be any pit still besides there are so many more distractions a more widely spread habit of reading more music more art more society a fuller life the theatre was formerly it is still to many the only school of conversation wit manners and sentiment the chief excitement which took them out of their daily lives the most delightful the most entrancing manner of spending the evening if the theatre were the same to the people of london as it used to be the average attendance counting the visitors would be not twenty thousand but one hundred and twenty thousand the reason why some of the houses were open for six months only was that the lord chancellor granted a license for that period only except to the patent houses the haymarket was a summer house from april to october the adelphi a winter house from october to april the most fashionable of the houses was her majesty's where only italian opera was performed everybody in society was obliged to have a box for the season for which sums were paid varying with the place in the house and the rank and wealth of the tenant thus the old duke of gloucester used to pay three hundred guineas for the season on levee days and drawing-rooms the fashionable world went to the opera in their court dresses feathers and diamonds and all a very moving spectacle those who only took a box in order to keep up appearances and because it was necessary for one in society to have a box used to sell seats commonly called bones because a round numbered bone was the ticket of admission to their friends sometimes they let their box for a single night a month or the whole season by means of the agents so that except for the honour of it as the man said when the bottom of his sedan chair fell out one might as well have had none at all the prices of admission to the theatres were very much less than obtained at the present day at drury lane the boxes and stalls of which there were two or three rows only were seven shillings each the pit was three shillings sixpence the upper boxes two shillings and the gallery one shilling 
at covent garden where they were great at spectacle with performing animals the great bun being lessee the prices were lower the boxes being four shillings the pit two shillings the upper boxes one shilling sixpence and gallery one shilling at the haymarket the boxes were five shillings the pit three shillings and the gallery one shilling sixpence the actors and actresses were many and good at the haymarket they had farron webster buckstone mrs glover and mrs humby at the olympic elliston liston and madame vestris helen fawcett made her first appearance in eighteen thirty five miss fanny kemble hers in eighteen thirty charles matthews harley macready and charles keene were all playing i hardly think that in fifty years time so good a list will be made of actors of the present day whose memory has lasted so long as those of eighteen thirty seven the salaries of actors and singers varied greatly of course malibran received one hundred and twenty five pounds a night charles keene fifty pounds a night macready thirty pounds a week farron twenty pounds a week and so on down to the humbler chorister they then called her a figurante worth her twelve shillings or eighteen shillings a week as for the national drama i suppose it never before been in so wretched a state talford's play of ion was produced about this time but one good play supposing ion to be a good play is hardly enough to redeem the character of the age there were also tragedies by miss mitford and miss bailey strange that no woman has ever written even a tolerable play but these failed to keep the stage one mr maturin now dying out of recollection also wrote tragedies the comedies and farces were written by planchet reynolds peake theodore hook dibden lamon reed poole madison morton and moncrief a really popular writer we learn with envy and astonishment would make as much as thirty pounds or even forty pounds by a good piece think of making thirty pounds or forty pounds by a good piece at the theatre was not that noble encouragement for the playwrights thirty pounds for one piece it takes one's breath away would not mr gilbert mr wills and mr george sims be proud and happy men if they could get thirty pounds a whole lump of thirty pounds for a single piece we can imagine the tears of joy running down their cheeks the decline of the drama was attributed by raumer to the entire absence of any protection for the dramatist this is no doubt partly true but the dramatist was protected to a certain extent by the difficulty of getting copies of his work shorthand writers used to try they still try to take down unseen the dialogue generally however they are detected in the act and desired to withdraw as a rule if the dramatist did not print the place he was safe except from treachery on the part of the prompter the low prices paid for dramatic work were the chief causes of the decline say rather the dreadful decay dry rot and galloping consumption of the drama fifty years ago who for instance would ever expect good fiction to be produced if it was rewarded at the rate of no more than thirty pounds or even three hundred pounds a novel great prizes are incentives for good work good craftsmen will no longer work if the pay is bad or if they work at all they will not throw their hearts into the work the great success of walter scott was the cause why dickens thackeray george eliot charles reed and the many second-rate novelists chose fiction rather than the drama for their energies one or two of them dickens and reed for instance were always hankering after the stage had dramatists received the same treatment in england as in france many of these writers would have seriously turned their attention to the theatre and our modern dramatic literature would have been as rich as our work in fiction the stage now offers a great fortune a far greater fortune one much more swiftly than can be got by fiction to those who succeed as for the pieces actually produced about this period they were chiefly adaptations from novels thus we find esmeralda and quasimodo two plays from victor hugo's hunchback of notre dame lucillo from the pilgrims of the rhine by lytton bulwer indeed was continually being dramatized paul clifford and rienzi among others making their appearance on the stage for other plays there were zampa or the corsair due to byron the waterman the irish tutor my paul and my partner joe with t p cook at the surrey theatre the comedy of the time is very well illustrated by lytton's money stagey and unreal the scenery dresses and general mise-en-scene would now be considered contemptible apart from the italian opera music was very well supported 
there were concerts in great numbers the philharmonic the vocal society and the royal academy of music gave their concerts at the king's ancient concert rooms hanover square willis's rooms were also used for music and the cecilia society gave its concerts in moorgate street there were many other shows apart from the well-known sights of town madame tussaud's gallery in baker street the hippodrome at bayswater the coliseum the diorama in regent's park the panorama in leicester square where you could see peru and the andes or the village engulfed by the avalanche and the panorama in regent street attracted the less frivolous and those who came to town for the improvement of their minds for londoners themselves there were the vauxhall gardens first and foremost the most delightful places of amusement that london ever possessed except perhaps belsize everybody went to vauxhall those who were respectable and those who were not far more beautiful than the electric lights in the gardens of the colonies were the two hundred thousand variegated oil lamps festooned among the trees of vauxhall there was to be found music singing acting and dancing hither came the gallant and golden youth from the west end here were seen sober and honest merchants with their wives and daughters here were ladies of doubtful reputation and ladies about whose reputation there could be no doubt here there were painted arbours where they brought you the famous vauxhall ham sliced cobwebs and the famous vauxhall beef book muslin pickled and boiled and the famous vauxhall punch heavens how the honest folk did drink that punch i have before me an account of an evening spent at vauxhall about this time by an eminent drysalter of the city his partner a certain tom and two ladies the drysalter's wife and his daughter lydia a laughter-loving lass of eighteen who dearly loved a bit of gig do you know gentle reader what is a bit of gig this young lady laughs at everything and cries what a bit of gig there was singing of course and after the singing there were fireworks and after the fireworks an ascent on the rope the ascent on the rope which lydia had never before witnessed was to her particularly interesting for the first time during the evening she looked serious and as the mingled rays of the moon then shining gloriously in the dark blue heavens attended by her twinkling handmaidens the stars which ever and anon shot down as the rockets mounted upwards mocking the mimic pyrotechnia of man and the flashes of red fire played upon her beautiful white brow and ripe lips blushing like a cleft cherry we thought for a moment that tom was a happy blade while we were gazing on her fine face her eyes suddenly assumed its wonted levity and she exclaimed in a laughing tone now if the twopenny postman of the rockets were to mistake one of the directions and deliver it among the crowd so as to set fire to six or seven muslin dresses what a bit of gig it would be another delightful place was the surrey zoological gardens which occupied fifteen acres and had a large lake in the middle very useful for fireworks and the showing off of the mount vesuvius they stuck up on one side of it the carnivorous animals were kept in a single building under a great glazed cupola but the elephants bears monkeys etc had separate buildings of their own flower shows balloon ascents fireworks and all kinds of exciting things went on at the surrey zoo the art galleries opened every year and besides the national gallery there were the society of british artists the exhibition of water colours and the british institution in pall mall at the royal academy of eighteen thirty seven turner exhibited his juliet eddie a psyche and venus landseer a scene in chillingham park wilkie the peep uh, day boys cabin and roberts the chapel of ferdinand and isabella at granada there were billiard rooms where a young man from the country who prided himself upon his play could get very prettily handled there were cigar divans but as yet only one or two for the smoking of cigars was a comparatively new thing in fact one who wrote in the year eighteen twenty nine thought it necessary to lay down twelve solemn rules for the right smoking of a cigar there were also gambling halls of which more anon fifty years ago in short we amused ourselves very well we were fond of shows and there were plenty of them we liked an al fresco entertainment and we could have it we were not quite so picksome in the matter of company as we are now and therefore we endured the loud vulgarities of the tradesman and his family and shut our eyes when certain fashionably dressed ladies passed by showing their happiness by the loudness of their laughter we even sat with our daughter in the very next box to that in which young lord tom noddy was entertaining these young ladies with cold chicken and pink champagne it is we know the privilege of rank to disregard morals in public as well as in private then we had supper and a bowl of punch and so home to bed those who are acquainted with the doings of corinthian tom and bob logic are acquainted with the night side of london as it was a few years before eighteen thirty seven suffice it to say that it was far darker far more vicious far more dangerous fifty years ago than it is now 
heaven knows that we have a night side still and a very ugly side it is but it is earlier by many hours than it used to be and it is comparatively free from gambling houses from bullies blackmailers and sharks end of chapter eight chapter nine of fifty years ago by walter besant this librivox recording is in the public domain in the house on november twenty eighteen thirty seven the young queen opened her first parliament in person the day was brilliant with sunshine the crowds from buckingham palace to the house were immense the house of lords was crammed with peers and the gallery with peeresses who occupied every seat and even rushed the reporters gallery three reporters only having been fortunate enough to take their places before the rush when her majesty arrived and had taken her place there was the rush from the lower house her majesty having taken the oath against popery which she did in a slow serious and audible manner proceeded to read the royal speech and a specimen of more tasteful and effective elocution it has never been my fortune to hear her voice is clear and her enunciation distinct in no ordinary degree her utterance is timed with admirable judgment to the ear it is the happy medium between too slow and too rapid nothing could be more accurate than her pronunciation while the musical intonations of her voice imparted a peculiar charm to the other attributes of her elocution the most perfect stillness reigned through the place while her majesty was reading her speech not a breath was to be heard had a person unblessed with the power of vision been suddenly taken within hearing of her majesty while she was reading her speech he might have remained some time under the impression that there was no one present but herself her self-possession was the theme of universal admiration in person her majesty is considerably below the average height her figure is good rather inclined as far as one could judge from seeing her in her robes of state to the slender form every one who has seen her must have been struck with her singularly fine bust her complexion is clear and has all the indications of excellent health about it her features are small and partake a good deal of the grecian cast her face without being strikingly handsome is remarkably pleasant and is indicative of a mild and amiable disposition in the house of lords the most prominent figures were i suppose those of lord brougham and the duke of wellington the debates in the upper house enlivened by the former and by lords melbourne lyndhurst and others were lively and animated compared with the languor of the modern house the duke of rutland the marquis of bute the marquis of camden who paid back into the treasury every year the salary he received as teller of the exchequer the earls of stanhope devon falmouth lord strangford rolls avonley and reedsdale were the leaders of the conservatives the marquis of sligo the marquis of northampton the earls of rosebery gosford minto shrewsbury and lichfield lords lyndock and portman were the leaders of the liberals with the exceptions of wellington broome melbourne and reedsdale it is melancholy to consider that these illustrious names are nothing more than names and convey no associations to the present generation among the members of the lower house where many more who have left behind them memories which are not likely to be soon forgotten sir robert peel lord stanley thomas macaulay cobbett lord john russell sir john cam hobhouse lord palmerston sir francis burdett hume roebuck o'connell linton bulwer benjamin disraeli and last sole survivor william ewart gladstone were all in the parliaments immediately before or immediately after the queen's accession if you would like to know how these men impressed their contemporaries read the following extracts from grant's random recollections mr thomas macaulay the late member for leeds and now a member of council in india could boast of a brilliant if not a very long parliamentary career he was one of those men who at once raised himself to the first rank in the senate his maiden speech electrified the house and called forth the highest compliments to the speaker from men of all parties he was careful to preserve the laurels he had thus so easily and suddenly won he was a man of shrewd mind and knew that if he spoke often the probability was he would not speak so well and that consequently there could be no more likely means of lowering him from the elevated station to which he had raised himself than frequently addressing the house his speeches were always most carefully studied and committed to memory exactly as he delivered them beforehand he bestowed a world of labour on their preparation 
and certainly never was labor bestowed to more purpose in every sentence you saw the man of genius the profound scholar the deep thinker the close and powerful reasoner you scarcely knew which most to admire the beauty of his ideas or of the language in which they were clothed lord john russell is one of the worst speakers in the house and but for his excellent private character his family connections and his consequent influence in the political world would not be tolerated there are many far better speakers who notwithstanding their innumerable efforts to catch the speaker's eye in the course of important debates hardly ever succeed or if they do are generally put down by the clamour of honourable members his voice is weak and his enunciation very imperfect he speaks in general in so low a tone as to be inaudible to more than one half of the house his style is often in bad taste and he stammers and stutters at every fourth or fifth sentence when he is audible he is always clear there is no mistaking his meaning generally his speeches are feeble in matter as well as manner but on some great occasions i have known him make very able speeches more distinguished however for the clear and forcible way in which he put the arguments which would most naturally suggest themselves to a reflecting mind than for any striking or comprehensive views of the subject of lord palmerston foreign secretary and member for tiverton i have but little to say the situation he fills in the cabinet gives him a certain degree of prominence in the eyes of the country which he certainly does not possess in parliament his talents are by no means of a high order he is very irregular in his attendance on his parliamentary duties and when in the house is by no means active in defence either of his principles or his friends scarcely anything calls him up except a regular attack on himself or on the way in which the department of the public service with which he is entrusted is administered in person lord palmerston is tall and handsome his face is round and is of a darkish hue his hair is black and always exhibits proofs of the skill and attention of the periquie. his clothes are in the extreme of fashion he is very vain of his personal appearance and is generally supposed to devote more of his time in sacrificing to the graces than is consistent with the duties of a person who has so much to do with the destinies of europe hence it is that the times newspaper has fastened on him the sobriquet of cupid mr o'connell is a man of the highest order of genius there is not a member in the house who in this respect can for a moment be put in comparison with him you see the greatness of his genius in almost every sentence he utters there are others sir robert peel for example who have much more tact and greater dexterity in debate but in point of genius none approach to him he had ever and anon burst forth with a brilliancy and effect which are quite overwhelming you have not well recovered from the overpowering surprise and admiration caused by one of his brilliant diffusions when another flashes upon you and produces the same effect you have no time nor are you in condition to weigh the force of his arguments you are taken captive wherever the speaker chooses to lead you from beginning to end one of the most extraordinary attributes of mr o'connell's oratory is the ease and facility with which he can make a transition from one topic to another from grave to gay from lively to severe never costs him an effort he seems indeed to be himself insensible of the transition i have seen him begin his speech by alluding to topics of an affecting nature in such a manner as to excite the deepest sympathy towards the sufferers in the mind of the most unfeeling person present i have seen in other words i speak with regard to particular instances the tear literally glistening in the eyes of men altogether unused to the melting mood and in a moment afterwards by a transition from the grave to the humorous i have seen the whole audience convulsed with laughter on the other hand i have often heard him commence his speech in a strain of most exquisite humour and by a sudden transition to deep pathos produce the stillness of death in a place in which but one moment before the air was rent with shouts of laughter his mastery over the passions is the most perfect i ever witnessed and his oratory tells with the same effect whether the he addresses the first assembly of gentlemen in the world or the ragged and ignorant rabble of dublin the most distinguished literary man in the house is mr e l bulwer member for lincoln an author of pelham eugene aram and etc he does not speak often when he does his speeches are not only previously turned over with great care in his mind but are written out at full length and committed carefully to memory he is a great patron of the tailor and he is always dressed in the extreme of fashion his manner of speaking is very effective the management of his voice is especially so but for this he would be a pleasant speaker his voice though weak is agreeable and he speaks with considerable fluency his speeches are usually argumentative you see at once that he is a person of great intellectual acquirements 
mr disraeli the member for maidstone perhaps the best known among the new members who have made their debut as stated in my sketches in london his own private friends looked forward to his introduction into the house of commons as a circumstance which would be immediately followed by his obtaining for himself an oratorical reputation equal to that enjoyed by the most popular speakers in that assembly they thought he would produce an extraordinary sensation both in the house and in the country by the power and splendour of his eloquence but the result differed from the anticipation when he rose which he did immediately after mr o'connell had concluded his speech all eyes were fixed on him and all ears were open to listen to his eloquence but before he had proceeded far he furnished a striking illustration of the hazard that attends on highly wrought expectations after the first few minutes he met with every possible manifestation of opposition and ridicule from the ministerial benches and was on the other hand cheered in the loudest and most earnest manner by his tory friends and it is particularly deserving of mention that even sir robert peel who very rarely cheers any honourable gentleman not even the most able and accomplished speakers of his own party greeted mr disraeli's speech with a prodigality of applause which must have been severely trying to the worthy baronet's lungs at one time in consequence of the extraordinary interruptions he met with mr disraeli intimated his willingness to resume his seat if the house wished him to do so he proceeded however for a short time longer but was still assailed by groans and under growls in all their varieties the uproar indeed often became so great as completely to drown his voice at last losing all temper until now he had preserved in a wonderful manner he paused in the midst of a sentence and looking the liberals indignantly in the face raised his hands and opening his mouth as wide as his dimensions would permit said in remarkably loud and almost terrific tones though i sit down now the time will come when you will hear me mr disraeli then sat down amidst the loudest uproar the exhibition altogether was a most extraordinary one mr disraeli's appearance and manner were very singular his dress also was peculiar it had much of a theatrical aspect his black hair was long and flowing and he had a most ample crop of it his gesture was abundant he often appeared as if trying with, with what celerity he could move his body from one side to another and throw his hands out and draw them in again at other times he flourished one hand before his face and then the other his voice too is of a very unusual kind it is powerful and at every justice done to it in the way of exercise but there is something peculiar in it which i am at a loss to characterize his utterance was rapid and he never seemed at a loss for words on the whole and notwithstanding the result of his first attempt i am convinced he is a man who possesses many of the requisites of a good debater that he is a man of great literary talent few will dispute lastly here is a contemporary judgment on gladstone that the italics are my own mr gladstone the member for newark is one of the most rising young men on the tory side of the house his party expect great things from him and certainly when it is remembered that his age is only twenty-five the success of the parliamentary efforts he has already made justifies their expectations he is well informed on most of the subjects which usually occupy the attention of the legislature and he is happy in turning his information to a good account he is ready on all occasions which he deems fitting ones with a speech in favour of the policy advocated by the party with whom he acts his extemporaneous resources are ample few men in the house can imp improvisate better it does not appear to cost him an effort to speak he is a man of very considerable talent but has nothing approaching to genius his abilities are much more the result of an excellent education and of mature study than of any prodigality on the part of nature in the distribution of mental gifts i have no idea that he will ever acquire the reputation of a great statesman his views are not sufficiently profound or enlarged for that his celebrity in the house of commons will chiefly depend on his readiness and dexterity as a debater in conjunction with the excellence of his elocution and the gracefulness of his manner when speaking his style is polished but has no appearance of the effect of previous preparation he displays considerable acuteness in replying to an opponent he is quick in his perception of anything vulnerable in the speech to which he replies and happy in laying the weak point bare to the gaze of the house he now and then indulges in sarcasm which is in most cases very felicitous he is plausible even when most in error when it suits himself or his party he can apply himself with the strictest closeness of to the real point at issue when to evade that point is deemed most politic no man can wander from it more widely the ablest speech he ever made in the house and by far the ablest on the same side of the question was when opposing on the thirtieth of march last sir george strickland's motion for the abolition of the negro apprenticeship system on the first of august next 
mr gladstone should here observe is himself an extensive west india planter mr gladstone's appearance and manners are much in his favour he is a fine-looking man he is about the usual height and of good figure his countenance is mild and pleasant and has a highly intellectual expression his eyes are clear and quick his eyebrows are dark and rather prominent there is not a dandy in the house but envies what truefit would call his fine head of jet-black hair it is always carefully parted from the crown downwards to his brow where it is tastefully shaded his features are small and regular and his complexion must be a very unworthy witness if he does not possess an abundant stock of health so the ghost of the first victorian parliament vanishes all are gone except mr gladstone himself whether the contemporary judgment has proved well founded or not is for the reader to determine for my own part i confess that my opinion of the author of random recollections was greatly advanced when i had read this judgment on the members we who do not sit in the galleries and are not members lose the enormous advantage of actually seeing the speakers and hearing the debates the reported speech is not the real speech the written letter remains but the fire of the orator flames and burns and passes away those know not gladstone who have never seen him and heard him speak and as for that old man eloquent when he closes his eyes in the house where he has fought so long the voices around him may well fall unheeded on his ear while a vision of the past shows him once more peel and stanley lord john and palmerston o'connell and roebuck and adversary worthiest of all the man whom the house at his first attempt hooted down and refused to hear the great and illustrious dizzy End of chapter nine chapter ten of fifty years ago by walter besant this librivox recording is in the public domain at school and university the great schools had no new rivals all the modern public schools cheltenham clifton marlborough and the like have sprung into existence or into importance since the year eighteen thirty seven those who did not go to public schools had their choice between small grammar schools and private schools there were a vast number of private schools it was indeed recognized that when a man could do nothing else and had failed in everything that he had tried a private school was still possible for him the sons of the lower middle class had as a rule no choice but to go to a private school at the grammar school they taught greek and latin these boys wanted no greek and no latin they wanted a good commercial education they wanted to learn bookkeeping and arithmetic and to write a good hand nothing else was of much account again all the grammar schools belonged to the church of england sons of nonconformists were therefore excluded and had to go to the private school the man who kept a private school was recommended for his cheapness as much as for his success in teaching as for the latter indeed there were no local examinations held by the universities and no means of showing whether he taught well or ill probably in the five or six years spent at his school boys learned what their parents mostly desired for them and left school to become clerks or shopmen the school fees were sometimes as low as a guinea a quarter the classes were taught by wretchedly paid ushers there was no attention paid to ventilation or hygienic arrangements the cane was freely used all day long everybody knows the kind of school you can read about it in the earlier pages of david copperfield and in a thousand books besides in the public schools where the birch flourished rank and tall and in tropical luxuriance latin and greek were the only subjects to which any serious attention was given no science was taught of modern languages french was pretended history and geography were neglected mathematics were a mere farce as regards the tone of the schools perhaps we had better not inquire yet that the general life of the boys was healthy is apparent from the affection with which elderly men speak of their old schools there were great headmasters before arnold and there were public schools where manliness truth and purity were cultivated besides rugby one thing is very certain that the schools turned out splendid scholars and their powers of writing latin and greek verse were wonderful a year ago we were startled by learning that a girl had taken a first class in the classical tripos at cambridge this to some who remembered the first class of old seemed a truly wonderful thing some even wanted to see her iambics alas a first class can now be got without greek iambics 
what would they have said at westminster fifty years ago if they had learned that a first class could be got at cambridge without greek or latin verse what is philology which can be crammed compared with a faultless copy of elegiacs which no amount of cramming even of the female brain can succeed in producing the universities were still wholly in the hands of the church no layman with one or two exceptions could be head of a college all the fellowships or very nearly all were clerical the country living was the natural end of the fellowship no dissenters jews or catholics were admitted to into any college unless they went through the form of conforming to the rules as regards chapel no one could be matriculated without signing the thirty-nine articles nearly twenty years later i had as a lad of seventeen to sign that unrelenting definition of faith on entering king's college london perhaps they do it still at that seat of orthodoxy tutors and lecturers were nearly all in orders most of the men intended to take orders many of them in order to take family livings the number of undergraduates was about a third of that now standing on the college books and the number of reading men those who intended to make their university career a stepping-stone or a ladder was far less in proportion to the number of pole men than at the present day the ordinary degree was obtained with even less difficulty than at present there were practically only two triposes at cambridge the mathematical and the classical instead of that round dozen or so which now offer their honours to the student no one could get a fellowship except through those two triposes as for the fellowships and scholarships indeed half of them were closed that is to say confined to students from certain towns or certain counties or certain schools while at one college kings both fellowships and scholarships were confined to collegers of eton and the students proceeded straight to fellowships without passing through the ordeal of the senate house dinner was at four a most ungodly hour between lunch and the proper hour for dinner for the men who read it answered pretty well because it gave them a long evening for work for the men who did not read it gave a long evening for play there was a great deal of solid drinking among the men both fellows and undergraduates the former sat in combination room after hall and drank the good old college port the latter sat in each other's rooms and drank the fiery port which they bought in the town in the evening there were frequent suppers with milk punch and songs i wonder if they have the milk punch still the supper i think they cannot have because they all dine at seven or half past seven after which it is impossible to take supper in those days young noblemen went up more than they do at present and they spread themselves over many colleges thus at cambridge they were found at trinity john's and maudlin a certain cabinet thirty years ago had half its members on the books of st john's in these days all the noblemen who go to cambridge flock like sheep to trinity there seems also to have been gathered at the university a larger proportion of county people than in these later years when the universities have not only been thrown open to men of all creeds but when men of every class find in their rich endowments and prizes a legitimate and laudable way of rising in the world the recognised way of making a gentleman now says charles kingsley in alton lock is to send him to the university i do not know how charles kingsley was made a gentleman but it is certainly a very common method of advancing your son if he is clever formerly it meant ambition in the direction of the church now it means many other things the bar journalism education science archaeology a hundred ways in which a gentleman may be made by first becoming a scholar nay there are dozens of men in the city who have begun by taking their three years on the banks of the cam or the isis for what purposes do the universities exist but for the encouragement of learning and if the country agree to call a scholar a gentleman as it calls a solicitor a gentleman by right of his profession so much the better for the country but kingsley was born somewhere about the year eighteen twenty which was still very much in the eighteenth century when there were no gentlemen recognized except those who were gentlemen by birth with clothes fellowships tied to the church of england with little or no science art archaeology philology oriental learning or any of the modern branches of learning with a strong taste for port and undergraduates drawn for the most part from the upper classes the universities were different indeed from those of the present day as for the education of women it was like unto the serpents of ireland wherefore we need not devote a chapter to this subject at all End of chapter ten chapter eleven of fifty years ago 
by walter besant this librivox recording is in the public domain the tavern the substitution of the restaurant for the tavern is of recent origin in the year eighteen thirty seven there were restaurants it is true but they were humble places and confined to the parts of london frequented by the french for english of every degree there was the tavern plenty of the old taverns still survive to show us in what places our fathers took their dinners and drank their punch the cheshire cheese is a survival the cock until recently was another some of them like the latter had the tables and benches partitioned off others like the former were partly open and partly divided the floor was sanded there was a great fire kept up all through the winter with a kettle always full of boiling water the cloth was not always of the cleanest the forks were steel in the evening there was always a company of those who supped for they dined early on chops steaks sausages oysters and welsh rabbit of those who drank those who smoked their long pipes and those who sang yes those who sang in those days the song went round if three or four templars supped at the coal hole or the cock or the rainbow one of them would presently lift his voice in song and then be followed by a rival warbler from another box at the coal hole indeed where met the once famous wolf club edmund keen president the landlord one rhodes by name was not only a singer but a writer of songs chiefly i apprehend of the comic kind i suppose that the comic song given by a private gentleman in character that is with a pocket-handkerchief for a white apron or his coat off or a battered hat on his head is almost unknown to the younger generation they see the kind of thing but done much better at the music halls really nothing marks the change of manners more than the fact that fifty years ago men used to meet together every evening and sing songs over their pipes and grog not young men only but middle-aged men and old men would all together join in the chorus and that joyfully banging the tables with their fists and laughing from ear to ear the roisterers are always represented as laughing with an absence of restraint impossible for us quite to understand the choruses too were of the good old whack fal de ral de rido character which gives scope to so much play of sentiment and lightness of touch beer of course was the principal beverage and there were many more varieties of beer than at present prevail one reads of brook clear kennet it used to be sold in a house near the oxford street end of tottenham court road of shropshire ale described as dark and heavy of the luscious burton innocent of hops of new ale old ale bitter ale hard ale soft ale the balmy scotch mellow october and good brown stout all these were to be obtained at taverns which made a speciality as they would say now of any one kind thus the best stout in london was to be had at the brace tavern in the queen's bench prison and the cock was also famous for the same beverage served in pint glasses a rival of the cock in this respect was the rainbow long before the present handsome room was built the landlord of the rainbow was one william calls formerly head-waiter at the cock predecessor i take it of tennyson's immortal friend but he left the cock to better himself and as the same time mary the incomparable the matchless mary most beautiful of barmaids left it as well gloom fell upon the frequenters of the tavern mary left the cock about the year eighteen twenty too early for the future poet laureate to have been one of the worshippers of her grecian face under calls's management the rainbow rivalled the cock in popularity the cider cellar kept by evans of covet garden and had gone through a period of decline but was again popular and well frequented mention may also be made of clitters of offley's famous for its lamb in spring of the keen's head whose landlord was a great comic singer of the harp haunt of aspiring actors of the albion the finish or the royal saloon piccadilly where one looked in for a few goes of max what was max in the very worst company that london could supply it is the fashion to lament the quantity of money still consumed in drink but our drink-bill is nothing in proportion compared with that of fifty years ago 
thus the number of visitors to fourteen great gin shops in london was found to average three thousand each per diem in edinburgh there was a gin shop for every fifteen families in one irish town of eight hundred people there were eighty-eight gin shops in sheffield thirteen persons were killed in ten days by drunkenness in london there was one public-house to every fifty-six houses in glasgow one to every ten yet it was noted at the time that a great improvement could be observed in the drinking habits of the people in the year seventeen forty two for instance there were nineteen million gallons of spirits consumed by a population of six million that is to say more than three gallons a head every year or if we take only the adult men something like twelve gallons for every man in the year which may be calculated to mean one bottle in five days but a hundred years later the population had increased to sixteen million and the consumption of spirits had fallen to eight million two hundred and fifty thousand gallons which represents a little more than half a gallon or four pints a head in the year or taking the adult men only their average was two gallons and one sixteenth a head so that each man's pint bottle would have lasted him for three weeks in scotland however the general average was twenty-seven pints a head and taking adults alone thirteen gallons and a half a head and in ireland six and a half gallons a head it was noted also in the year eighteen thirty seven that the multiplication of coffee-houses of which there were sixteen hundred in london alone proved the growth of more healthy habits among the people but though there was certainly more moderation in drink than in the earlier years of the century the drink bill for the year eighteen thirty seven was prodigious a case of total abstinence was a phenomenon the thirst for beer was insatiable with many people especially farmers and the working classes generally beer was taken with breakfast even in my own time that is to say when the queen had been reigning for one and twenty years or so there were still many undergraduates at cambridge who drank beer habitually for breakfast and at every breakfast party the tankard was passed round as a finish in country houses the simple light home-brewed ale the preparation of which caused a most delightful anxiety as to the result was the sole beverage used at dinner and supper every farmhouse every large country house and many town housekeepers brewed their own beer just as they made their own wines their own jams and their own lavender water beer was universally taken with dinner even at great dinner parties some of the guests would call for beer and strong ale was always served with the cheese after dinner only port and sherry in middle-class houses were put upon the table sometimes madeira or lisbon appeared but as a rule wine meant port or sherry unless which sometimes happened it meant cowslip ginger or gooseberry except among the upper class claret was absolutely unknown as were burgundy rhone wines sauterne and all other french wines in the restaurants every man would call for a bitter ale or stout or half and half with his dinner as a matter of course and after dinner would either take his pint of port or half pint of sherry or his tumbler of grog champagne was regarded as the drink of the prodigal son in the family circle it never appeared at all except at weddings and perhaps on christmas day in fact when people spoke of wine in these days they generally meant port they bought port by the hogshead had it bottled and laid down they talked about their cellars solemnly they brought forth bottles which had been laid down in the days when george the third was king they were great on body bouquet and bee's wing they told stories about wonderful port which they had been privileged to drink they looked forward to a dinner chiefly on account of the port which followed it real enjoyment only began with when the cloth was removed the ladies were gone and the solemn passage of the decanter had commenced there lingers still the old love for this wine it is without doubt the king of wines i remember ten years ago or thereabouts dining with one then my partner now alas gathered to his father's at the blue post before that old inn was burned down the room was a comfortable old-fashioned first floor low of ceiling with a great fire in an old-fashioned grate set with four or five tables only because not many frequented this most desirable of dining places we took with dinner a bottle of light claret when we had gone through the claret and the beef the waiter who had been hovering about uneasily interposed don't drink any more of that wash he said let me bring you something fit for gentlemen to sit over he brought us of course a bottle of port they say that the taste for port is reviving but claret has got so firm a hold of our affections that i doubt it as for the drinking of spirits it was certainly much more common then than it is now among the lower classes gin was the favourite the drink of the women as much as of the men do you know why they call it blue ruin 
some time ago i saw going into a public-house somewhere near the west india docks a tall lean man apparently five-and-forty or thereabouts he was in rags his knees bent as he walked his hands trembled his eyes were eager and wonderful to relate the face was perfectly blue not indigo blue or azure blue but of a ghostly ghastly corpse-like kind of blue which made one shudder said my companion to me that is gin we opened the door of the public-house and looked in he stood at the bar with a full glass in his hand then his eyes brightened he gasped straightened himself and tossed it down his throat then he came out and he sighed as one who has just had a glimpse of some earthly paradise then he walked away with swift and resolute step as if purposed to achieve something mighty only a few yards farther along the road but across the way there stood another public-house the man walked straight to the door entered and took another glass again with the quick grasp of anticipation and again with that sigh as of a hurried peep through the gates barred with the sword of fire this man was a curious object of study he went into twelve more public-houses each time with greater determination on his lips and greater eagerness in his eyes the last class i suppose opened these gates for him and suffered him to enter for his lips suddenly lost their resolution his eyes lost their lustre he became limp his arms fell heavily he was drunk and his face was bluer than ever this was the kind of sight which hogarth could see every day when he painted gin lane it was in the time when drinking shops had placards stuck outside or to the effect that for a penny one might get drunk and blind drunk for tuppence but an example of a blue ruin actually walking in the flesh in these days one certainly does not expect to see next to gin rum was the most popular there is a full rich flavour about rum it is affectionately named after the delicious pineapple or after the island where its production is the most abundant and the most kindly it has always been the drink of her majesty's navy it is still the favourite beverage of many west india islands and many millions of sailors niggers and coolies it is hallowed by historical associations but its effects in the good old days were wonderful and awe-inspiring it was the author and creator of those flowers now almost extinct called grog blossoms you may see them depicted by the caricaturists of the rowlandson time but they survived until well past the middle of the century the outward and visible signs of rum were indeed various first there was the red and swollen nose next the nose beautifully painted with grog blossoms it is an ancient nose and it is celebrated by the bacchanalian poet of normandy olivier vasselin in the fifteenth century there was next the bottle nose in all its branches i am uncertain never having walked the hospitals whether one is justified in classifying certain varieties of the bottle nose under one head or whether each variety was a species by itself all these noses with the red and puffy cheeks the thick lips the double chins the swelling aldermanic corporation and the gouty feet in list and slippers meant rum great god rum these symptoms are no longer to be seen therefore great god rum is either deposed or he hath but few worshippers and those half-hearted the decay of the great god rum and the great goddess gin his consort is marked in many other ways formerly the toper hath filled a thick short rummer with spirit and poured upon it an equal quantity of water mr weller's theory of drink was that it should be equal the modern toper goes to a bar gets half a wine-glass of scotch whisky and pours upon it a pint of apollo naris water the ancient drank his grog hot with lemon and sugar and sometimes spice this made a serious business of the nightly grog the modern takes his cold even with ice and without any addition of lemon indeed he squashes his lemon separately and drinks the juice in apollinaris without any spirit at all a thing abhorrent to his ancestor again there are preparations of a crafty and cryptic character once greatly in favour and now clean forgotten or else fallen into a pitiable contempt and doomed to a stumbling halt and broken-winged existence take for instance the punch-bowl fifty years ago it was no mere ornament for the sideboard in the china cabinet it was a thing to be brought forth and filled with a fragrant mixture of rum brandy and curacao lemon hot water sugar grated nutmeg cloves and cinnamon the preparation of the bowl was as much a labour of love as that of a claret cup its degenerate successor the ladles were beautiful works of art in silver where are those ladles now and what purpose do they serve shrub again rum shrub is there any living man who now calls for shrub you may still see it on the shelf of an old-fashioned inn you may even see the announcement that it is for sale painted on door-posts but no man regardeth it i believe that it was supposed to possess valuable medicinal properties the nature of which i forget 
again there was pearl early pearl once there was a club in the neighbourhood of covent garden which existed for the purpose of arising betimes and drinking pearl before breakfast or there was dog's nose gentle reader you remember the rules for making dog's nose they were explained at a now famous meeting of the brick lane branch of the grand junction ebenezer temperance association yet i doubt whether dog's nose is still in favour again there was copus is the making of copus cup still remembered there was bishop it was a kind of punch made of port wine instead of rum and was formerly much consumed at the suppers of undergraduates it was remarkable for its power of making men's faces red and their voices thick it also made them feel as if their legs and arms and every part of them were filled out and distended as with twice the usual quantity of blood these were no doubt valuable qualities considering medicinally yet bishop is no longer in demand mulled ale is still perhaps cultivated they used to have pots made for the purpose of warming the ale these were long and shaped like an extinguisher so that the heat of the fire played upon a large surface and warmed the beer quickly when it was poured out spice was added and perhaps sugar and no doubt a dash of brandy negus a weak compound of sherry and warm water used to be exhibited at dancing parties but is now i should think unknown save by name i do not speak of current gin damson brandy or cherry brandy because one or two such preparations are still produced nor need we consider british wines now almost extinct yet in country towns one may here and there find shops where they provide for taste still simple the cowslip delicate and silky to the palate the ginger full of flavour and of body the red currant rich and sweet a lady's wine the gooseberry possessing all the finer qualities of the grape of epernay the raisin with fine tokay flavour or the raspberry full of bouquet and of bee's wing but their day is past the british wines are practically made no more all these drinks once so lovingly prepared and so tenderly cherished are now as much forgotten as the toast in the nut-brown ale or the october humming ale or the mead drunk from the gold-rimmed horn they still drink something out of a gold-rimmed horn in the hall of corpus christi cambridge or the lordly e procrus wherewith sir richard whittington entertained his sovereign what day he concluded the banquet by burning the king's bonds or the once popular mixture of gin and noyo or the cup of hot salute from the stall in covent garden or on the fleet bridge the tavern we can hardly understand how large a place it filled in the lives of our forefathers who did not live scattered about in suburban villas but over their shops and offices when business was over all of every class repaired to the tavern dr johnson spent the evenings of his last years wholly at the tavern the lawyer the draper the grocer the bookseller even the clergy all spent their evenings at the tavern going home in time for supper with their families you may see the kind of tavern life in any small country town to this day where the shopkeepers assemble every evening to smoke and talk together the tavern was far more than a modern club because the tendency of a club is to become daily more decorous while the tavern atmosphere of freedom and the equality of all comers prevented the growth of artificial and conventional restraints something of the tavern life is left still in london but not much the substantial tradesman is no longer resident there are no longer any clubs which meet at taverns and the old inns with their sanded floors and great fireplaces are nearly all gone the swan with two necks the bell sauvage the tabard the george and vulture the bolton tun they have either ceased their existence or their names call forth no more associations of good company and good songs the dog and duck the temple of flora apollo's gardens the bull in the pound the blue lion of gray's inn lane what memories linger round these names what man is now living who can tell us where they were End of chapter eleven chapter twelve of fifty years ago by walter besant this librivox recording is in the public domain in club and card land club land was a comparatively small country peopled by a most exclusive race there were twenty-five clubs in all and as many men had more than one club and the average membership was less than a thousand there were not more than twenty thousand men altogether who belonged to clubs there are now at least one hundred and twenty thousand with nearly a hundred clubs to which almost any man might belong besides these there are now about sixty second-class clubs together with a great many clubs which exist for special purposes 
betting and racing clubs whist clubs gambling clubs press clubs and so forth of the now extinct clubs may be mentioned the alfred and the clarence which were literary clubs the clarence was founded by campbell on the ashes of the extinct literary club which had been dissolved in consequence of internal dissensions the athenaeum had the character which it still preserves one of the few things in this club complained of by the members of eighteen thirty seven was the use of gas in the dining-room which produced an atmosphere wherein it was said no animals ungifted with copper lungs could long exist the garrick club was exclusively theatrical the oriental was of course famous for curry and madeira the union had a sprinkling of city men in it the united university was famous for its iced punch and the wyndham was the first club which allowed strangers to dine within its walls speaking generally no city men at all nor any who were connected in any way with trade were admitted into the clubs of london a barrister a physician or a clergyman might be elected and of course all men in the services but a merchant an attorney a surgeon an architect might knock in vain the club subscription was generally six guineas a year and if we may judge by the fact that you could dine off the joint at the carlton for a shilling the clubs were much cheaper than they are now they were also quite as dull thackeray describes the dullness of the club the pride of belonging to it the necessity of having at least one good club the habitues of the card-room the talk and the scandal but the new clubs of our day are larger their members come from a more extended area there are few young city men who have not their club and it is not at all necessary to know a man because he is a member of your club and when one contrasts the cold and silent coffee-room of the new great club where the men glare at each other with a bright and cheerful tavern where every man talked with his neighbour and the song went round and the great kettle bubbled on the hearth one feels that civilization has its losses we have our gambling club still from time to time there comes a rumour of high play a scandal or an action in the high court of justice for the recovery of one's character baccarat is played all night by the young men champagne is flowing for their refreshment and sometimes a few hundreds are lost by some young fellow who can ill afford it but these things are small and insignificant compared with the gambling club of fifty years ago he who speaks of gambling in the year thirty seven speaks of crockford's everything at crockford's was magnificent the subscription was ten guineas a year in return for which the members had the ordinary club and coffee-rooms providing food and wine at the usual club charges these were on the ground floor and the run of the gambling-rooms every night to which they could introduce guests and friends these rooms were on the first floor they consisted of a saloon in which there was served every night a splendid supper with wines of the best free to all visitors crockford paid his chef a thousand guineas a year and his assistant five hundred and his cellar was reputed to be worth seventy thousand pounds there were two card-rooms one in which whist ecarte and all other games were played and a second smaller room in which hazard alone was played every night at eleven the banker and proprietor himself took his seat at his desk in a corner his croupier sitting opposite to him in a high chair declared the game paid the winners and raked in the money crockford's spiders that is the gentleman who had the run of the establishment under certain implied conditions introduced their friends to the supper and the champagne first and to the hazard room next at two in the morning the doors were closed and nobody else was admitted but the play went on all night long crockford not only held the bank but was ready to advance money to those who lost and outside the card-room treated for reversionary interests post obits and other means for raising the wind 
the game was what is called french hazard in which the players play against the bank thousands were every night lost and won as much as a million of money has been known to change hands in a single night and the banker was ready to meet any stake offered those who lost borrowed more in order to continue the game and lost that as well but crockford seems never to have been accused of any dishonourable practices he trusted to the chances of the table which were of course in his favour in his ledgers where are they now he was accustomed to enter the names of those who borrowed of him by initials or a number he began life as a small fishmonger just within temple bar and fortunately for himself discovered that he was endowed with a rare talent for rapid mental arithmetic of which he made good use in betting and card-playing the history of his gradual rise to greatness from a beginning so unpromising would be interesting but perhaps the materials no longer exist he was a tall and corpulent man lame who never acquired the art of speaking english correctly a thing which his noble patrons the duke of wellington was a member of his club passed over in him everybody went to crockford's everybody played there that a young fellow just in possession of a great estate should drop a few thousands in a single night's play was not considered a thing worthy of remark they all did it we remember how disraeli's young duke went on playing cards all night and all next day was it not all the next night as well till he and his companions were up to their knees in cards and the man who was waiting on them was fain to lie down and sleep for half an hour the passion of gambling it is one of those other senses outside the five old elementary endowments possessed everybody cards played a far more important part in life than they do now the evening rubber was played in every quiet house the club card tables were always crowded for manly youth there were the fiercer joys of la Scanet, lou vingt et un and écarté for the domestic circle there were the whist table and the round table and at the latter were played a quantity of games such as pope joan commerce speculation and i know not what all for money and all depending for their interest on the hope of winning and the fear of losing family gambling is gone if in a genteel suburban villa one was to propose a round game and call for the pope joan board there would be a smile of wonder and pity as well ask for a glass of negus or call for the caledonians at a dance scandals there were of course men gambled away the whole of their great estates they loaded their property with burdens in a single night which would keep their children and their grandchildren poor they grew desperate and became hawks on the lookout for pigeons they cheated at the card-table read the famous case of lord de ross in this very year they were always being detected and expelled and so could no more show their faces at any place where gentlemen congregated and sank from crockford's to the cheaper hells such as the cribs where the tradesmen used to gamble those frequented by city clerks by gentlemen's servants and even those of the low french and italians they were illegal cribs and informers were always getting money by causing the proprietors to be indicted it was said of thurtell after he was hanged for murdering weir that he had offered to murder eight irishmen who had informed against these hells for the consideration of forty pounds a head when they were suffered to proceed however the proprietors always made their fortunes no doubt their descendants are now country gentry and the green cloth has long since been folded up and put away in the lumber-room with the rake and the croupier's green shade in his chair and the existence of these relics is forgotten End of chapter twelve chapter thirteen 
of fifty years ago by walter besant this librivox recording is in the public domain with the wits the ten years of the thirties are a period concerning whose literary history the ordinary reader knows next to nothing yet a good deal that has survived for fifty years and promises to live longer was accomplished in that period dickens for example began his career in the year eighteen thirty seven with his sketches by boz and the pickwick papers lord lytton then mr lytton bulwer had already before that year published five novels including paul clifford and the last days of pompeii tennyson had already issued the poems by two brothers and poems chiefly lyrical disraeli had written the young duke vivian gray and venetia browning had published Paracelsus and stratford marriott began in eighteen thirty four carlyle published the sarder in eighteen thirty two but one must not estimate a period by its beginners all these writers belong to the following thirty years of the century if we look for those who were flourishing that is those who were producing their best work it will be found that this decade was singularly poor the principal name is that of hood there were also hartley coleridge douglas gerald proctor sir archibald allison theodore hook g p r james charles knight sir henry taylor milman ebenezer elliot harriet martineau james montgomery tall ford henry broom lady blessington harrison ainsworth and some others of lesser note this is not a very imposing array on the other hand nearly all the great writers whom we associate with the first thirty years of the century were living though their best work was done after sixty i take it the hand of the master may still work with the old cunning but his designs will be no longer new or bold wordsworth was sixty in eighteen thirty and though he lived for twenty years longer and published the yarrow we visited and i think some of his sonnets he hardly added to his fame southey was four years younger he published his doctor and essays in this decade but his best work was done already scott died in eighteen thirty two coleridge died in eighteen thirty four byron was already dead james hogg died in eighteen thirty five felicia hemmins in the same year tom moore was a gay young fellow of fifty in eighteen thirty the year in which his life of lord byron appeared he did very little afterwards campbell was two years older than moore and he too had exhausted himself rogers older than any of them had entirely concluded his poetic career it is wonderful to think that he began to write in seventeen eighty three and died in eighteen fifty five beckford whose vathek appeared in seventeen eighty six was living until eighteen forty four among others who were still living in eighteen thirty seven were james and horace smith wilson croker miss edgeworth mrs trollope lucy aiken miss opie who lived to be eighty-five jane porter prematurely cut off at seventy-four and harriet lee whose immortal work the errors of innocence appeared in seventeen eighty six when she was already thirty lived on till eighteen fifty two when she was ninety-six bowles that excellent man was not yet seventy and meant to live for twenty years longer de quincey was fifty-two in eighteen thirty seven christopher north was in full vigour thomas love peacock who published his first novel in eighteen ten was destined to produce at last equally good in eighteen sixty landor born in seventeen seventy five was not to die until eighteen sixty four lee hunt who in eighteen thirty seven was fifty-three years of age belongs to the time of byron john keble whose christian year was published in eighteen twenty seven was forty four in eighteen thirty seven eliel died in eighteen thirty eight in america washington irving emerson channing bryant whittier and longfellow made a good group in france chateaubriand lamartine victor hugo Béranger, alfred de musee scribe and dumas were all writing a group much stronger than our english team it is difficult to understand at first that between the time of scott wordsworth byron and keats and that of dickens thackeray marriott lever tennyson browning and carlyle there existed this generation of wits most of them almost forgotten those however who consider the men and women of the thirties have to deal for the most part with a literature that is third-rate this kind becomes dreadfully flat and stare when it has been out for fifty years the dullest flattest dreariest reading that can be found on the shelves in the sprightly novel of society written in the thirties a blight had fallen upon novels and their writers the enormous success that scott had achieved tempted hundreds to follow in his path if that were possible it was not possible 
but this they could not know because nothing seems so easy to write as a novel and no man of those destined to fail can understand in what respects his own work falls short of scott's that is the chief reason why he fails scott's success however produced another effect it greatly enlarged the number of novel readers and caused them to buy up eagerly anything new in the hope of finding another scott thus about the year eighteen twenty six there were produced as many as two hundred and fifty three and four volume novels a year that is to say about as many as were published in eighteen eighty six when the area of readers has been multiplied by ten we are also told that nearly all these novels could command a sale of seven hundred and fifty to one thousand each while anything above the average would have a sale of one thousand five hundred to two thousand the usual price given for these novels was we are also told from two hundred pounds to three hundred pounds in that case the publishers must have had a happy and a prosperous time netting splendid hauls but i think that we must take these figures with considerable deductions there were as yet no circulating libraries of any importance their place was supplied by book clubs to which the publishers chiefly looked for the purchase of their books but one cannot believe that the book clubs would take copies of all that rubbish that came out some of these novels i have read some of them actually stand on my shelves and i declare that anything more dreary and unprofitable it is difficult to imagine at last there was a revolt the public would stand this kind of stuff no longer down dropped the circulation of the novels instead of two thousand copies subscribed the dismayed publisher now read fifty and the whole host of novelists vanished like a swarm of midges at the same time poetry went down too the drop in poetry was even more terrible than that of novels suddenly and without any warning the people of great britain left off reading poetry to be sure they had been flooded with a prodigious quantity of trash one anonymous popular poet whose name will never now be recovered received a hundred pounds for his last poem from a publisher who thought no doubt that the boom was going to last of this popular poet's work he sold exactly fifty copies another humorous bard who also received a large sum for his immortal poem showed in the unhappy publisher's books no more than eighteen copies sold this was too ridiculous and from that day to this the trade side of poetry has remained under a cloud that of novelist has fortunately for some been redeemed from contempt by the enormous success of dickens thackeray george eliot and by the solid though substantial success of the lesser lights poets have now to pay for the publication of their own works but novelists some of them command a price those namely who do not have to pay for the production of their works the popular taste thus cloyed with novels and poetry turned to books on popular science on statistics on health and on travel barry cornwall's life of keen campbell's life of siddons the lives of sale sir thomas picton and lord exmouth for example were all well received so ross's arctic seas la martine's pilgrimage macfarlane's travels in the east holman's round the world and quinn's voyage down the danube all commanded a sale of one thousand copies each at least works of religion of course always succeed if they are written with due regard to the religious leaning of the moment it shows how religious fashions change when we find that the copyright of the works of robert hall realized four thousand pounds and that of charles simeon's books five thousand pounds while of the rev Alexander fletcher's book of family devotions published at twenty-four shillings two thousand copies were sold in the day of publication i dare say the same thing would happen again to-day if another mr fletcher were to hit upon another happy thought in the way of a religious book i think that one of the causes of the decay of trade as regards poetry and fiction may have been the badness of the annuals you will find in any old-fashioned library copies of the keepsake the forget-me-not the book of beauty flowers of loveliness findon's tableau the book of gems and others of that now extinct tribe they were beautifully printed on the finest paper they were illustrated with the most lovely steel engravings the like of which could not now be had at any price they were bound in brown and crimson watered silk most fascinating to look upon and they were published at a guinea as for their contents they were to begin with written almost entirely by ladies and gentlemen with handles to their names each number containing in addition two or three papers by commoners mere literary commoners just to give a flavouring of style in the early thirties it was fashionable for lords and ladies to dash off these trifles byron was a gentleman shelley was a gentleman nobody else to be sure among the poets and wits was a gentleman yet if byron and shelley condescended to bid for fame and bays why not lord reculver lady julia de dagenham or the honourable laura clonsilla i have before me the keepsake for the year of eighteen thirty one among the authors are lord morpeth lord nugent lord porchester lord john russell the honourable george agar ellis the honourable henry liddell 
the hon charles phipps the hon robert craddock and the hon grantley barclay among the ladies are the countess of blessington eliel and agnes strickland theodore hook supplies the professional part the illustrations are engraved from pictures and drawings by eastlake corboul westall turner smirk flaxman and other great artists the result from the literary point of view is a collection much lower in point of interest and ability than the worst number of the worst shilling magazines of the present day i venture to extract certain immortal lines contributed by lord john russell who is not generally known as a poet they are written at keneal the residence of the late mr dugald stuart to distant worlds a guide amid the night to nearer orbs the source of life and light each star resplendent on its radiant throne gilds other systems and supports its own thus we see stuart in his fame reclined enlighten all the universe of mind to some for wonder some for joy appear admired when distant and beloved when near twas he gave rules to fancy grace to thought taught virtues laws and practised what he taught dear me something similar to the last line one remembers written by an earlier bard in the same way terence has been accused of imitating the old eton latin grammar somewhere about the year eighteen thirty seven the world began to kick at the keepsakes and they gradually got extinguished then the lords and the countesses put away their verses and dropped into prose and to the infinite loss of mankind wrote no more until editors of great monthlies anxious to show a list of illustrious names began to ask them again as for the general literature of the day there must have been a steady demand for new works of all kinds for it was estimated that in eighteen thirty six there were no fewer than four thousand persons living by literary work most of them of course must have been simple publishers hacks but seven hundred of them in london were journalists at the present day there are said to be in london about fourteen thousand men and women who live by writing and of this number i should think that thirteen thousand are in some way or other connected with journalism publishers hacks still exist that is to say the unhappy men who without genius or natural aptitude or the art of writing pleasantly are eternally engaged in compiling stealing arranging and putting together books which may be palmed off upon an uncritical public for prize books and presents but they are far fewer in proportion than they were and perhaps the next generation may live to see them extinct what did they write this regiment of three thousand three hundred litterateurs novelists as we have learned had fallen upon evil times poetry was what it still continues to be a drug in the market but there was the whole range of the sciences there were morals theology education travels biography history the literature of art in all its branches archaeology ancient and modern literature criticism and a hundred other things yet making allowance for everything i cannot but think that the three thousand three hundred must have had on the whole an idle and unprofitable time however some books of the year may be recorded first of all in the annual register for eighteen thirty seven there appears a poem by alfred tennyson i have copied a portion of it oh that we're possible after long grief and pain to find the arms of my true love round me once again when i was wont to meet her in the silent woody places of the land that gave me birth we stood tranced in long embrace mixed with kisses sweeter sweeter than anything on earth a shadow flits before me not thee but like to thee ah god that it were possible for one short hour to see the souls we love that they might tell us what and where they be it leads me forth at evening it lightly winds and steals in a cold white robe before me when all my spirit reels at the shouts the leagues of lights and the roaring of the wheels then the broad light glares and beats and the sunk eye flits and fleets and will not let me be i loathe the squares and streets and the faces that one meets hearts with no love for me always i love to creep to some still cavern deep and to weep and weep and weep my whole soul out to thee books indeed there were in plenty lady blessington produced her victims of society in sunday at the zoo mr lyttenborough were his de chaise de la valliere ernest maltravers and athens his rise and fall miss mitford her country stories coddle his recollections of coleridge harrison ainsworth crichton disraeli venetia talford the life and letters of charles lamb babbage of bridgewater treatise hook jack bragg haynes bailey his weeds of witchery a thing as much forgotten as the weeds in last year's garden james his attila and louis the fourteenth miss martineau her book on american society i find not in the book which i have not read but in a review of it two stories which i copy one is of an american traveller who had been to rome and said of it rome is a very fine city sir but its public buildings are out of repair the other is the following few men said the preacher in his sermon when they build a house remember that there must some day be a coffin taken downstairs ministers said a lady who had been present have got into the strangest way of choosing subjects true wide staircases are a great convenience but christian ministers might find better subjects for their discourses than narrow staircases 
in addition to the above hartley coleridge wrote the lives of northern worthies the complete poetical works of southey appeared he himself died at the beginning of eighteen forty two dion bukiko produced his first play being then fifteen years of age carlyle brought out his french revolution lockhart his life of scott martin tupper the first series of the proverbial philosophy hallam his literature of europe there were the usual travels in arabia armenia italy and ireland with no doubt the annual avalanche of sermons pamphlets and the rest above all however it must be remembered that to this time belonged the sketches by boz eighteen thirty six and the pickwick papers eighteen thirty seven thirty eight of the latter the athenaeum not unwisely remarked that they were made up of three pounds of smollett three ounces of stern a handful of hook a dash of a grammatical pierce egan the incidents at pleasure served with an original sauce piquant we earnestly hope and trust that nothing we have said will tend to refine boz one could hardly expect a critic to be ready at once to acknowledge that here was a genius original totally unlike any of his predecessors who knew the great art of drawing from life and depicting nothing but what he knew as for thackeray he was still in the chrysalis stage though his likeness appears with those of the contributors to fraser's magazine in the portrait group of fraserians published in eighteen thirty nine his first independently published book i think was the paris sketch-book which was not issued until the year eighteen forty here it will be acknowledged is not a record to be quite ashamed of with carlyle talford hallam and dickens to adorn and illustrate the year after all it is a great thing for any year to add one enduring book to english literature and it is a great deal to show so many works which are still read and remembered lytton's ernest maltravers though not his best novel is still read by some talford's charles lamb remains disraeli's venetia lockhart's life of scott is the best biography of the novelist and poet carlyle's french revolution shows no sign of being forgotten between the first and the fiftieth years of victoria's reign there arose and flourished and died a new generation of great men dickens thackeray lytton in his later and better style george eliot charles reed george meredith nathaniel hawthorne stand in the very front rank of novelists in the second line are charles kingsley mrs gaskell lever trollope and a few living men and women tennyson browning swinburne matthew arnold are the new poets carlyle freeman froude stubbs green lecky buckle have founded a new school of history maurice has broadened the old theology darwin huxley tyndall lockyer and many others have advanced the boundaries of science philology has become one of the exact sciences a great school of political economy has arisen flourished and decayed as to the changes that have come upon the literature of the country the new points of view the new creeds these belong to another chapter there has befallen literature of late years a grievous even an irreparable blow it has lost the salon there are no longer grandes dames de parlement who attract to their drawing-rooms the leaders and the lesser lights of literature there are no longer so far as i know any places at all even any clubs which are recognized centres of literature there are no longer any houses where one will be sure to find great talkers and to hear them talking all night long there are no longer any great talkers that is to say many men there are who talk well but there are no sydney smiths or macaulays and in houses where the sydney smith of the day would go for his talk he would not be encouraged to talk much after midnight in the same way there are clubs like the athenaeum and the saville where men of letters are among the members but they do not constitute the members and they do not give altogether its tone to the club fifty years ago there were two houses which each in its own way were recognized centres of literature every man of letters went to gore house which was open to all and every man of letters who could get there went to holland house the former establishment was presided over by the countess of blessington at this time a widow still young and still attractive though beginning to be burdened with the care of an establishment too expensive for her means she was the author of a good many novels now almost forgotten it is odd how well one knows the name of lady blessington and how little is generally known about her history literary or personal and she edited every year one of the keepsakes or forget-me-nots from certain indications the bearing of which her biographer mr madden did not seem to understand i gather that her novels did not prove to the publishers the literary success which they expected and i also infer from the fact that she was always changing them that a dinner at gore house and the society of all the wits after dinner were not always attractions strong enough to loosen their purse-strings this lady whose maiden name was power was of an irish family her father being engaged when he was not shooting rebels in unsuccessful trade her life was adventurous and also scandalous she was married at sixteen to a captain farmer from whom she speedily separated and came over to london where she lived for some years her biographer does not explain how she got money a grass widow when lord blessington lost his life and mrs farmer lost her husband 
the gallant captain got drunk and fell out of a window they were married and went abroad travelling in great state as an english milor of those days knew how to travel with a train of half a dozen carriages his own cook and valet the countess's women a whole battery de cuisine a quantity of furniture couriers and footmen and his own great carriage with them went the count d'ossay then about two-and-twenty and young charles matthews then about twenty a protege of lord blessington who was a friend and patron of the drama after lord blessington died it was arranged that count d'orsay should marry his daughter but the count separated from his wife a week or two after the wedding and returned to the widow whom he never afterwards left always taking a lodging near her house and forming part of her household the countess d'orsay one need not explain did not visit her stepmother at gore house here however you would meet tom moore the two bowers campbell talford james and horace smith landseer theodore hook disraeli the elder and the younger rogers washington irving n p willis marriott macready charles dickens albert smith forster walter savage lander and in short nearly every one who had made a reputation was likely to make it hither came also prince louis napoleon in whose fortunate star count d'orsay always firmly believed the conversation was lively and the evenings were prolonged as for ladies there were few ladies who went to gore house doubtless they had their reasons the outer circle so to speak consisted of such men as lord abinger lord durham lord strangford lord porchester lord nugent writers and poetasters who contributed their illustrious names and their beautiful productions to lady blessington's keepsakes thackeray was one of the intimates at gore house and when the crash came in eighteen forty nine and the place was sold up by the creditors it is on record that the author of vanity fair was the only person who showed emotion mr thackeray also came wrote the countess's valet to his mistress who had taken refuge in paris and he went away with tears in his eyes he is perhaps the only person i have seen really affected at your departure in eighteen thirty seven he was twenty-six years of age but he had still to wait for twelve years before he was to take his real place in literature and even then and until the day of his death there were many who could not understand his greatness as regards lady blessington her morals may have been deplorable but there must have been something singularly attractive about her manners and conversation it is not by a stupid or an unattractive woman that such success as hers was attained her novels so far as i have been able to read them show no remarkable ability and her portrait shows amiability rather than cleverness and yet she must have been both clever and amiable to get so many clever men around her and to fix them to make them come again come often and regard her drawing-room and her society as altogether charming and to write such verses upon her as the following mild wilberforce by all beloved once on this hallowed spot whose zealous eloquence improved the fettered negro's lot yet here still slavery attacks whom blessington invites the chains from which he freed the blacks she rivets on the whites the following lines are in another strain more artificial with the false ring and curiously unlike any style of the present day they are by m p willis who in his pencilings described an evening at gore house i gaze upon a face as fair as ever made a lip of heaven falter amid its music prayer the first lit star of summer even springs scarce so softly on the eye nor grows with watching half so bright nor bid its sisters of the sky so seems of heaven the dearest light men murmur where that shape is seen my youth's angelic dream was of that face and mien gore house was a place for men there was more than a touch of bohemia in its atmosphere the fair chatelain distinctly did not belong to any noble house though she was fond of talking of her ancestors the constant presence of count d'orsay and the absence of lady harriet his wife the coldness of ladies as regards the place the whispers and the open talk these things did not perhaps make the house less delightful but they placed it outside society holland house on the other hand occupied a different position the circle was wide and the hospitable doors were open to all who could procure an introduction but it was presided over by a lady the opposite to lady blessington in every respect she ruled as well as reigned those who went to holland house were made to feel her power the princess marie lechtenstein in her book on holland house has given a long list of those who were to be found there between the years seventeen ninety six and eighteen forty among them were sydney smith macaulay byron monk lewis lord jeffrey lords eldon thurlow broom and lyndhurst sir humphrey davy count rumford lords aberdeen maria and mccartney grattan kern sir samuel romilly washington irving tom moore colon lally tallandall talleyrand the duke of clarence the duke d'orleans metternich canova the two erskines madame de stahl lord john russell and lord houghton there was no such agreeable house in europe as holland house there was no professional claqueur no mutual puffing no exchange support 
there a man was not unanimously applauded because he was known to be clever nor was a woman accepted as clever because she was known to receive clever people the conditions of life and society are so much changed that there can never again be another holland house the first thing which strikes one who considers the history of this place as well as gore house is that though the poets wits dramatists and novelists go to these houses their wives do not in these days a man who respects himself will not go to a house where his wife is not asked then again london is so much greater in extent and people are so much scattered that it would be difficult now to get together a circle consisting of literary people who live near enough to frequent the house and another thing people no longer keep such late hours they do not sit up talking all night that is perhaps because there are no wits to talk with but i do not know i think that towards midnight the malice of count d'orsay drawing out the absurd points in the guests the rollicking fun of tom moore or his sentimental songs the repartee of james smith and the polished talk of lytton bulwer all collar cuff diamond pin and wavy hair would have begun to pall upon me and when nobody was taking any notice of so obscure an individual i should have stolen down the stairs and so out into the open air beneath the stars for the wits were very witty but they must have been very fatiguing quite enough of that macaulay lady holland would say tapping her fan upon the table now tell us about something else End of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of fifty years ago by walter besant this librivox recording is in the public domain journals and journalists there was no illustrated paper in eighteen thirty seven there was no punch on the other hand there were as many london papers as there are to-day and nearly as many magazines and reviews the times which is reported to have then had a circulation not exceeding ten thousand a day was already the leading paper it defended queen caroline and advocated the reform bill and was reported to be ready to incur any expense for early news thus in eighteen thirty four on the occasion of a great dinner given to lord durham the times spent two hundred pounds in having an early report and that up from the north by special messenger this is not much in comparison with the enterprise of telegraph and special correspondence but it was a great step in advance of other journals the other morning papers were the morning herald the morning chronicle the morning post of which coleridge was once on the staff the morning advertiser which already represented the interest of which it is still the organ and the old public ledger for which goldsmith had once written the evening papers were the globe which had absorbed six other evening papers the courier the standard once edited by dr magan and the true son the weeklies were the examiner edited by the two hunts and albany fawn blanc the spectator whose price seems to have varied from nine pence to a shilling the atlas observer bell's life bell's weekly messenger john bull which theodore hook edited the new weekly messenger the sunday times the age the satirist the mark lane express the county chronicle the weekly dispatch sometimes sold for eight and a half pence sometimes for six pence the patriot the christian advocate the watchman the court journal the naval and military gazette and the united service gazette among the reporters who sat in the gallery it is remarkable that two-thirds did not write shorthand they made notes and trusted to their memories charles dickens sat with them in the year eighteen thirty six the two great quarterlies still continue to exist but their power has almost gone nobody cares any more what is said by either yet they are as well written as ever and their papers are as interesting if they are not so forcible the edinburgh review is said to have had a circulation of twenty thousand copies the quarterly is said never to have reached anything like that number among those who wrote for the latter fifty years ago or thereabout were southey basil hall 
john wilson croker sir francis head dean millman justice coleridge henry taylor and abraham hayward the westminster which also included the london was supported by such contributors as the two mills father and son southwood smith and roebuck there was also the foreign quarterly for which scott southey and carlyle wrote the monthlies comprised the gentlemen's still living the monthly review the monthly magazine the eclectic the new monthly fraser the metropolitan the monthly repository the ladies the court the asiatic journal the east india review and the united service journal the weekly magazines were the literary gazette the parthenon absorbed in the literary in eighteen forty two the athenaeum which mr dilke bought of buckingham reducing the price from eightpence to fourpence the mirror chambers's journal the penny magazine and the saturday magazine a religious journal with a circulation of two hundred thousand all these papers journals quarterlies monthlies and weeklies found occupation for a great number of journalists among those who wrote for the magazines were many whom we know and some whom we have forgotten mr cornish editor of the monthly magazine seems forgotten but he wrote songs of the loire the gentleman's book my daughter's book the book for the million and a volume of the affections mr peter gaskell another forgotten worthy wrote besides his contributions to the monthly press three laudable works called old maids old bachelors and plebeians of patricians john galt james and horace smith allan cunningham sir edgerton bridges sheridan knowles robert hall john foster james montgomery s c hall grattan author of highways and byways marriott john mill peacock miss martineau ebenezer elliot and warren author of a diary of a late physician all very respectable writers sustained this mass of magazine literature it will be seen then that london was as well supplied with papers and reviews as it is at present considering the difference in population it was much better supplied outside london however the demand for a daily paper was hardly known there were in the whole of great britain only fourteen daily papers and in ireland two there are now one hundred and seventy one daily papers in great britain and fifteen in ireland in country places the weekly newspaper published on saturday night and distributed on sunday morning provided all the news that was required the local intelligence being by far the most important as to the changes which have come over the papers the leading article whose influence and weight seems to have culminated at the time of the crimean war was then of little more value than it is at present the news there were as yet happily no telegrams was still by dispatches and advice and the latest news of markets was that brought by the last ship we will not waste time in pointing out that edinburgh was practically as far off as gibraltar or as anything else you please but consider if you can your morning paper without its telegrams could one exist without knowing exactly all that is going on all over the world at the very moment we used to exist as a matter of fact very well indeed without that knowledge when we had it not we were less curious if less well informed there was always a pleasing element of uncertainty as to what might arrive everything had to be taken on trust and in trade the most glorious fortunes could be made and lost by the beautiful uncertainties of the market now we watch the tape day by day and hour by hour we anticipate our views we can only speculate on small differences the biggest events are felt long beforehand to be coming it is not an unmixed gain for the affairs of the whole world to be carried on under the fierce light of electricity so that everybody may behold whatever happens day after day as if one were seated on olympus among the immortal gods End of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of fifty years ago by walter passant this librivox recording is in the public domain the sportsman there were many various forms of sport open to the englishman fifty years ago which are now wholly or partly closed for instance there was the p r then flourishing in great vigour they are at this moment trying to revive it 
a prize-fight was accompanied by every kind of blackguardism and villainy not the least was the fact that the fights towards the end of the record were almost always conducted on the cross so that honest betting men never knew where to lay their money at the same time the decay of boxing during the last twenty-five years has been certainly followed by a great decay of the national pluck and pugnacity and therefore naturally by a decay of national enterprise we may fairly congratulate ourselves therefore that the noble art of self-defence is reviving and promises to become as great and favourite a sport as before let all our boys be taught to fight fifty years ago there was not a day in a public school when there was not a fight between two of the boys there was not a day when there was not a street fight did not the mail coach drivers who accompanied mr samuel weller on a memorable occasion leave behind them one of their number to fight a street porter in fleet street there was never a day when some young fellow did not take off his coat and handle his fives for a quarter of an hour with a drayman a driver a working man it was a disgrace not to be able to fight let all our boys be taught again and encouraged to fight only the other day i read that there are no fights at eton any more because the boys funk each other eton boys funk each other but we need not believe it let there be no nonsense listen to about brutality the world belongs to the men who can fight there were besides the street fights which kept things lively and gave animation to the dullest parts of the town many other things which we see no longer the bear who danced the bull who was baited the pigeons which were shot in battersea fields the badger which was drawn the dogs which were fought the rats which were killed the cocks which were fought the cats which were thrown into the ponds the ducks which were hunted these amusements exist no longer fifty years ago they afforded sport for many hunting coursing horse racing shooting went on bravely as regards game preserves the laws were more rigidly enforced and there was a much more bitter feeling towards them on the part of farmers then than now on the other hand there were no such wholesale battues sport involved uncertainty gentlemen did not sell their game rabbits instead of being sent off to the nearest poulterer were given to the labourers as they should be the sporting instincts of the londoner gave the comic person an endless theme for fun he was always hiring a horse and coming to grief he was perpetually tumbling off losing his stirrups letting his whip fall having his hat blown off and carried away and generally disgracing himself in the eyes of those with whom he wished to appear to the best advantage there was the epping hunt on easter monday where the sporting londoners turned out in thousands there were the ponies on hire at any open place all round london at clapham common blackheath hampstead epping to ride was the young londoners greatest ambition even to this day there is not one young man in ten who will own without a blush that he cannot ride to ride in the park was impossible for him because he had to be at his desk at ten a man who rides in the park is independent of the city but there were occasions on which every one would long to be able to sit in the saddle rowing athletics and above all the cycle have done much to counterbalance the attractions of the saddle it seems certain unless the comic papers all lie that fifty years ago every young man also wanted to go shooting remember how mr winkle an errant cockney though represented as coming from bristol not only pretended to love the sport but always went about attired as one ready to take the field the londoner went out into the fields which then lay within his reach all round the city popping at everything let us illustrate the subject with the following description of a first of september taken from the comic almanac of eighteen thirty seven perhaps thackeray wrote it up at six told mrs d i'd got weary pressing business at woolwich and off to old fish street where a weary sporting breakfast consisting of jugged hare partridge pie tally-ho sauce 
gunpowder tea and cetera vos laid out in figgins's warehouse as he didn't choose mrs f and his young hinfant family to know he vas a goin to hexpose himself vith fire harms after a good blow-out sallied forth vith our dogs and guns namely mrs wiggins's french poodle miss selina higgins's real blenheim spaniel young hicks's ditto mrs figgins's pet bulldog and my little thoroughbred terrier all vich had been smuggled to figgins's warehouse the night before to prevent domestic disagreeables got into a paddington bus at the bank row with tiger who objected to take the dogs unless paid hextra hicks said we'd a rights to take em and quoted the hact tiger said the hact only allowed parcels carried on the lap accordingly tied up the dogs in our pocket handkerchiefs and carried them and the guns on our knees got down at paddington and after glasses round valked on till ve got into the fields to a place vich higgins had baited vith corn and penny rolls every day for a month past found a covey of birds feeding dogs wary eager and barked beautiful birds got up and turned out to be pigeons debate as to whether pigeons thus game or not hicks said they thus made game on by the new hact fired accordingly and half killed two or three vich half fell to the ground but suddenly got up again and flew off reloaded and pigeons came round again let fly a second time and tumbled two or three more over but didn't bag any tired at last and turned into the dog and partridge to get a snack landlord laughed and asked how ve vas hoff for tumblers didn't understand him but got some valuable information about loading our guns vich strongly recommended mixing the powder and shot well up together before putting it into the barrel and showed figgins how to charge his percussion vich being figgins's first attempt under the new system he had made the mistake of putting a charge of copper caps into the barrel instead of sticking bun on em atop of the touch hole left the dog and partridge and took a northeasterly direction so as to have the advantage of the wind on our backs dogs getting wary riotous and refusing to answer to figgins's thistle vich had unfortunately got a p in it getting over an edge into a field hicks's gun accidentally exploded and shot wiggins behind and my gun going off unexpectedly at the same moment singed a ve von of my viscers and blinded von of my highs carried wiggins back to the inn dressed his wound and rubbed my high with cherry brandy and my visker with bear's grease sent poor w home by a short stage and resumed our sport heard some pheasants crowing by the side of a plantation resolved to stop their cock-a-doodle doing so set off at a jog trot passing through a field of bone manure the dogs unfortunately set to work upon the bones and we couldn't get em to go a step further at no price got vith thin gunshot of two of the birds vich higgins said they vas two game cocks but hicks who had often been to vestminster pit said no sich thing as game cocks had got short square tails and smooth necks and long military spurs and these had got long curly tails and necks all over hair and scarce any spurs at all shot at em as pheasants and believed we killed em both but hearing some horrid screams come out of the plantation immediately after we all took to our eels and ran away without stopping to pick either of em up after running about two miles hicks called out to stop as he had observed a covey of wild ducks feeding on a pond by the roadside got behind a haystack and shot at the ducks which swam away under the trees figgins volunteered to scramble down the bank and hook out the dead ends fifth the butt hend of his gun unfortunately bank failed and poor f tumbled up to his neck in the pit made a rope of our pocket handkerchiefs got it round his neck and dragged him to the dog and doublet there v had him put to bed and dried weary sleepy with the hair and exercise so after dinner took a nap apiece 
woke by the landlord coming in to know if ve bust the gentleman as had shot the unfortunate nursemaid and child in mr smithfield's plantation swore ve knew nothing about it and while the landlord was gone to deliver our message got out of the back window and ran away across the fields at the end of a mile came suddenly upon a strange sort of bird which hicks declared to be the cock of the woods sneaked behind him and killed him turned out to be a peacock took to our heels again as v saw the lord of the manor and two of his servants with bludgeons coming down the gravel valk towards us found it getting late so agreed to shoot our way home didn't know ver v vas but kept going on at last got to a sort of plantation ver v saw a great many birds perching about gave em a broadside and brought down several loaded again and killed another brace thought v should make a good day's work of it at last and thus preparing to charge again then two of the new police came and took us up in the name of the zoological society in whose gardens it seems v had been shooting handed off to the public office and wary heavily fined and wary severely reprimanded by the sitting magistrate coming away met by the landlord of the dog and doublet who charged us with running off without paying our shot and mr smithville who accused us of manslaughtering his nursemaid and child and their wounds not having been declared immortal he was sent to spend the night in prison and thus ended my last first of september those who wish to know what a darby day was fifty years ago may read the following contemporary narrative here's a right and true list of all the running horses dorling's correct card for the darby day hollo olden hands us up one here will you and let it be a good un there now what's to pay only sixpence sixpence i never gave more than a penny at hookum snivy in all my days maybe not your honour but hookum snivy ain't hepsom and sixpence is what every gemman as is a gemman pays i can buy em for less than that on the course and i'll wait till i get there beg your honour's pardon they sells em a shillin on the course give you thruppence they cost me fippence halfpenny farden well here then take your list back again come come your honour shall have it at your own price i wouldn't sell it nobody else for no sich money but i likes the sound of your wice here then give me the change will you oh certainly but your honour's hun comin hard let's see you want two and threepence wait a moment there's another gentleman calling out for a card hallo coachman stop stop coachman do you hear stop your horses this moment and let me get down the fellows run away behind an omnibus without giving me change out of my half-crown that's always the vay they does on these here occasions they calls it catchin a flat sorry i can't stop where's the new police pretty police truly to suffer such work as that well if ever i come to epsom again but let's look at the list it's cost me precious dear ascot mundig pelops why good heavens coachman they've sold me a list for last year oh ma look there what a beautiful carriage scarlet and gold liveries and horses with long tails and stodge full of gentlemen with moustaches and cigars and mackintoshes and green veils whose is it ma don't know my dear but no doubt belongs to some duke or marquis or other great knob beg your pardon ma'am but that carriage as you're looking at is a party of the swell mob and oh my ma look at that other full of beautiful ladies dressed like queens and princesses silks and satins and velvets and gauze sleeves and ermine tippets i never saw such elegant dresses and how merry they look laughing and smiling they seem determined to enjoy the sport who are they ma don't know dear but no doubt they're court ladies yes ma'am cranbourne court how do smith nice sort of tit you've got there very nice indeed very nice sort of mare beautiful legs she's got a nicely turned ankles and pon my word a most elegant head of hair how old is she and how high does she stand i should like to buy her if she's for sale oh she's quite young not above five and twenty or thirty and her height exactly a yard and a half and a nail price eighty guineas she'd be just the thing for you capital hunter as ever appeared at a fixture only part with her on account of her colour not that i mind only mrs s don't like an oxford mixture 
hell hello you fellow you person smoking the pipe i wish you'd take your quadruped out of the way quadruped a you be blowed it's no quadruped but as good a donkey as ever was fed upon hay oh my ma there's the course what lots of people and horses and booths and grandstands and what oceans of gypsies and jugglers and barrel organs and military bands and was ever such sights of savoyards and french women singing and e o tibbles and horses rode up and down by little boys or tied together in bundles and put up in calamanco stables and look at that when they call him bony part did you ever in all your lifetime see a leaner and royal dinner saloons for royalty the knives might have been a little brighter and the linen a little cleaner and women with last dying speeches in one hand and in the other all the best new comic songs and dear me how funnily that gentleman sits his horse for all the world just like a pair of tongs and eh, clear the course clear the course oh dear now the great derby race is going to be run twelve to one ten to one six to one nine to two sixteen to three done 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 here they come here they come blue green buff yellow black brown white harlequin and red sir i wish you'd stand off our carriage steps it's quite impossible to see through your head there now they're gone how many times round times round eh why bless your innocent face it's all over all over you don't say so i wish i'd never come such a take-in call that a derby race after being stifled with dust almost and spoiling all our best bonnets and shawls and cloaks call that a derby race indeed i'm sure it's no derby but nothing but a right down regular oaks but come let's have a bit of lunch i'm as hungry as if i hadn't had a bit all day smith what are you staring at why don't you make haste and hand us the hamper this way we shall never have anything to eat all day if you don't stir yourself and not go on at that horrid slow rate oh lord the bottom's out and every bit of meat and drink and worse than all the knives and forks and plate stole and gone clean away good heavenlies i told you to keep your eye on the basket you stupid lout well so i did on the top of it but who'd have thought of their taking the bottom out well never mind they'll be prettily disappointed for you know betwixt you and me and the wall our ivory knives and forks were nothing but bone and our plate nothing but german silver after all what race is to be run next no more ma'am the others were all run afore you come well then have the horses put to smith i'll never come a darby in again and let us be off home oh lock what a stodge of carriages i'm sure we shall never get off the course alive oh dear do knock that young drunken gentleman off the box i'm sure he's not in a fit state to drive there i told you how it would be oh law you've broke my arm and compound fractured my leg oh for heaven's sake lift them two or osses off my darter sir take your hands out of my pocket hole i beg i say the next time you crawl out of a coach window i wish you wouldn't put your foot on a lady's chest they'll if ever i seed such a pearl as that and i've seed many a good un in my time i'll be blessed oh dear going home's worse than coming it's ten to one if ever we get back to tooley street alive such jostling and pushing and prancing of horses and always the tipsiest gentleman of every party will drive i wish i was one of those ladies at the windows or even one of the servants maids giggling behind the garden walls and oh there's kennington turnpike what shouting and hooting and blowing those horrid cat calls ticket sir got a ticket no i've lost it a shilling then a shilling i've paid you once to-day oh yes i suppose so the old tale but it won't do that's what all you sporting gentlemen say insolent feller i'll have you up before your betters come sir you mustn't stop up the way well i'll pay you again but oh lord somebody stole my purse good gracious what shall i do i suppose i must leave my watch and call for it to-morrow oh ruination blowed if that isn't gone too get on there will you well stop a moment will anybody lend me a shilling no well here then take my hat but if i don't show you up in bell's life in london next sunday morning my name's not timothy flat well this is my last journey to epsom my last appearance on any course as a backer or hedger for i see plain enough a betting book ain't a day book and a darby's a very different thing from a ledger. End of 
chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of fifty years ago by walter besant this librivox recording is in the public domain in factory and mine i do not know any story not even that of the slave trade which can compare for brutality and callousness of heart with the story of the women and children employed in the factories and the mines of this realm there is nothing in the whole history of mankind which shows more clearly the enormities which become possible when men spurred by desire for gain are left uncontrolled by laws or the weight of public opinion and placed in the position of absolute mastery over their fellow-men the record of the slavery time is black in the west indies and the united states god knows but the record of the english mine and factory is blacker still it is so black that it seems incredible to us we ask ourselves in amazement if fifty years ago these things could be alas my friends there are cruelties as great still going on around us in every great city and wherever women are forced to work for bread for the women and the children are inarticulate and in the dark places where no light of publicity penetrates the hand of the master is armed with a scourge of scorpions let us therefore humble ourselves and read the story of the children in the mines with shame as well as with indignation the cry of the needle women is louder in our ears than the cry of the children in the mines ever was to our fathers yet we regard it not fellow sinners and partakers in the crimes of slavery torture and robbery of light life youth and joy hear the tale of the factory and the mine early in the century in the year eighteen o one the overcrowding of the factories and mills the neglect of the simplest sanitary precautions the long hours the poor food and insufficient rest caused the outbreak of a dreadful epidemic fever which alarmed even the mill owners because if they lost their hands they lost their machinery the hands are the producers and the aim of the masters was to regard the producers as so many machines now if your machine is laid low with fever it is as good as an engine out of repair for the first time in history not only was the public conscience awakened but the house of commons was called upon to act in the interests of health public morals humanity and justice strange that the world had been christian for so long yet no law had been passed to protect women and children in the year of grace eighteen o two a beginning was made by the act then passed the daily hours of labour for children were to be not more than twelve yet think of making young children work for twelve hours a day exclusive of an hour and a half for meals and rest so that the working day really covered thirteen hours and a half save from six in the morning until half past seven in the evening this seems a good day's work to exact of children but it was a little heaven compared with the state of things which preceded the act next no children were to be employed under the age of nine certain factories proved to be unwholesome for children were closed to them altogether twenty years later sir john cam hobhouse may his soul find peace invented the saturday half holiday for factories there was found however a loophole for cruelty and overwork the limitation of hours was evaded by making the hands work in relays by which means a child might be kept at work half the night it was therefore in eighteen thirty three enacted that there should be no work done at all between eight thirty p m and five thirty a m that children under thirteen should not work more than forty-eight hours a week 
and those under eighteen should not work more than sixty-eight hours a week observe that nothing not the light of publicity not public opinion not common humanity not pity towards the tender children nothing but law had any power to stop this daily massacre of the innocents yet no doubt the manufacturers were subscribing for all kinds of good objects and reviling the yankees continually for the institution of slavery what happened next greed of gain seeing the factory closed looked round and saw wide open not the gates of hell but the mouth of the pit and they flung their children down into the darkness and made them work among the narrow passages and galleries of the coal mines they took the child boy or girl at six years of age they carried the little thing away from the light of heaven and lowered it deep down into the black and gloomy pit they placed it behind a door and ordered it to pull this open to let the corves or trucks come and go and to keep it shut when they were not passing the child was set at the door in the dark at first they gave it a candle which would burn for an hour or two and then go out think of taking a child of six your child madam and putting it all alone down the dark mine they kept the little creature there for twelve interminable hours if the child cried or went to sleep or neglected to pull the door open they beat that child the work began at four in the morning and it was not brought out of the pit until four or perhaps later in the evening so that in the winter the children never saw daylight at all the evidence given before the royal commission showed that the children when they were brought up to the pit's mouth were heavy and stupefied and cared for little when they had taken their supper but to go to bed and yet the men who owned these collieries had children of their own and they would have gone on to this very day starving the children of light and loading them with work stunting their growth and suffering them to grow up in ignorance all their days but for lord shaftesbury this is what is written of the children and their work by one who visited the mines to ascertain the nature of the employment of these children i went down a pit descending a shaft six hundred feet deep i went some distance along a subterranean road which i was told was three miles in length to the right and left of one of these roads or ways are low galleries called workings in which the hewers are employed in a state of almost perfect nudity on account of the great heat digging out the coal to these galleries there are traps or doors which are kept shut to guard against the ingress or egress of inflammable air and to prevent counter-currents disturbing the ventilation the use of a child six years of age is to open and shut one of these doors when the loaded corves or coal trucks pass and repass for this object the child is trained to sit by itself in a dark gallery for the number of hours i have described the older boys drive horses and load the corves but the little children are always trap keepers when first taken down they have a candle given them but gradually getting accustomed to the gloom of the place they have to do without and sit therefore literally in the dark the whole time of their imprisonment when a child grew strong enough he or she boy or girl was promoted to the post of drawer or thrutcher the drawer boy or girl alike clad in a short pair of trousers and nothing else had a belt tied round the waist and a chain attached by one end to the belt and the other to the corve or truck which he dragged along the galleries to the place where it was loaded for the mouth the chain passing between his legs on account of the low height of the galleries he had generally to go on all fours those who were the thrutchers pushed the truck along with their heads and hands they wore a thick cap but the work made them bald on the top of the head when the boys grew up they became hewers but the women if they stayed in the pit remained drawers or thrutchers continuing to the end of the day to push or drag the truck 
dressed in nothing but a pair of short trousers this was a beautiful kind of life for christian women and children to be leading so many children were wanted that in one colliery employing four hundred hands there were one hundred under twenty and fifty six under thirteen in another where there was an inundation there were forty-four children of whom twenty-six were drowned of these eleven were girls and fifteen boys nine were under ten years of age again in the year eighteen thirty eight there were thirty-eight children under thirteen killed by colliery accidents and sixty-two young people under eighteen when men talk about the interference of the state and the regulation of ours let us always remember this history of the children in the pit yet there were men in plenty who denounced the action of the government some of them were leaders in the philanthropic world some of them were religious men some of them humane men but they could not bear to think that any limit should be imposed upon the power of the employer in point of fact when one considers the use which the employer has always made of his power how every consideration has been always set aside which might interfere with the acquisition of wealth it seems as if the chief business of the legislature should be the protection of the employed again take the story of the chimney-sweep fifty years ago the master went his morning rounds accompanied by his climbing boys it is difficult now to understand how much time and trouble it took to convince people that the climbing boy was made to endure an extraordinary amount of suffering quite needlessly because a brush would do the work quite as well consider the poor little wretch's hands elbows and knees were constantly being torn by the bricks sometimes he stuck going up sometimes coming down sometimes the chimney-pot at the top fell off the child with it so that he was killed he was beaten and kicked unmercifully his master would sometimes light a fire underneath so as to force him to come down quickly the boy's life was intolerable to him he was badly fed badly clothed and never washed though his occupation demanded incessant cleanliness the neglect of which was certain to bring on a most dreadful disease and all this because his master would not use a broom it was not until eighteen forty one that the children were protected by acts of parliament the men have shown themselves able to protect themselves the improvement in their position is due wholly to their own combination that it will still more improve no one can for a moment doubt if we were asked to forecast the future one thing would be safe to prophesy namely that it will become day by day increasingly difficult to get rich meanwhile let us remember that we have with us still the women and the children who cannot combine we have protected the latter how oh my brothers how shall we protect the former End of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of fifty years ago by walter besant this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seventeen with the men of science on the science of fifty years ago much might be written but for a single reason namely that i know very little indeed about the condition of science in that remote period and very little about science of to-day there were no telegraph wires but there were semaphores talking to each other all day long there was no practical application of electricity at all there was no telephone i wish there were none now there were no anaesthetics there were no but why go on schools had no science masters universities no science tripos professors of science were feeble folk i can do no better for this chapter than to reproduce a report of a scientific meeting first published in tilt's annual to which hood thackeray and other eminent professors of science contributed for the year eighteen thirty six extracts from the proceedings of the association of british illuminati at their annual meeting held in dublin august eighteen thirty five 
dr hoaxham read an interesting paper on the conversion of moonbeams into substance and rendering shadows permanent both of which he had recently exemplified in the establishment of some public companies whose prospectuses he laid upon the table mr babel produced his calculating machine and its wonderful powers were tested in many ways by the audience it supplied to captain sir john north an accurate computation of the distance between a quarto volume and a cheesemonger's shop and solved a curious question as to the decimal proportions of cunning and credulity which worked by the rule of allegation would produce a product of ten thousand pounds professor jan hammer described his newly discovered process for breaking stones by an algebraic fraction mr crowsfoot read a paper on the natural history of the rook he defended their cause with great effect and proved that there is not a grain of truth in the charges against them which only arise from grub street malice the rev mr groper exhibited the skin of a toad which he discovered alive in a mass of sandstone the animal was found engaged on its autobiography and died of fright on having its house so suddenly broken into being probably of a nervous habit from passing so much time alone some extracts from its memoir were read and found exceedingly interesting its thoughts on the silent system of prison discipline though written in the dark strictly agreed with those of our most enlightened political economists dr Deddy read a scientific paper on the manufacture of hydrogen which greatly interested those of the association who were members of temperance societies mr croak laid on the table an essay from the cabinet maker society on the construction of frog stools professor parlay exhibited his speaking machine which distinctly articulated the words repail repail to the great delight of many of the audience the learned professor stated that he was engaged on another for the use of his majesty's ministers which would already say my lords and gentlemen and he doubted not by the next meeting of parliament would be able to pronounce the whole of the opening speech mr multiply produced and explained the principle of his exaggerating machine he displayed its amazing powers on the mathematical point which with little trouble was made to appear as large as a coach-wheel he demonstrated its utility in all the relations of society as applied to the failings of the absent the growth of a tale of scandal the exploits of travellers etc etc the author of the pleasures of hope presented through a member a very amusing essay on the gratification arising from the throttling of crying children but as the ladies would not leave the room it could not be read captain north exhibited some shavings of the real pole and a small bottle which he asserted contained scintillations of the aurora borealis from which he stated he had succeeded in extracting pure gold he announced that his nephew was preparing for a course of similar experiments of which he expected to know the result in october the gallant captain then favoured the company with a dissertation on phrenology of which he said he had been a believer for thirty years he stated that he had made many valuable verifications of that science on the skulls of the eskimo and that in his recent tour in quest of subscribers to his book his great success had been mainly attributable to his phrenological skill for that whenever he had an opportunity of feeling for soft places in the heads of the public he knew in a moment whether he should get a customer or not he said that whether in the examination of ship's heads or sheep's heads in the choice of horses or housemaids he had found the science of preeminent utility he related the following remarkable phrenological cases a man and woman were executed in scotland for murder on presumptive evidence but another criminal confessed to the deed and a reprieve arrived the day after the execution the whole country was horrified but captain north having examined their heads he considered from the extraordinary size of their destructive organs that the sentence was prospectively just for they must have become murderers had they escaped hanging then their infant child of six months old was brought to him and perceiving on its head the same fatal tendencies he determined to avert the evil for which purpose by means of a pair of moles he so compressed the skull in its vicious propensities and enlarged it in its virtuous ones that the child grew up a model of perfection the second instance was of a married couple whose lives were a continued scene of discord till they parted on examining their heads scientifically he discovered the elementary causes of their unhappiness 
their skulls were unfortunately too thick to be treated as in the foregoing case but causing both their heads to be shaved he by dint of planing down in some places and laying on padding in others contrived to produce all the requisite phrenological developments and they were then living a perfect pattern of conjugal felicity a thing which could not have happened without phrenology this dissertation was received with loud applauses from the entire assembly whose phrenological organs becoming greatly excited and developed in an amazing degree by the enthusiasm of the subject they all fell to examining each other's bumps with such eagerness that the meeting dissolved in confusion End of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of fifty years ago by walter besant this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eighteen law and justice five thousand three hundred and forty four enactments have been added to the statute book since the queen came to the throne and the figures throw a flood of light upon the progress of the victorian era in order to realize where we were in eighteen thirty seven we have only to obliterate this enormous mass of legislation in the realm of law there seems then to be little left all our procedure equitable legal and criminal much of the substance of equity law and justice as we understand the words is gone law had a different meaning fifty years ago equity hardly had any meaning at all justice had an ugly sound the local habitation of the courts it is true was then much the same as it remained for the next forty-five years the network of gloomy little rooms connected with narrow winding passages which sir john soane built in eighteen twenty to eighteen twenty five on the west side of westminster hall on the site of the old exchequer chamber with an exterior in imitation of palladio's basilica at vincenza but outrageously out of keeping with the glorious vestibule of william rufus was then the home of law the court of chancery met in a gloomy little apartment near the southern end of the hall here the lord chancellor sat in term time there were then four terms of three weeks each with the mace and crimson silk bag embroidered with gold in which was deposited the silver pair of dyes of the great seal and a large nosegay of flowers before him it was in those days only in the vacations that the chancellor sat at lincoln's inn the master of the rolls and the vice-chancellor of england also sat at westminster during the sittings while in the intervals the former presided over the rolls court in rolls yard and the latter over the court which had been built for him on the west side of lincoln's inn hall the three common law courts moreover during term time sat twelve days at westminster and twelve days at the guild hall while the assizes were chiefly held during the vacations the high court of admiralty held its sittings at doctors commons in both the instance court and the prize court practically throughout the legal year and so did the ecclesiastical courts the bankruptcy court was in basing hall street the insolvent debtors court in lincoln's inn fields with an entrance from portugal street there were then no county courts the ancient hundred and county courts with their primitive procedure had long been disused certain courts of conscience or courts of request had it is true been established for particular localities at the express request of the inhabitants and these were still being constituted in some of the large towns then in london there were local courts with a peculiar jurisdiction such as the city courts which would fill a chapter by themselves and of which it is enough to name the lord mayor's court the sheriff's courts of poultry compter and giltspur street compter 
both afterwards merged into the city of london court in great scotland yard there was the palace court with the knight marshal for judge which anciently had exclusive jurisdiction in matters connected with the royal household but now was a minor court of record for actions for debt within westminster and twelve miles round the court had its own prison in high street southwark the marshal sea of little dorrit not the old historic marshal sea which was demolished at the beginning of the century that stood farther north occupying the site of number one nineteen high street but a new marshal sea built in eighteen eleven on the site of the old white lion once a hostelry but since the end of the sixteenth century itself a prison the palace court came to a sudden end in eighteen forty nine owing to jacob omnium being sued in it thackeray tells the story in jacob omnium's hoss poor jacob went to court a counsel for to fix and choose a barrister out of the four and an attorney of the six and there he saw these men of lore and watched them at their tricks oh a weary day was that for jacob to go through the debt was two seventeen which he no more owed than you and then there was the plaintiff's costs eleven pound six and two and then there was his own which the lawyers they did fix at the wary moderate figure of ten pound one and six now evens bless the palace court and all its bold verdicts the sittings of the central criminal court which was founded in eighteen thirty four were held as they are still held in the sessions house in the old bailey rebuilt in eighteen o nine on the site of the old sessions house which was destroyed in the no popery riots of seventeen eighty and of the old surgeon's hall where the bodies of the malefactors executed in newgate were dissected the building although sufficiently commodious for holding the sessions of london and middlesex for which it was originally intended as the centre of the criminal jurisdiction of the kingdom was never anything but a makeshift since however its stingy courts have remained the same down to our own times we can the better realise the surroundings of the criminal trials of those days it was here that greenacre was tried in eighteen thirty seven bow street was then in the zenith of its fame and was practically the centre of the police arrangements of london those were the palmy days of the court of chancery reform was as it had been for centuries in the air and there notwithstanding the efforts of lord lyndhurst it seemed likely to remain practically nothing had been done to carry into effect the recommendations of the commission of eighteen twenty six at the time of her majesty's accession there were nearly a thousand causes waiting to be heard by the lord chancellor the master of the rolls and the vice-chancellor of england it was verily a dead sea of stagnant litigation the load of business now before the court remarked sir lancelot shadwell is so great that three angels could not get through it think what this meant many of these suits had endured for a quarter of a century some for half a century the lawyers to use the current if incorrect phrase of the time tossing the balls to each other one septuagenarian suitor goaded to madness by the law's delay had a few years before thrust his way into the presence of lord eldon and begged for a decision in a cause waiting for judgment which had been before the court ever since the lord chancellor then nearly eighty was a schoolboy every one remembers miss flight who expected a judgment on the day of judgment and gridley the man from shropshire both are true types of the chancery suitors of fifty thirty twenty years ago it would be wearisome indeed to detail the stages through which a chancery suit dragged its slow length along the eternal bills with which it began and ended cross bills answers interrogatories replies rejoinders injunctions and degrees references to masters masters reports exceptions to masters reports were veritably a mountain of costly nonsense and when we remember that the intervals between the various stages were often measured by years 
that every death made a bill of review or worse still a supplemental suit necessary we can realize the magnitude of the evil the mere comparison of the bills in chancery with the bills of mortality shows that with proper management a suit need never have come to an end there is a story for which the late mr chitty is responsible that an attorney on the marriage of his son handed him over a chancery suit with some common law actions a couple of years afterwards the son asked his father for some more business why i gave you that capital chancery suit replied his father what more can you want yes sir said the son but i have wound up the chancery suit and given my client great satisfaction and he is in possession of the estate what you improvident fool rejoined the father indignantly that suit was in my family for twenty-five years and would have continued so for so much longer if i had kept it i shall not encourage such a fellow as in butler's time it might still be said so lawyers lest the bare defendant and plaintive dog should make an end on't do stave and tail with writ of error reverse of judgment and demurrer to let them breathe a while and then cry whoop and set them on again in fact like jarndyce and jarndyce hundreds of suits struggled on until they expired of inanition the costs having swallowed up the estate such were the inevitable delays fifty years ago then no one could enter into a chancery suit with the least prospect of being alive at its termination it was no small part of the duty of the respectable members of the legal profession to keep their clients out of chancery it was perhaps inevitable that this grievance should have been made the shuttlecock of party that personalities should have obscured it that instead of the system the men who were almost as much as victims as the suitors should have been blamed many successive lord chancellors in this way came in for much undeserved obloquy the plain truth was they were overworked besides their political functions they had to preside in the lords over appeals from themselves the master of the rolls and the vice-chancellor they had some heavy work in bankruptcy and lunacy the number of days that could be devoted to sitting as a chancery judge of first instance was therefore necessarily small that this was the keynote of the difficulty was shown by the marked improvement which followed upon the appointment of two additional vice-chancellors in eighteen forty one in that year too another scandal was done away with by the abolition of the six clerks office a characteristic part of the unwieldy machine the depositories of the practice of the court the six clerks and their underlings the clerks in court were responsible for much of the delay which arose the six clerks were paid by fees and their places were worth nearly two thousand a year for which they did practically nothing all their duties being discharged by deputy no one it was said ever saw one of the six clerks even in their office they were not known the masters in chancery were too in those days almost as important functionaries as the judges themselves judges chambers were not then in existence and much of the work which now comes before the judges was disposed of by a master as well as such business as the investigation of titles the taking of accounts and the purely administrative functions of the court all these duties they discharged with closed doors and free from any supervision worth talking about they too were paid by fees their receipts amounting to an immense sum and it was to them that the expense of proceedings was largely due the agitation for their abolition although not crowned with success until fifteen years later it was in full blast fifty years ago at law matters were little better justice was strangled in the nets of form the courts of king's bench common pleas and exchequer were not only at conflict with equity but in a lesser degree with each other the old fictions by which they ousted each other's jurisdiction lasted down to eighteen thirty one when by statute a uniformity of process was established it seems nowadays to savour of the middle ages that in order to bring an action in the king's bench it should have been necessary for the writ to describe the cause of action to be trespass and then to mention the real cause of action in an actium clause the reason for this absurd formality was that trespass still being an offence of a criminal nature the defendant was constructively in the custody of the marshal of the marshalsea and therefore within the jurisdiction of the king's bench 
in the same way a civil matter was brought before the court of exchequer by the pretence that the plaintiff was a debtor to the king and was less able to pay by reason of the defendant's conduct the statement although in ninety-nine cases out of a hundred a mere fiction was not allowed to be contradicted but the fact that the jurisdiction of the court of common pleas was thus entrenched upon was less serious than it might have been since in that court the sergeants still had exclusive audience and distinguished as were the members of the order of the coif it is easy to understand that the public preferred to have their pick of the bar but a much more serious matter was the block in the courts this perennial grievance seems to have then been chiefly due to the shortness of the terms during which alone legal questions could be decided nisi prius trials only could be disposed of in the vacations points of law or practice however cropped up in those days in even the simplest matter and since these often had to stand over from term to term the luckless litigants were fortunate indeed if they had not to wait for years before the question in dispute was finally disposed of the common law procedure moreover literally bristled with technicalities it was a system of solemn juggling the real and imaginary causes of action were so mixed up together the pleadings required such a mass of senseless falsehood that it is perfectly impossible that the parties to the action could have the least apprehension of what they were doing then no two different causes of action could be joined but each had to be prosecuted separately through all its stages none of the parties interested were competent to give evidence it was not until eighteen fifty one that the plaintiff and the defendant often the only persons who could give any account of the matter could go into the witness-box mistakes in such a state of things were of course a common occurrence and in those days mistakes were fatal proceedings by way of appeal were equally hazardous and often impracticable the exchequer chamber could only take cognizance of error raised by a bill of exceptions and even at this time the less that is said about that triumph of special pleading the better the house of lords could only sit as a court of error upon points which had run the gauntlet of the exchequer chamber but perhaps the crowning grievance of all a grievance felt equally keenly by suitors at law and inequity arose from the limited powers of the courts if there were a remedy of, at law for any given wrong for instance the court of chancery could give no relief in the same way if it turned out as it often did that a plaintiff should have sued in equity instead of proceeding at law he was promptly non-suited law could not grant an injunction equity could not construe an act of parliament there were then as we have said no county courts the courts of requests of which there were not a hundred altogether only had jurisdiction for the recovery of debts under forty shillings we have already given an illustration of the methods of palace court which may serve as a type of these minor courts of record indeed with the exception of the city of london which was before the times in this respect there was throughout the kingdom a denial of justice those who could not afford to pay the westminster price had to go without for in those days all meadows intended to be heard at the assizes were in form prepared for trial at westminster the record was delivered to the officers of the king's bench common pleas or exchequer and the cause was set down for trial at westminster nisi prius in the meantime the judges happened to go on circuit into the county in which the cause of action arose in which event one of them would take down the record try the action with the jury of the county pronounce judgment according to the verdict and bring back a verdict and judgment to be enrolled in due course at westminster in equity things were even worse there was except in the counties palatine of durham and langfaster no local equitable jurisdiction and it was commonly said and said with obvious truth that no sum of less than five hundred pounds was worth suing for or defending in the court of chancery divorce was then the luxury of the wealthy an action for the recovery of damages against the co-respondent and a suit in the ecclesiastical courts for a separation from bed and board themselves both tedious and costly after having been successfully prosecuted had to be followed by a divorce bill which had to pass through all its stages in both lords and commons before divorce a winkolo matrimonii could be obtained there is a hoary anecdote which usefully illustrates how this pressed upon the poor prisoner at the bar said a judge to a man who had just been convicted of bigamy his wife having run away with another man the institutions of your country have provided you with a remedy 
you should have sued the adulterer at the assizes and recovered a verdict against him and then taken proceedings by your proctor in the ecclesiastical courts after their successful termination you might have applied to parliament for a divorce act and your counsel would have been heard at the bar of the house but my lord said the disconsolate bigamist i cannot afford to bring actions or obtain acts of parliament i am only a very poor man prisoner rejoined the judge with a twinkle in his eye it is the glory of the law of england that it knows no distinction between rich and poor yet it was not until twenty years after the queen came to the throne that the court for divorce and matrimonial causes was created probate too in all matters and suits relating to testacy and intestacy were disposed of in the ecclesiastical courts tribunals were attached to the archbishops bishops and archdeacons the court of arches the supreme ecclesiastical court for the province of canterbury the prerogative court where all contentious testamentary causes were tried as well as the admiralty courts were held at doctors commons it was a curious mixture of spiritual and legal functions the judges and officers of the court were often clergy without any knowledge of the law they were paid by fees and according to the common practice of those days often discharged their duties by deputy the advocates who practised before them were too anything but learned in the law they wore in court if of oxford scarlet robes and hoods lined with taffety and if of cambridge white miniver and round black velvet caps the proctors wore black robes and hoods lined with fur the procedure was similar to that in vogue in the common law courts but the nomenclature was entirely different the substitute for punishment was penance and the consequence of non-submission excommunication which in addition to spiritual pains incapacitated the delinquent from bringing any action and at the end of forty days rendered him liable to imprisonment by the court of chancery the practical result was that both penance and excommunication were indirect methods of extracting money payments but the whole system was full of abuses and when twenty years later these courts were shorn of all their important functions it was with the universal concurrence of the public until then there were many who shared the opinion of defoe's intelligent foreigner that england was a fine country but a man called doctor's commons was the devil for there was no getting out of his clutches let one's cause be never so good without paying a great deal of money in bankruptcy a severity which was simply ferocious prevailed traders owing more than three hundred pounds and a little later all traders could obtain a discharge upon full disclosure and surrender of all their property but even then the proceedings were protracted to an almost interminable length the machinery was both cumbrous and costly down to eighteen thirty one the bankruptcy law in london was administered by commissioners appointed separately for each case by the lord chancellor in that year a court of review was established with the chief judge and two minor judges and this to some extent controlled and supervised the proceedings of the commissioners now a permanent body in the country however the old procedure prevailed but the amount of business done was ridiculously small creditors preferring as they always probably will do to write off the bad debts rather than to attempt to recover them by the aid of the bankruptcy law the system moreover bristled with pains and penalties if a bankrupt as alleged did not surrender to his commission within forty-two days of notice nor make discovery of his estate and effects nor deliver up his books and papers he was to be deemed a felon and liable to be transported for life an adjudication the first stage in the proceedings was granted upon the mere aff affidavit of a creditor a fiat was issued the commissioners held a meeting and without hearing the debtor at all declared him a bankrupt it was thus quite possible for a trader to find himself in the gazette and ultimately in prison although perfectly solvent he had his remedies it is true he could bring an action of trespass or false imprisonment against the commissioners he could make things uncomfortable for the assignee by impeaching the validity of the adjudication but in any case a delay extending perhaps over many years was inevitable before the matter was decided insolvent debtors as those not in trade were distinguished were in yet worse case imprisonment on mesne process or in plain english on the mere affidavit of a creditor was the leading principle of this branch of the bankruptcy law and in prison the debtor remained until he found security or paid the anomaly which exempted real estate from the payment of debts had been removed in eighteen twenty five and since then a debtor actually in prison could obtain a release 
from confinement by a surrender of all his real and personal property although he remained liable for all the unpaid portion of his debts whenever the court should be satisfied of his ability to pay them everything moreover depended upon the creditor he still had an absolute option after verdict and judgment of taking the body of the debtor in satisfaction and the early records of the court for the relief of insolvent debtors show how weak and impotent were the remedies provided by the legislature it was not until twenty years later that the full benefits of bankruptcy were extended to persons who had become indebted without fraud or culpable negligence enough has already been said of the state of the debtors prisons it is sufficient to add here that in the second year of the queen nearly four thousand persons were arrested for debt in london alone and of these nearly four hundred remained permanently in prison it was however in the administration of the criminal law that the harsh temper of the times reached its zenith both as regards procedure and penalties justice then dealt hardly indeed with persons accused of crimes in cases of felony for instance the prisoner could not down to eighteen thirty six be defended by counsel and had therefore to speak for himself now think what this meant the whole proceedings from arrest to judgment were for the matter of that they still are highly artificial and technical the prisoner often poor and uneducated was generally unaccustomed to sustain thought the indictment which was only read over to him was often almost interminable in length with a separate count for each offence and all the counts mixed and varied in every way that a subtle ingenuity could suggest defences depended as largely for their success upon the prisoner taking advantage of some technical flaw which in many cases had to be done before pleading to the indictment as upon his establishing his innocence upon the facts but what chance had an illiterate prisoner of detecting even a fundamental error when he was not allowed a copy of the document in fact in the words of mr justice stephen the most eminent living authority upon the history of our criminal law it is scarcely a parody to say that from the earliest times down to our own days the law relating to indictments was much the same as if some small proportion of the prisoners convicted had been allowed to toss up for their liberty there might further be the grossest errors of law as laid down by the judge to the jury or of fact upon the evidence without the prisoner having any remedy neither the evidence nor the judge's directions appeared upon the face of the record and it was only for some irregularity upon the record that a writ of error would lie a curious practice however gradually sprang up whereby substantial miscarriage of justice was often averted if a legal point of any difficulty arose in any criminal case heard at the assizes or elsewhere the judge respited the prisoner or postponed judgment and reported the matter to the judges the point reserved was then argued before the judges by counsel not in court but at sergeant's inn of which all the judges were members if it was decided that the prisoner had been improperly convicted he received a free pardon it was this tribunal which was in eighteen forty eight erected in the court for crown cases reserved the outcry against capital punishment for minor felonies was still in full blast the history of this legislation is extremely curious the value of human life was slowly raised it had thanks to the noble efforts of sir samuel romilly ceased to be a capital offence to steal from a shop to the amount of five shillings but public opinion was still more enlightened than the laws a humane judge compelled to pass sentence of death upon a woman convicted of stealing from a dwelling-house to the value of forty shillings shocked when the wretched victim fainted away cried out good woman good woman i don't mean to hang you i don't mean to hang you will nobody tell her i don't mean to hang her jurors perjured themselves rather than subject anybody to this awful penalty in eighteen thirty three lord suffield in the house of lords declared i hold in my hand a list of five hundred and fifty five perjured verdicts delivered at the old bailey in fifteen years for the single offence of stealing from dwelling-houses the value stolen being in these cases sworn above the value of forty shillings but the verdicts returned being to the value of thirty-nine shillings only human life was then appraised at five pounds but juries were equal to the occasion disregarding the actual amount stolen they substituted for the old verdict guilty of stealing to the value of thirty-nine shillings guilty of stealing to the value of four pounds nineteen shillings here is an illustration a man was convicted at the old bailey of robbing his employers to the amount of one thousand pounds 
the evidence was overwhelming property worth two hundred pounds was found in his own room three hundred pounds more was traced to the man to whom he had sold it the jury found him guilty of stealing to the amount of four pounds nineteen shillings he was again indicted for stealing twenty-five pounds and again convicted of stealing less than five pounds in the remaining indictments the prosecutors allowed him to plead guilty to the same extent in the same way for years prior to eighteen thirty two when the death penalty for forgery was abolished except in the cases of wills and powers of attorney relating to the public funds juries refused to convict prisoner at the bar said chief baron riches to a man acquitted at carnarvon assizes for forging bank of england notes although you have been acquitted by a jury of your countrymen of the crime of forgery i am as convinced of your guilt as that two and two make four and the jury privately admitted that they were of the same opinion in short the severity of the penal code was a positive danger to the community professed thieves made a rich harvest by getting themselves indicted capitally because they then felt sure of escape the sentence moreover could not be carried out it became usual in all cases except murder to merely order it to be recorded which had the effect of a reprieve here are some figures in the three years ended december thirty one eighteen thirty three there were eight hundred and ninety six commitments in london and middlesex on capital offences and only twelve executions in eighteen thirty four eighteen thirty five in eighteen thirty six there were eight hundred and twenty three commitments and no executions with the first year of the queen a more merciful regime was begun six offences forgery in all cases rioting rescuing murderers inciting to mutiny smuggling with arms and kidnapping slaves were declared not capital but it was not until eighteen sixty one that all these blots were finally erased from the statute book among other mediaeval barbarities the dissection of a murderer's body was not abolished until eighteen sixty one but it was made optional in eighteen thirty two hanging in chains was done away with in eighteen thirty four the pillory a punishment limited to perjury since eighteen sixteen was altogether abolished in eighteen thirty seven the stocks had been generally superseded by the treadmill ten years earlier common assaults and many misdemeanors were on the other hand much more leniently dealt with in those days than they are in our own as late as eighteen forty seven a case occurred in which a ruffian pounded his wife with his fist so that she remained insensible for three days yet since he used no weapon he could only be convicted of a common assault and imprisoned without hard labour but it was not perhaps an unmixed evil that the powers of the magistrates were then very limited the great unpaid as they were then universally known were a byword their proceedings both at petty and quarter sessions were disgraced by ignorance rashness and class prejudice summary jurisdiction was then fortunately only in its infancy end of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of fifty years ago by walter besant this librivox recording is in the public domain conclusion the consideration of the country as it was would not be complete without some comparison with the country as it is but i will make this comparison as brief as possible in the church the old calvinism is well nigh dead even the low church of the present day would have seemed fifty years ago a kind of veiled popery and the church has grown greater and stronger she will be greater and stronger still when she enlarges her borders to admit the great bodies of nonconformists the old grievances exist no longer there are no pluralists there is no non-resident vicar the small benefices are improved church architecture has revived the church services are rendered with loving and jealous care the old reproaches are no longer hurled at the clergy fat and lazy shepherds they certainly are not careless and perfunctory they cannot now be called even if they are less scholarly which must be sorrowfully admitted they are more earnest the revival of the church services has produced its effect also upon dissent its ministers are more learned and more cultured their congregations are no longer confined to the humbler 
trading class their leaders belong to society their writers are among the best literateurs of the day that the science of warfare by sea and land has also changed is a doubtful advantage yet wars are short which is in itself an immeasurable gain the thin red line will be seen no more nor the splendid great man-of-war with a hundred guns and a crew of a thousand men the universities which fifty years ago belonged wholly to the church are now thrown open the fellowships and scholarships of the colleges were then mostly appropriated they are now free and the range of studies has been immensely widened as for the advance in physical and medical science i am not qualified to speak but everybody knows that it has been enormous while in surgery the discovery of anaesthetics has removed from life one of its most appalling horrors in literature though new generations of writers have appeared and passed away we have still with us the two great poets who fifty years ago had already begun their work the victorian era can boast of such names as carlyle macaulay thackeray dickens tennyson and browning in the first rank of men of letters those of darwin faraday and huxley in science besides these there has been an immense crowd of men and women who belong to the respectable second rank to enumerate whom would take pages who can say if any of them will live beyond the century and if any will be remembered in a hundred years we have all grown richer much richer the poor says mr george have grown poorer that is most distinctly and emphatically untrue nothing could be more untrue the poor that is to say the working classes have grown distinctly better off they are better housed they are better fed they are more cheaply fed they are better dressed they have a thousand luxuries to which they were formerly strangers their children are educated in most great towns they have free libraries they have their own clubs they are at liberty to combine and to hold public meetings they have the post office savings bank and as for political power they have all the power there is because you cannot give any man more than his vote formerly they demanded the six points of the charter and thought that universal happiness would follow on their acquisition we have now got most of the six points and we do not care much about the rest yet happiness is not by any means universal some there are who still think that by more tinkering of the machinery the happiness of the people will be assured others there are who consider that political and social wisdom on the possession of which by our rulers the welfare of the people does mainly depend is outside and independent of the machinery is it nothing again that the people have found out their own country formerly their lives were spent wholly in the place where they were born they knew no other now the railways carry them cheaply everywhere in one small town of lancashire the factory hands alone spend thirty thousand pounds a year in excursions the railways far more than the possession of a vote had given the people a knowledge of their strength the civil service of the country is no longer in the patronage of the government there are few spoils left to the victors there are no sinecures left except in the crown colonies there are few places to be given away it is however very instructive to remark that wherever there is a place to be given away it is invariably just as of old and without the least difference of party whether conservatives or liberals are in power filled up by jobbery favoritism and private interest you have been told how they have introduced vast reforms in law prisons for debt have been abolished yet men are still imprisoned for debt happily i know little about the administration of law some time ago however i was indirectly interested in an action in the high court of justice the conduct and result of which gave me much food for reflection it was an action for quite a small sum of money yet a year and a half elapsed between the commencement of the action and its hearing the verdict carried costs the costs amounted to three times the sum awarded to the plaintiff that seems to be a delightful condition of things when you cannot get justice to listen to you 
for a year and a half and when it may cost a defendant three times the amount disputed in order to defend what he knows though his counsel may fail to make a jury understand the case to be just and right i am to submit as the next reform in law that justice shall have no holidays so as to expedite actions and that the verdict shall in no case carry costs so as to cheapen them as for our recreations we no longer bawl comic songs at taverns and there is no vox hall on the other hand the music hall is certainly no improvement on the tavern the colonies was perhaps a more respectable vox hall the comic opera may be better than the old extravaganza but i am not certain that it is there are the crystal palace the aquarium and the albert hall also in place of vox hall and there are outdoor amusements unknown fifty years ago lawn tennis cycling rowing and athletics of all kinds there has been a great upward movement of the professional class new professions have come into existence and the old professions are more esteemed it was formerly a poor and beggarly thing to belong to any other than the three learned professions a barrister would not shake hands with a solicitor a nonconformist minister was not met in any society artists writers journalists were considered bohemians the teaching of anything was held in contempt to become a teacher was a confession of the direst poverty there were thousands of poor girls eating out their hearts because they had to go out as governesses there were no high schools for girls there were no colleges for them slavery is gone there are now no slaves in christendom save in the island of cuba fifty years ago an american went mad if you threw in his teeth the institution either he defended it with zeal or else he charged england with having introduced it into the country in the southern states it was as much as a man's life was worth to say a word against it travellers went south on purpose that they might see slaves put up to auction mothers parted from their children and all the stock horrors then they came home and wrote about it and held up their hands and cried oh isn't it dreadful the negro slavery is gone and now there is only left the slavery of the women who work when will that go to and how can it be swept away public executions gone pillory gone the last man pilloried was in the year eighteen thirty no more flogging in the army the factory acts passed all these are great gains a greater is the growth of sympathy with all those who suffer whether wrongfully or by misfortune or through their own misdoings this growth of sympathy is due especially to the works of certain novelists belonging to the victorian age it is producing all kinds of good works the unselfish devotion of men and women to work among the poor teaching of every description philanthropy which does not stop short with the check charity which is organized measures for prevention support of hospitals and convalescent homes the introduction of art and music to the working classes all these changes seem to be gains have there been no losses in the nature of things there could not fail to be losses some of the old politeness has been lost though there are still men with the fine manners of our grandfathers the example of the women who speak who write who belong to professions and are generally aggressive threatens to change the manners of all women they have already become more assured more self-reliant less deferent to men's opinions the old deference of men to women was of course merely conventional they no longer dread the necessity of working for themselves they plunge boldly into the arena prepared to meet with no consideration on the score of sex if a woman writes a bad book for instance no critic hesitates to pronounce it bad because a woman has written it whatever work man does woman tries to do they boldly deny any inferiority of intellect though no woman has ever produced any work which puts her anywhere near the highest intellectual level they claim a complete equality which they have hitherto failed to prove some of them even secretly whisper of natural superiority they demand their vote perhaps before long they will be in both houses and then man will be speedily relegated to his proper place which will be that of the executive servant o oh, happy happy time it is said that we have lost the old leisure of life as for that and the supposed drive and hurry of modern life i do not believe in it that is to say the competition is fierce and the struggle hard but these are no new things it is a commonplace to talk of the leisure and calm of the eighteenth century it cannot be too often repeated that in eighteen thirty seven we were still in that century i declare that in all my reading about social life in the eighteenth century i failed to discover that leisure from queen anne to queen victoria 
i have searched for it and i cannot find it the leisure of the eighteenth century exists in fact only in the brain of painter and poet life was hard labour was incessant and last of the whole day long the shopmen lived in the shop they even slept in it the mill people worked all day long and far into the night if i look about the country i see in town and village the poor man oppressed and driven by his employer i see the labourer in a blind revenge setting fire to the ricks i see the factory hand destroying the machinery i see everywhere discontent poverty privilege patronage and profligacy i hear the shrieks of the wretches flogged at the cart tail the screams of the women flogged at bridewell i see the white faces of the poor creatures brought out to be hung up in rows for stealing bread i see the fighting of the press gang i see the soldiers and sailors flogged into sullen obedience i see hatred of the church hatred of the governing class hatred of the rich hatred of employers where with all these things is there room for leisure leisure means peace contentment plenty wealth and ease what peace what contentment was there in those days the decay of the great agricultural interest is a calamity which has been coming upon us slowly though with a continually accelerated movement this is the reason i suppose why the country regards it with so strange an apathy it is not only that the landlords are rapidly encountering ruin that the farmers are losing all their capital and that labourers are daily turned out of work and driven away to the great towns the very existence of the country towns is threatened the investments which depend on rent and estates are threatened colleges and charities are losing their endowments worst of all the rustic the backbone and support of the country who has always supplied all our armies with all our soldiers is vast disappearing from the land i confess that if something does not happen to stay the ruin of agriculture in these islands i think the end of their greatness will not be far off perhaps i think and speak as a fool but it seems to me that a cheap loaf is dearly bought if among other blessings it deprives the countryside of its village folk strong and healthy and the empire of its stalwart soldiers as for the house of lords and the english aristocracy they cannot survive the day when the farms cannot even support the hands that till the soil and are left untilled and uncultivated there are to make an end two changes especially for which we can never be sufficiently thankful the first is the decay of the old calvinism that gone the chief terror of life is gone too the chief sting of death is gone the terrible awful question which reasoning man could not refrain from asking is gone too the second change is the transference of the power to the people all the power that there is we have given to the people who are now waiting for a prophet to teach them how best to use it i trust i am under no illusions democracy has many dangers and many evils but these seem to me not so bad as those others which we have shaken off one must not expect a millennium mistakes will doubtless be committed and those bad ones besides a change in the machinery does not change the people who run that machinery there will be the tyranny of the caucus to be faced and trampled down we must endure with all his vices and his demagogic carts the professional politician whose existence depends on his party we must expect and ceaselessly fight against bribery and wholesale corruption when a class of these professional politicians poor unscrupulous and grasping will be continually by every evil art by every lying statement by every creeping baseness endeavouring to climb unto power such there are already among us we shall have to awaken from apathy and keep awake those who are anxious to avoid the arena of politics yet by education position and natural abilities are called upon to lead yet who even in the face of the certain dangers the certain mistakes of democracy shall say that great terrible and most disastrous mistakes have not been made by an aristocracy there is always hope where there is freedom let us trust in the common sense of the nation and remain steadfast in that trust end of chapter nineteen end of fifty years ago by walter besant